Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 41st meeting of the 24th Council. Um, this is Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we are calling this meeting to order. All of our counselors are present via Zoom. Councilor Benton is running a little behind, but he will jo join us momentarily. Tonight, um, we are asking for a moment of silence and um, we have a lot of um, a lot of issues that we're going to be discussing this evening. But I think the thing that we hear the most about is crime, and I think it's important that we come together as a city and ask that um, we can get our crime under control. And that um, I know that the mayor's office and the council are co constantly working on it. I would ask that we have this moment of silence on behalf of our public safety officers who are out in the street every day um, without uh, hesitation. So if you'll join me in that, please. Thank you, counselors. Councilor Bassan, would you like to start the Pledge of Allegiance in English? Thank you, Madam President. I'd be happy to. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, counselor. And I will do the uh, pledge in Spanish as soon as I get it on the screen since I don't know it by heart. Crystal, would you do it for me? Sure. Thank you. Juro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la república que representa una nación bajo Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Thank you. That was Crystal Ortega, our staff, and I just want to thank her for doing that. So before we get started this evening, um, I would like to read some information for the public. As was noted in a press release from our office on Friday, posted on our website and noted on our published council agenda, this meeting has special procedures and is being held via Zoom video conference Members of the public, city staff, and the media have the ability to view this meeting through four different platforms, GOVTV on Comcast, Channel 16, the GOVTV website, YouTube, and Zoom webinar. These live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you may enable the closed captioning services on your television or device at this time. For those watching on the live stream, thank you for joining us this evening. The video recording of this and all past city council meetings will also remain available for viewing at any time on the council's website. Council staff is always available via telephone if members of the public need assistance finding the videos online. Please call 768-3100 for assistance during business hours, which are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The council is accepting live general public comments this afternoon, as well as any written comments. Written comments received by 1 p.m. were distributed to all counselors in advance of today's meeting. So thank you for uh, listening to that. We are going to start our agenda today with proclamations and presentations. And we have a proclamation, which uh, we are going to put up on the screen, Mr. Moya. And I'm gonna lead us off in that. And then some of our counselors will join me in reading this proclamation. Whereas people of all ages and walks of life across America and around the world collectively witnessed an event of an immense tragedy on September 11, 2001. And, counselors, I think each one of you has a line here. So if you can see which line it is that you're reading. OK, 
Okay, I'll read the second line then. Whereas people of all ages and walks of life, oh, I'm sorry. Whereas the events of that day in New York, Washington, DC and Shanksville, Pennsylvania killed citizens from 92 different countries and instantly transformed nearly everyone's lives, some through personal loss and many others through an unfamiliar sense of individual and national vulnerability and... You're muted, counselor. Thought I was doing so well. Whereas an unprecedented historic bonding of Americans arose from the collective shock, unifying the country to an outpouring of national spirit, pride, selflessness, generosity, courage, and service, and. Whereas many brave people, including hundreds of New Mexicans, heroically, tirelessly, and courageously participated in an extraordinarily difficult and dangerous rescue and recovery effort, in many cases, voluntarily putting their own well-being at risk, and. Whereas September 11th will never and should never be just another day in the hearts and minds of Americans, and whereas many citizens may wish to memorialize September 11th as a part of a solemn day of remembrance and tribute and. Whereas this year, the 20th year anniversary of the terrorism attack on America and every year since the 9-11 attacks, the Tribute in Light, a commemorative public art installation at the site of the former Twin Towers was lit from dusk to dawn and. Whereas, though terrorism exposes the worst in people, we can remain hopeful by the stories of wonderful, compassionate, and heroic deeds that occur during and after such an attack, that the shock and sadness bringing people, families, friends, and strangers alike together in unique ways. And Whereas, in tribute to all the victims of 9-11 and the many others who rose in service in response during their rescue and recovery effort, and in defense of our nation, both here at home and abroad. Councillor Harris, could you read the last portion of that? Councillor Harris. I'll read it then. Be it proclaimed by this by the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, the month of September be for remembrance and tribute to those who were lost and injured on September 11, 2001 to terrorist attacks on American soil. And today um, we have um, members from our Albuquerque Police Department and our Albuquerque Fire Department. And I see um, two different screens. So if, um, the members with Albuquerque Fire Chief would first introduce yourself and then we'll have members from APD also introduce themselves. Would you please introduce yourselves? Uh, President, Council President Borrego, thank you so much and members of the council. Uh, with me today is our 9-11 committee. Um, again, uh, uh, back to my right, we have Lieutenant Sean Bassman, we have Lieutenant Zach Nichols, Lieutenant Tom Ruiz, uh, Lieutenant Will Mattis and driver David Augie. And uh, he wasn't able to be here, but Captain Ray Alps, uh, which was one of the first guys that did uh, our 9 11 tributes uh, walk of the Hyatt building. And again, these uh, gentlemen uh, worked very hard to display all the, all the bunker gear that you've seen on 9 11, to put together everything that happened on 9 11 from the stair climb to the um, actual ceremony in remembrance of everything that took place 20 years ago. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Lieutenant Tom Ruiz, uh, the chair of our 9-11 committee. Thank you. Lieutenant Ruiz. Thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you, uh, Council President Brago, City Councilors. Thank you uh, very much for your continued support, uh, public safety and Albuquerque Fire Rescue. Um, 20 years is a long time. Uh, it's also uh, in the blink of an eye, uh, an entire generation of firefighters have uh, come and gone since 2001. Uh, it's incredibly important for us to remember what happened. Uh, we say the phrase, never forget. And uh, for a lot of firefighters that day, uh, I think it can be best described uh, as a heavy day for a lot of us. It's a heavy day um, full of uh, mixed emotions. 
And I think it's it's incredibly important that we continue this tradition of doing that stair climb and uh, conducting that memorial ceremony at Civic Plaza. So uh, we never forget, we never forget the sacrifices of those firefighters from uh, from New York. Um, we never forget, and we're also paving the way for the youngest generation of firefighters um, that are now in our ranks. We have some firefighters um, that weren't alive during the actual 9-11. We also have firefighters that have gone and retired, and now uh, their sons and daughters uh, are firefighters for not only Albuquerque, but for Bernalillo County. So I think it's incredibly important um, that we remember that day, we do what we can to uh, never forget those sacrifices, um, the traditions that uh, the fire department holds, and uh, thank you once again, City Councilor, Council President, um, for your continued support in public safety. Thank you. Thank, thank you, me. and thank you to all of our firefighters in Albuquerque and Bernalillo County and the state of New Mexico. Um, and now I am going to move over to APD, Albuquerque Police Department. I see some folks in the Chief's office. If you could please introduce yourselves. Good afternoon, Madam President. Uh, my name is Josh Brown, I'm Interim Deputy Chief of the Field. Uh, kind of like to echo what Lieutenant Ruiz, um, Chief Gagger said from AFR is, we appreciate the continued council support. And you know, 20 years doesn't seem like that long ago. And you know, they hit it on the head as far as, as having our younger officers remember what happened and you know, the sacrifices that the, the men and women of the New York Fire Department and their police department went through on that day. Um, we just want to say that again, thank you for your continued support and, um, you know, moving forward into the future is with, you know, AFR and our continued relationship with them and the city council. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for being with us this afternoon. Are there any counselors that would like to say anything? Counselor, Counselor Pena? I just want to say just thank you for all your work. You know, I know times are hard now, but I just in light of um, September 11th and all the events that occurred, uh, you know, when it comes time and people are making those calls, we, we want you to be there and you we want you to be there to help ensure public safety. So um, myself, I can say that I really appreciate all the work that you all do. So thank you very much. Counselors, if you want to say something, please jump in. My little raised hand thing isn't working, so I can't see who has their hand up right this moment. Councilor Senna. Councilor Senna. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you again to both uh, and to all our, our public safety um, and for also inviting uh, me to the 9-11 Remembrance Ceremony. Um, it was really moving and even getting to hear from, I believe it was a retired lieutenant with the fire department, um, having started the stair climb tradition and how it really uh, resonated throughout the, the nation and throughout the world and how that, that traditions now continued on. Um, just wanna say thank you. And I know he went on to continue to serve, not in just the military, but also as a teacher. So I just wanna recognize that. And, you know, I was also told to, to recognize your driver there and, um, uh, David, um, in the in Chief Gallegos' office, I know that you have a little, uh, hopefully, future firefighter with you too. So um, your your mother in law sends her regards as well. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to to say thank you again um, for for the ceremony, uh, for inviting counselors, uh, but for all of your service ongoing. Thank you so much, Counselor Sena. Sorry about that. Um, I was just saying thank you for joining us this afternoon, both, both to Albuquerque Police Department and Albuquerque Fire and Rescue. Uh, we will present a copy of the proclamation to uh, both groups. And um, again, thank you for your service in everyday life and for serving the community of Albuquerque. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, Councillor uh, President Borrego and Councillors. Thank you. Thank you. You have a great day. 
Um, so with that, counselors, we are going to move on to economic development discussion. And tonight we do not have an economic development discussion. So with that, we are going to move along to general public comments. And before we start our general public comments, I am going to read this into the record. Um, this information is for the public. Um, hello. For those of you joining us to provide li live public comment this evening, we also received written comments that were distributed to the counselors in advance of today's meeting and all counselors received that information. Members of the public will be able to address the council if they have signed up for live public comment per the instructions published on the agenda and on our website on Friday. Speakers will be moved into the meeting room two at a time. They will remain muted with their camera off until they are called upon to speak, at which point they can turn on their camera, unmute themselves, and will have one and a half minutes to speak to the council. After that, they will again be muted and return to be an attendee of the Zoom webinar. I will just mention that um, there was some confusion regarding uh, the number of people that would, were allowed to speak. And we had it at 20, but actually it is 30 participants. And that is in the council rules. So I just wanted to clarify that. So here are the public ground rules. Each participant has one and a half minutes to speak. Comments are to be addressed to the counselors only through the council president. Any disruptive conduct will result in removal from the Zoom webinar. Mr. Moya, would you please call our first speaker? Thank you, Madam President. Our first speaker is Christopher Ramirez. Mr. Ramirez, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Good afternoon, Council President and City Council. My name is Christopher Ramirez. Um, I use he, him, his, and they, them, theirs as my pronouns. I'm the executive director of Together for Brothers, and I'm also the City of Albuquerque Transit Advisory Board Chair. Um, I wanna thank um, Councilor Sena and others for supporting the zero fares legislation that you're gonna be considering today and urge you to vote yes. Um, we are happy with the, um, the compromise of extend, uh, extending the start date to January 1st through December 31st for this first pilot. And we know that there are other resources that we're committed as a community partner to identifying from the state and the federal governments, as well as uh, Bernalillo County to support zero fares moving forward even after this, up, um, this current or next fiscal years. I also wanna say the community wants to be part of being part of the safety plan to make sure that every rider and driver is safe um, and we hope that um, that transit and the city of Albuquerque will reach out to community to be part of that so that we have a solution that beyond security takes into account the Albuquerque Community Safety Department, Family and Community Services, and many community partners who want to be at the table to make sure that buses are safe for everyone. And my last piece is that we know that just like the press conference we did earlier today, zero fares are going to positively impact some of the most impacted individuals and families in the city of Albuquerque. 74% of bus riders are low income, over 80% are people of color. So this is a, this money that you're investing in zero fares is, a, is actually a, has a high return on investment for the families that are gonna be able to uh, move those dollars elsewhere and for community organizations, county, city, state, and federal agencies that can shift dollars for bus passes to other resources and Thank services you. in their the organizations. time is up, Mr. Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Our next speaker is David Grubbs. Mr. Grubbs, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Hello, thank you all for having me. My name is David Grubbs. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. And uh, I'm a project manager at Together for Brothers. And I just wanted to say uh, some, some of the impact of free fares, because I, I realize you all are about to vote on that. And um, I just want to urge that you please vote for that, um, at least for, for students. I'm currently a student right now at Technology Leadership High School. And uh, it's really important for us because we, we go to school on the buses all the time. And some of us, such as myself, don't really look like uh, students. And at my school, we were having difficulty um, like getting, getting, uh, getting IDs to get on the bus just because our, my school has low funding and it's a it's a charter school so it's, it's small and it was hard for us to get uh, the impression to be on the that bus. it was 20 it should have been 30. 
Can I remind okay. everyone to mute yourself, please? Thank you, young but, man. We appreciate you. It would just be, uh, it would really be helpful for some of us who look too old to be students to be able to just get on the bus along with our parents. If we have like a meeting at school, a parent teacher conference or something like that, it would be really helpful for us to be able to get to these places and still be able to do what we need to do to be successful. And, uh, that's, that's all I had to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me and hearing my, hearing my voice on this topic. Thank you, Mr. Grubbs. Our next speaker is Mahdi Hussani. Mahdi, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, city councilors. Uh, my name is Mahdi Hussaini, and uh, I am a refugee in Albuquerque. I've been here uh, six years. And I just wanted to uh, thank you guys for being here and letting us uh, to share our voice and talk about uh, transit affairs. Uh, I just wanted to say that if you guys can uh, please uh, vote yes on uh, transit affairs. And also, uh, I want to share uh, my story of self, how uh, I need uh, city buses to go around the town and how it helps me to be active in the community and also to go to um, community meetings as well. Uh, I was a freshman in high school, and it was uh, really hard for me to uh, drive because I didn't have any permit or license. And also we had only one car in the, in the house. So it was, uh, for my dad and my brother to go to work and, uh, be, be able to go to their jobs. And I was having trouble to get in, get in school on time because of, uh, not having, uh, uh, bus passes and also not having access, uh, to, uh, buses that are like on time or get me there on time because I had to take two buses from um, Montgomery to San Mateo and Mo San Mateo to Central to Highland High School. And I had over 130s uh, for just one year. And that was hard for me to be able to like go there and just like get there on time. And I also wanted to share that a uh, bus helped me to get around the town. For example, I'm a fighter. I go to... Um, Thank you, sir. Your, your time is up. Thank you. It looks like Councillor Davis, Madam President. Councillor Davis, you had a question? Uh, yes, ma'am, Madam President. Thank you. Monty, don't hang up yet. Uh, I wanted to, to reach out and ask a follow-up. You mentioned something really important that I learned in the process of talking about transit issues. Um, and you talked about time to get the bus from Montgomery down to Highland High School and the transfers. Uh, you know, I, Madi, I learned, and I hope the other city councilors um, have noted through this process, that although uh, every school has a transportation plan from APS, only a few of our schools have services that are specially geared towards immigrants and migrant families um, for their ESL and their other work. Um, and so I want, I want to commend you for participating in that and being a model for your, your other students, but also want to say thank you for sharing that because it's not always as simple as what we assume that the right school for your right student is always in your neighborhood. And uh, I think these transit options are really, really important, um, not just for having buses on time, but also for giving access for students um, who, uh, who can utilize them to be as successful as you've been. So I want to say thank you for sharing those with us. Yes, thank you so much, uh, uh, Councillor Davis. And also, I wanted to share that I go to UNM right now. So I graduated from Highland High School. And that was the reason for me to go to Highland High School, because I wanted to be in the refugee cohort and be able to get the support that I needed, because I didn't know any English at that time. But right now, I'm able to speak English and have that as uh, my skills and be able to uh, participate in other uh, uh, internship and also organizations as well. But I also want to share uh, if there is any other opportunities and also like the city will help other refugees as well. I think that will be perfect because now like there are uh, newcomers coming in and they don't have access to transportation. So it's really hard for them to get around the town and they're unfamiliar with uh, what to do. And also if they have to pay every single day to go around the town, that's really, really hard for them. So I will appreciate if you guys say uh, yes to the transfer. Thank, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madi. And Madam President, could I close just by asking Madi to tell us what he's studying at UNM? I'm very excited that he chose Albuquerque as his home, and I hope he's going to stay here and contribute. Go ahead, uh, Counselor. You still have the floor. 
Monty, what are you studying at UNM? Right now, I'm studying, uh, majoring in biology and minoring in uh, business management. So planning to go to medical school and also have a side job as a business owner. Well, congratulations. Stick around. We need you in Albuquerque. So we hope you stay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. for Good, your good luck to you, Mr. Hassani. Next. Madam President, our next speaker is Althea Atherton. Althea, please go ahead and turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. President Borrego, I hereby challenge the city council to stop driving for the next week and learn, learn firsthand while bus ridership is low, because it's not the current ridership that keeps people off the bus. I've lived in Boston and DC where I'd ride alongside unhoused folks, millionaires, drug users, and commuters in their fancy suits, all on the same bus or the same train car every day. What our system lacks is hours and frequency. Make note of how often you'll have to call a ride because the buses fail this week. Because for my bus, the 16, poor frequency means 40 to 50 minutes of waiting in the sun. And poor hours means after the sun sets, my five minute walk home becomes 25 minutes from the art, alone in the dark as a gender marginalized person with chronic pain. That's not safety. Our safety, our state has ranked number one for pedestrian fatalities for capita for the last five years. And between that and our DWI rates, we must boost ridership by passing zero fare. Albuquerque has a lot to offer my family's small business, but this council's failure to strengthen transit is the reason we are considering leaving. I can't pilot a 3,000 pound lethal weapon and another speak could give me the freedom to not have to do that. We're safer when we can all ride the bus where we need it, when we need it, and with no fare conflicts. More riders gives passengers safety in numbers and leads to less traffic, fewer DWIs, and fewer pedestrian fatalities. I really hope this council enjoys the next week from city driving, awesome city driving I just gifted you. And if it doesn't sound like a gift, note that too. But please finish implementing this program tonight with no further bureaucratic delays. Remember what safety really means for people like me and like you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Atherton. I think we all who have ridden the bus understand your cha the challenges that you definitely have put on the table this evening. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Jerry Worrell. Mr. Worrell, I see you video on. Go ahead and unmute yourself and your time will begin when you start speaking. Uh, yes, I'm Jerry Worrell. I'm currently the West Side Coalition representative replacing Dr. Vias uh, to the Intercoalition panel. Um, and I wanted to talk to, to this afternoon about the NARO, uh, which is under consideration. I called Councillor Benton repeatedly this week to ask for a deferral of this item until out of respect for Dr. Joe and, and his being our point person um, on the NARO. Um, if you remember back, uh, the initial rewrite of this uh, NARO called for it to expire at the end of one year if it was not acted on by city council. It was not, and it has been extended a number of times. And I remember back on September 15th, 2017, Councillor Benton and uh, accepted our invitation and spoke to the West Side Coalition when I was then president about the uh, pause in recognizing new neighborhoods. So we're at this four or five years now. So here we are. My issues are this, the neighborhood engagement process was going to establish trust and empowerment I think it has not done that. The questionnaire summary was submitted without individual neighborhood responses being submitted to their city councilors. If I take my own city councilor, Lansena, uh, that would be one neighborhood would be uh, 3,000 homes that she would not hear from. That's quite a few votes. The questionnaire summary questions is another item, but I'm going to skip over that because the mor moratorium that was put in place choked off new neighborhoods. And finally, the recognition of a neighborhood can be blocked by a developer holding one vote. And I'd like to expand on that for as long as I can. Uh, where I live, uh, the uh, um, way out at 98th and I-40, the, the whole Sorry, area was- Sir, your, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Worrell. Um, Councillor Gibson, did you have, I'm sorry on the, I didn't see your hand up. So um, I just see, saw you waving on the last issue. So did you have a comment regarding that? Yes, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Madam President. Um, I am, am anticipating some questions 
that um, might be addressed if I get to sneak in for just a few minutes and ask questions of our uh, the director of animal welfare. Um, I have you later on, counselor, under qu administration question yeah. and answer. Could right. we wait for that then? That that's fine. That's fine. But if we do have if we do have a public comment on that, that might be a good time to to uh, um, yes uh, to talk about that. To ask those oh. questions of the director. Okay. Thank you, counselor. Thank um, you. So regarding the issue regarding the NARO, I see counselor Pena's hand up. I just wanted um, Mr. Worrell to fit, complete his, um, what he was talking about. Thank you. Okay, we can go back to Mr. Worrell and he can finish his statement. Uh, yes, uh, Madam President, uh, Councilor Pena, thank you for giving me that opportunity. What I'm talking about is a developer holds all of the lots and if that developer holds a lot out of uh, no matter how many they have, they can hold that without any neighborhood recognition being available through the development process if that is a homeowner association. And then it's dependent upon the neighborhood association to pick up the slack. Um, if we look at what NARO is possibly going to do, uh, where are the funds going to come from for us to be able to communicate to 3,000 homes uh, efficiently, how are we going to maintain contact lists? This is quite a Herculean task. And I think that there should be something in, in there. And I think council can work this out um, themselves as to what would constitute the proper amount of development of an area before the neighborhood gets an opportunity to be represented and recognized by city council, uh, whether than, rather than waiting an arbitrary period of time. I don't think any developer would hold a lot for 10, 12, 14 years, uh, but they can hold it for four or five years. In my neighborhood, because we, did, we were not sold out completely, the developer held and we had the stadium built in our neighborhood while, that was, while we had no voice through our homeowner association. Thank, thank and you, Mr. School. Worrell. You're welcome. We're going to, going to cut, cut that off at that point. And, and you can always speak under that item as well. So um, I don't think you're limited. Can he can speak under that item? No. No, if he already spoke on it. Oh, we're not taking any comments today on that item. Okay, thank you, Mr. Worrell. Um, we are going to move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Madam President. Our next speaker is Frank Comfort. Mr. Comfort, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, Madam President, uh, counselors, uh, good afternoon. I'm Frank Comfort, uh, the current uh, president of Laurelwood Neighborhood Association. We've been around here for 35 years and counting. And we'd like to ask in reference to the NARO on uh, item 14F02117, that it also be uh, deferred uh, at the minimum. There are too many uh, objections that are coming up and uh, we still don't believe it's been really complete to address some of the concerns uh, that we've seen so far. And if, if that's not done, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen to our neighborhoods further down the line. So I'm really concerned about this. Our neighbors are concerned about this. That we're going to lose all our, there won't be any communications between the uh, association and ONC anymore. That, that type, we're just here for listening, to just getting notifications, but we can't really participate with pretty much anything. So we're in support of Wascona and all the other neighborhoods that object to this, uh, 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 not object, we prefer to say, we need to correct and be more involved in this type of ordinance to get a little bit more voice and trying to resolve all these other issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Our next you, speaker. Sir. Our next speaker is Michael Brasher. Mr. Brasher, please let me turn. Let you allow, allow you to turn your video back on. And once you begin speaking, your time will start. Councilor Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, a special thanks to Councilor uh, Benton and President Borrego and and all the rest of the group. Uh, at our last meeting for 
uh, helping me with my problems to get online. Your help is appreciated. I think the process is very important. So thank you very much. East Gateway Coalition is requesting a deferral of NARO. The coalition doesn't support the ordinance in its present form. We've submitted detailed comments in August and some additional comments. Uh, some of the problematic areas are with respect to dues. Comments range from uh, it's unfair, it's heavy handed, and, and, and it's problematic. We share your interest in having a citizenry of individuals who are active, constructive participants in city government. We share that. Um, it's especially true when there's a, a, need, a need for a better understanding of our natural and social environment. So we do that. But I have to tell you that we use some of the dues money to disseminate a lot of information that's important to the community. So uh, uh, that, that's one of the concerns is uh, in the area of dues. As far as notices are concerned, two notices is just simply not enough. We think there's a very simple and inexpensive way to deal with this issue and that it will not impact the ONC budget. We filed comments on that. We ask you to take a look at that. With regard to the coalition membership, um, we're a group of neighborhood associations. We're, uh, we're obviously uh, inviting individual members to participate and attend our meetings, but we feel that the individual resident language must be struck. And one final thank note you, that Mr. I'll bring up. Brasher, your time is up. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to hear the final thought, Mr. Brasher, please. Uh, President Burrigo, thank you very much. One last note is that ONC on an annual basis needs to provide budget information on the set aside program detailing how those voter approved funds will be used in the council district. It's hoped this will encourage a more democratic process on how the funds are to be spent in the district. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Councilor Commissioner. We will go to our next individual. Thank you, Madam President. Our next speaker is Don Couchman. Couchman, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself and your time will begin when you start speaking. Mr. Couchman, are you there? Mr. Couchman, there you are. Uh, could you unmute yourself, sir, please? Thank you. I think we can uh, hear can you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, President Brago and counselors, uh, I am Donald Couchman. I'm the president of the Academy Hills Park Neighborhood Association, the District 8 Coalition, and the acting chairman of the Inter-Coalition Council. Among the inconsistencies and intrusive measures in included in the NARO are the elimination of membership dues and a significant conflict with Robert's Rules of Order regarding membership and voting rights. Without dues, how does an organization pay for printing, distribution of newsletters, and other incidental expenditures? Our neighborhood association over the past five years has donated almost $4,000 to civic organizations, including the public library. On this issue, the city's Office of Neighborhood Coordination includes in their Article 4 of their example bylaws, dues shall be set by the Board of Directors. Perhaps even more egregious is the statement that non-members can attend meetings, discuss issues, and votes. Do <clears throat> According to Robert's rules, this is just not allowed. And the issue of non-members attendance is covered in 24 separate paragraphs in the RONR. ONC's model by law, uh, bylaws states in Article 9, Robert's rules of order shall govern the association except where it is in conflict with these bylaws. This enormously important legislation needs to be rewritten with significant input from the citizens most impacted by it, the neighborhood associations and coalitions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank our you, next, sir. Our next speaker is Cordero Thomas. Mr. Thomas, please feel free to turn your video back on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Mr. Thomas? 
Okay. Uh, yes, I was trying to uh, get it straight. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, my name is Thomas, and I'm going to read something interesting. It's a little off topic, okay? Um, it says, Florida is ahead of the game with the state opening at least 25 monoclonal antibody centers as the research from Mayo Clinic shows the COVID-19 therapy is up to 70% 70, 70 effective in preventing hospitalization if done early. Um, at least 74,465 4, 74, people have been treated with monoclonal antibodies at these treatment centers in Florida, according to Simone Marstella, Secretary of Florida's Agency for Healthcare Administration. Um, so end of article and from reading some of the comments on this public post article commenters assert that this treatment is available in places other than Florida. And some of the comments suggest that there is even criteria for this treatment so I'm not being biased or anything. Um, the second part of this article um, reads this Dr. Marween Whalen caught COVID. She was fully vaccinated and she experienced a high fever. She immediately went to get the monoclonal antibody treatment. And in eight hours, she said she had no aches or fevers. Um, within 36 hours, she had a 90% reduction of sinus congestion, fatigue, and body aches. Um, so according to CDC data, Florida is seeing a 20% drop in hospitalizations because of this treatment. So uh, just simply my comment is, when will monoclonal antibody treatments be available in New Mexico? Thank you, sir. We will probably need to send that to our Department of Health at the state level. But um, if you'll contact my office, we can do that. Sir, you're, you are muted. Okay, I do apologize. My phone is muted. Um, I, my, my phone went blank. Who was just speaking just now? I, I, I was speaking, sir, and I, what I suggested is you contact my office and we can send that forward to the Department of Health. Thank you. Next. Our next speaker is Ms. Ward. Ms. Ward, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. President Borrego e. Counselors, all SRMNA board members oppose the passage of O2171. Here are three of our several concerns. One, the notion that the city wants to promote fairness and democracy in private, freely formed volunteer organizations is a red herring. While the SRMNA strongly supports fairness and democracy and endeavors to operate in such a manner, the imposition of rules on NAs with the, via the NARO is suspect. NAs in Albuquerque do not receive regular funding to provide services, do not conduct public hearings, and do not follow census tracts. Two, the city risks treating residents differently based on whether or not they live within the boundaries of recognized associations or coalitions. The proposed NARO attempts to deny standing in quasi-judicial proceedings to affected residents who do not live within the boundaries of recognized organizations in cases for which conditions may otherwise be similar to residents who do live within the boundaries of recognized organizations. Three, the city continues to work at cross purposes with itself with regard to crime. High density, high intensity areas are crime hotspots in Albuquerque. The IDO promotes high density, high intensity development and the IDO and proposed NARO remove neighborhood voices from the development approval process. Does the city prefer to chase its tail blindly with regard to crime? Please vote no or against O2171. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Azebo. Azebo, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Hello, Madam President and esteemed council members. Thank you for giving me this time to speak with you. I, um, my name is Sarah Azebo, and I'm a bus writer as well as the Associate Director of Catholic Charities Center for Refugee Support. Many of the families in our programs participated in a forum this summer to share the obstacles they'd faced due to lack of funds for public transit, advocating for zero fares. As the primary language of these families is not English or Spanish, I am here to represent their voices. Our families were grateful and proud to have a voice in addressing this need. Free fares for their families would be a game changer, allowing them to experience Albuquerque more fully, removing an obstacle they have to get to their jobs, schools, places of worship, and community events. During the forum, families shared the hardships they'd faced with not having sufficient bus fare. One mother with her two children being 25 cents short, trying to get to a dental appointment to have four teeth removed. An Afghan woman being laughed at and teased for not speaking English when she didn't understand why the bus driver wouldn't let her on when she didn't have the correct fare. 
and a child pleading with the driver to please let his father ride to work so he could get, his, get to his job on time and promising to find money to pay the fare the next day. These families needed to be heard and felt they had been heard when the budget was passed to support this program for zero fares. They have been eagerly awaiting the start of this. As Madi had said, more refugee newcomers are coming to Albuquerque very soon, and this would give them economic relief to begin their new lives. I have learned that security concerns are the reason for delayed implementation. As a writer myself, I appreciate your concern for safety of all writers. Catholic Charities would welcome the opportunity to be part of the safety planning. I see zero fares you, as a way for Albuquerque to model what's possible to unite our community. Thank you. Thank you. Please Thank you, Madam. Uh, Madam President, I just wanted to mention to those that are attendees that uh, have signed up to speak, if I send a request to become a panelist, please accept it. And with that, our next speaker is Cynthia Rodriguez. Rodriguez, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Hi, yeah, I came on to talk about the fairs too. Uh, so I saw that one of the big concerns was that homeless people would be riding the bus if the fares became zero, um, and that that might uh, create problems of crime. But I think that people in the community have also really been well at spotlighting that that's not the issue. Um, and that actually making it accessible to everybody and actually fixing the run times is what's necessary. Um, especially when you look at the prices for passes, even for a day pass, it's $2, you're paying $2 a day. Um, that's at least $60 a month. Um, and then even for a year, it's two twenty five. dollars I can't see anybody um, in need being able to afford those things. Uh, so making the bus fare free, I think, is beneficial for everybody. That means people can have access to things, including homeless people that actually do need to be able to have transportation to get to these programs that we say are available to them in order to help them out. So um, it's important that everybody have access to that. Um, and the money is clearly there for it. And it seems like the community largely is in favor of it. So to vote no on that um, seems like you would just a lot of people actually that are in this thing at this moment. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Mr. Moya. Our next speaker is Keith Romero. Mr. Romero, go ahead and meet yourself and your time will begin when you start speaking. Thank you, everybody. Madam President, <clears throat> Councilors Keith Romero, Vice President of the Barrelas Community Coalition, here to offer comment on Resolution 21-191, the Community Benefits Agreement, and as it relates to the stadium bond resolution, the BCC supports the CBA amendment in its current format, more specifically that um, the CBA is a condition precedent to the zone change uh, request by the city. The reason we're raising that is because I saw on the agenda <clears throat> that there was an anticipated amendment making the CBA uh, a condition precedent to a lease agreement. Um, well, we don't disagree with the lease agreement language. We do want, we would request that it be passed with the zone change um, amendment language in the CBA. Secondly, um, there was a com comment at the land use meeting that not all communities were consulted. We want to echo Councilman Benton's uh, statement that it provides a broad enough framework and a thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bex Hampton. Ms. Hampton, please feel free to turn your video on. Unmute yourself and your time will begin when you start speaking. Hello. Um, so yeah, I'm a resident of Albuquerque, a user of public transportation, and just as a principal, I believe public transportation should be free for people to do whatever they want and need to do, um, like go to work, school, run errands, and even do fun activities in their free time. And in one of the poorest states in the nation where many struggle to make enough for rent and food, public transit is just another financial burden. Um, the city council and the mayor's office, the least the city council and mayor's office can do is provide free transit, which isn't even meeting the bare minimum of people's needs in Albuquerque. And um, some have said um, that you're worried about homeless people riding the bus. And I really can't think of a more heartless and anti-human argument against uh, zero bus fare. 
you know, if someone is homeless, they need a job, healthcare, housing, and social services, which are all essential to life services. And sometimes bus fare is the only thing preventing an unsheltered person from making a doctor's appointment, a meeting with a social worker, or showing up on time for new employment. And um, all these things can drastically improve their life and even help them obtain housing. And as a former housing case manager, I've seen this in action. Um, people are desperate for bus passes because it's, you know, it's too expensive. We really need money for people's needs, like transportation and housing, not for police who criminalize and brutalize unsheltered people in Albuquerque. Raising wages, guaranteeing income, housing, and transportation are the solution, not policing people and not sports stadiums. So City Council, Mary Tim Keller, stop stalling. The people demand free public transportation now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Shea. Ms. Shea, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Uh, thank you, Madam President and Council Members. My name is Diana Shea. I am the current president of the Taylor Ranch Neighborhood Association, but right now I'm going to talk to you just as a 35 year dues paying member of TRNA. And I'm talking on NARO and I'm asking that you defer uh, passage of it because at this point, I think the document as written has so many um, flaws and changes to it that it just needs to go back to the drawing board. We've got uh, so many concerns that have been raised about provisions in it, and then so many amendments that have been proposed, purported to address these concerns. And for me specifically, I'm very puzzled by the uh, numbering that's used in the um, Council Bill 0-21-71. It starts out by saying that we're um, going to replace Section 14-18-2. And then on the next page, when we get to repeal, it says we're going to repeal 14-8-2, and then immediately it goes on to talk about section 14-8-2 being enacted as followed. So it sounds like you're repealing this numbered section and then resurrecting it. And then in the subsequent pages, um, it is referred to a number of times as something needs to be um, prescribed by section 14 8 2. Blah, 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 Thank blah, you, ma'am. Your blah. time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Our next speaker is Kathy Adams. Ms. Adams, please feel free to turn your video back on. Unmute yourself. Your time will begin when you start speaking. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I am here to very firmly state, well, first of all, I am a, a resident of La Luz Landowners Association, and I am a member of the West Side Coalition of Neighborhood Associations. And I want to state that this narrow revision needs to be withdrawn. It needs to be rewritten with a process of open discussion and authentic, authentic citizen input. Review of the NEP process revealed significant weaknesses that some of you might not have looked at. The only documents that are now available for public discourse are the NEP, are the NEP updates and the NEP phase three report. The data and the written neighborhood responses are not available. This is because standard public survey procedures were not followed and the data was not collected in a double blind manner to ensure privacy for all responders. So the document, the product that they had could not, cannot at this time be linked to the narrow because we cannot go back and look at that data. In addition, when you read the NEP phase three report, you find that the neighborhood concerns that were outlined have not been addressed in the current revision of narrow. I thank the counselors who have asked for input and suggested changes and amendments, but I must insist that a well-written document 
a well-written citizen sensitive document would not demand extensive amendments. And therefore, I want to reiterate my request that the council withdraw this proposed ordinance and work to Thank rewrite you, legislation. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Before I call the next speaker, uh, Madam President, I just want to note, Mr. Dan Regan, I see you an attendee and you're signed up to speak. Please uh, accept the promotion to panelists so you can provide your comments. And with that, our next uh, person to speak is Renee Horvath. So that, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Renee Horvath. I'm with the Taylor Ranch Neighborhood Association and with the West Side Coalition. Uh, and as you know, um, you've heard a lot of comments about the proposed NARO, but I, I do want to point out that the, the current NARO was updated in 2007. And it was uh, with a task force that included neighborhoods. And so they helped develop to develop ideas on how to de uh, deal with boundary issues. And they had neighborhood responsibilities, but they also had developers responsibilities. And so uh, it, and it had some points like, let's look at how to uh, identify conflicts and resolve them between the neighborhoods and the private sector and, and improve our communication. So it has a lot of good points in there. And yet, uh, and even though we had the neighborhood engagement process, we did have a good interview, Taylor Ranch did, but a lot of our discussion is not included in this proposed NARO. So, um, it, it, and we never did have, we asked for meetings. I know the neighborhoods asked for a lot of meetings. Let's discuss it. Let's resolve some of these issues. Let's understand and help answer these questions. So I too would support a deferral and not just a few weeks, but you know, at least uh, maybe a couple of months or more to resolve these issues. And, uh, and also uh, I know there's some uh, amendments being proposed. We haven't even seen those amendments. So I would urge definitely a deferral and we should resolve thank these you, issues. Hildreth. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank our you. Ne our next speaker is Nita Day. Stay, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself and your time will begin when you start speaking. Good afternoon, President Borrego, counselors of the City Council. Uh, I come to you as the secretary for the Taylor Ranch Neighborhood Association. We take the formal position that the city uh, opposed this legislation um, and at a minimum defer it for up to 90 days if need be. However, the withdrawal of the current, of the current NARO uh, withdraws with it the purposes and statements for why and the reasons as to why the NARO even exists. The new NARO as proposed questionably, relate, questionably raises a, uh, why, what is the legitimate public purpose for why the city is an enact, enacting this new legislation. Um, the raw data, as um, Ms. Adams pointed out from the NEP processes is not available, which demonstrates that it was not a systematic professional consultation process for which reasoned and, and systematic decisions were made in the proposal of the revisions of the new NARO legislation. And my concern is, is that ultimately you're treading on organizations who are volunteer organizations, rights to organize, gather, contract with one another. I mean, there are a lot of issues constitutionally with this proposed NARO. So I encourage the city council to please uh, withdraw this NARO or vote it down, <laughs> defer it, do something because it will, your constituents who have elected you do not support this legislation as it the effect it Thank will you. have is, is it will chill 
the the ability of in neighborhoods to have input and appeal. Thank you, Ms. State. Madam, your finish your up. thought. Just your, very briefly, finish your thought. The narrow effect will have essentially remove the ability of neighborhoods to be recognized and therefore have a appeal standing in land use public planning um, Thank you, and zoning projects. That was my complete thought. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Peggy Neff. Ms. Neff, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Ms. Neff, are you there? I am. Go ahead. I keep my um, video off to represent the multitudes of people who cannot join these forums due to the electronic nature of them. Anyway, unfortunately, and without much hope, I'm again compelled to speak before this council. I'm dumbfounded to have to ask you to host public meetings regarding the new Neighborhood Association Recognition Ordinance. As well, I feel I must call for the recusal of Councilor Benton, Jones, Gibson, and now Councilor Harris on this matter. I've sent you all a copy of my notes. They were part of a complaint that I filed at the AG's office last week on advice from a very wise man, Dr. Joe Valles, may he rest in peace. I requested injunctive relief from the AG's office. We community members from across the city would like to see 02171 withdrawn or at least deferred from your agenda until public meetings can be held to review a neighborhood ordinance. In sending these notes to city council last week, no questions were addressed to me. I did not even receive an email back from council services nor from ONC indicating that they had received my notes. This is not the way you should treat people. My personal feelings aside, it is certainly not the way to represent cause for transparency and inclusion. Anyway, besides the issues raised in my complaint to the AG's office, the transference of government roles to voluntary organizations, the overlapping NA issue, the legitimizing of abuses at neighborhood associations, and more, I have to follow up on another subject. I would like to ask for clarification from the chair as to ex parte communications while discussing the narrow ordinance. Is this allows? Is this allowed? In that there were ex parte communications going on through the IDO amendment process, which I thought would have been considered quasi-judicial proceeding. Thank I would like to Smith. clarify in regard as to whether or not counselors will need to refrain from dialogue with staff, with other counselors, and with the Thank public you, while Your discussing O2171. Thank you, Madam. Our next speaker is Dan Regan. Mr. Regan, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Right on time, Dave, right on. Mr. Moy, I'm gonna ask you to hold my clock. <clears throat> I have a procedural problem. Um, President Brego, I looked through the agenda as carefully as I could twice. I didn't see any change from the two minutes to the minute and a half of today. I understand y'all are doing 30 people, so I understand an adjustment. I just want you to, I want to register that it is tremendously frustrating to try to put together only two minutes of comments. And as the meeting starts, be told you only have a minute and a half. Okay, uh, Mr. Moyer, you can start my clock if you will, please. President Borrego and counselors, I'm representing District 4 Coalition and the Napa Heights Neighborhood Association. 02171 is a badly flawed document, both process-wise and content-wise, because my time is short, I'm gonna start with my conclusions. I recommend that this revision of the narrow be completely voted down and a new effort begin with a process that actually includes the residents in a meaningful manner. If this is not done, I strongly suggest that the narrow be deferred until all amendments can be reviewed by all parties. The justifying whereases of this bill strongly tout the neighborhood engagement process and its report and says that the narrow revision is based on the findings of the NEP. Two problems with that. First, the report's findings said that trust between the city and its residents was busted and needed to be reestablished and nurtured. It also said that moving forward ways and means needed to be used, which would engage the residents in the, of the city in positive ways. 
The process used in the current narrow revision was the op op exact opposite of these findings. And the city's engaged residents have been trying to say that for two years. Second problem, even after multiple IPRA requests, the raw data of the 30,000 publicly, dollar 30,000 publicly funded NEP survey were never released. So no one, not even you counselors, can know with any certainty whether this narrow reflects any part of the NEP survey. Tonight, 13 new amendments are potentially slated to be added to this narrow. None of them, as I speak at this moment, have yet been shared with the public. If they are voted on tonight, in my humble opinion, the council will be guilty of what in many professional practices would be called malpractice. Thank you, Mr. Regan, your time is up. <clears throat> Madam President, that concludes public comments. Um, before we uh, go, Mr. Regan, I just wanna mention that all of our um, public comment uh, uh, scripts, at least that I've read in the last year, have been a minute and a half. So I just want to address that issue um, right up front. Um, thank you so much. And uh, with that, that concludes our public comment. I'm sorry, I muted myself. Counselors, any questions or comments? If not, we will move on to our administration question and answer period. And um, Councillor Bassan, you have the first set of questions. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, one question that I have uh, is in regards to an email that we recently received as a council about uh, someone reaching out. And I know I've heard this from multiple constituents. It's not just one, but this was the email that really got me to where I wanted to ask the administration. Um, people are concerned for the length of time they are on hold when they call 911. They are concerned for not getting a response at all and being sent to a recording. So in the event of an emergency, what should people do if, and, and I understand we have staffing issues globally, I understand, but when people are harmed or injured or their life is being threatened, what else should they do? Or what do you recommend the public proceed with doing so that way they can go ahead and get help and assistance as soon as possible? We have someone in the chief's office ready to respond to that. Yes. Council President Borrego and Councilor Bassan, I'm Deputy Chief JJ Griego, and with me here is the ECC manager, uh, Erica Wilson. And I, I really appreciate your question. Um, we take these uh, complaints seriously. I, as a Deputy Chief, since I have gotten uh, the ECC in the last reorg, I look at all of these complaints myself. Um, one of the things that we look at when we get these complaints is the data points that the phone system uh, tracks for us. Now, the phone system is not like your average PBX you find at a business. It collects a lot of data and we're able to look at that data to kind of see where we need to go uh, and also uh, look at some of these complaints. Now, um, the national standard uh, for answering a 911 call uh, is 90% of calls within 15 seconds and 95% within 20 seconds. Uh, I get daily reports uh, on uh, the call times, the times it takes to answer, and uh, we're right around 80% in getting, in a, getting them answered in that time frame. Uh, there's no national standard for a non-emergency line, which is our 242 COPS. However, we are striving to get that phone answered in 180 seconds uh, or three minutes. Now, the time it takes someone to answer uh, is uh, influenced by three different things. Uh, Staffing being one, call volume and call complexity. Uh, you know, when we get these phone calls in, uh, you know, they, there's a lot of analysis involved in them. There is a lot of work that's done by the uh, call taker uh, and subsequently by the dispatcher. So in reference to the specific uh, email that you had sent, Councillor Bassan, um, we did have a call from one number regarding an aggressive driver on 911, that call was in queue, which means it rang at the ECC for 29 seconds. 
uh, we see, received another call about an accident at Academy in McKinney, um, and that call rang for two minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, it, uh, you know, the when we have car accidents on, on major thoroughfares or major intersections, we do get an inundation of calls into the communication center, and that's where we go back to that uh, second factor that I indicated before, which is call volume. So sometimes it may take longer to screen those calls. We can't just hang up on them or say, yeah, we already got it because it may be another accident. The circumstances around the accident may have changed uh, or somebody may see something different, uh, you know, such as a person injured um, that the other people didn't report to us. The third call that the individual spoke of uh, was um, essentially he was reporting a fire. Uh, the call was in queue for 15 seconds. Um, and it was uh, disconnected by the caller and we called back uh, within a minute uh, to the individual. Now, when we did call back, uh, he did say that AFR was already on the scene. Um, the other incident in the, uh, the complaint that was referenced was the same one that was referenced uh, on a news story recently. Um, and it said that they called 911 numerous times um, and no one answered. Uh, they didn't call 911, they called 242 cops. Uh, and the victim called 242 cops and was in queue for 12 minutes and 35 seconds. Now, remember, I said that there's no national standard and we are trying for that 180 seconds. So there is obviously room for improvement. Um, you know, when we look at those calls, and Councillor Bassan, I also sent you some uh, other information via email. When we went to look for this call, um, we had calls asking about the time, calling 911 to ask about the time of day, calling 911 to ask what day of the week it is. Um, and that is not unusual. Um, and that also impacts the time that we have to allocate uh, towards answering the true 911s uh, on the line. So those are the specifics. Um, you know, the things that we are doing to kind of uh, address some of the concerns related to staffing. We currently have six vacancies and we are uh, in the process of hiring three more. Um, we have, that's in the uh, dispatcher, dispatcher section. No, that's in the uh, 911 operator. There's two different um, aspects of the ECC. One is the initial call taker. The other is the uh, dispatcher who dispatches the officers. Um, and then there's 11 vacancies there. Uh, the issue we are also having is we have a tremendous amount of forced overtime to try and sustain the levels that we're at now. Uh, the administration has approved us to get uh, 10 additional personnel to screen calls. Now it might seem like an easy thing to just bring in 10 people and have them answer phones, but you have to be certified by the state in order to handle a 911 call and you can get those on 242 COPS. So what we're doing is we are having um, these 10 people come in, answer those calls and kick those ones out that are asking what time of the day it is or what day of the week or those things that need to go to 311 um, or other departments of the city and have those calls referred out to where they need to go. So in order, when you call 911 or 242 cops, you go into this queue and the queue is exactly what it sounds like. It's a line essentially. So. If we were to have people start answering that queue, the 242 cops, and someone calls in, I have somebody answer the phone and talk to them and find out, yes, this person needs to talk to a dispatcher or see an officer, and then I put that person on hold, that person would go to the end of that queue again. So in order to avoid that, we had to establish a totally separate queue where those calls that would be screened would then be pushed into the 242 cops queue, um, where they would still be in line uh, for the uh, in the place that they were in when they called. Now, another complaint that we get is they called 242 cops five or six times uh, and nobody answered. The way the phone system works is if you call, nobody answers and you hang up and call again, you've just put yourself back in line and you've done that for five or six times in a row. Um, you know, we are, uh, you know, examining some of the issues that we have with uh, service providers. In other words, when I get a complaint that says I called no one, uh, 911 and no one answered, I can go back and look at our phone system to see that that call was never delivered to us. So there may be an issue with the carrier, um, but it's not on the ECC side. The phone call was never delivered to the center. So 
that is something that we're looking at as well. Um, you know, the big thing is, you know, we're trying to hire. We've interviewed over the last year, or we've gotten applications for over 500 personnel. Uh, that resulted in probably 39 people making it through. This is a tough job that dispatchers and uh, call takers have. You know, you go from one minute of, uh, you know, ad hominem vitriol uh, to, you know, hearing somebody grieve, uh, and it just, it's nonstop. And, uh, you know, finding the people that are capable of doing that and have the skill set has been a little bit challenging, but we are making progress. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, thank you, Officer. Uh, Counselor, did you want to follow up, Counselor Bassan? Because uh, Counselor Davis is waiting to speak. Um, I mean, no, I get that this is going to be another work in progress as well. I just, you, when people are needing help, we need to be there, but I also realize this, it's just kind of a broken record at this point. And I'm not blaming APD, I'm just saying citywide. So thank you for the explanation. I guess you answered my one question that was, if things get, if people get a call picked up, do they get put on hold again? And it sounds like sometimes they may because they're getting transferred to the right location and that could increase their wait time. Am I correct with that? Madam President, Councillor Bassan, I will let uh, Ms. Wilson address that question. Madam President, Councillor Bassan, the 242 screening will allow us, right now we're having time frames where people are waiting 10, 15 or longer, as I'm sure you've heard and as I've heard, to speak to an operator to have initial screening done. It's unfortunate, but sometimes we have people call 242 COPS, which is why we recently did a social media public education campaign on when to call 911, when to call 242, but people will call 242 because they don't want to disturb 911. When they call 911 and if I don't have an operator immediately available, they will hear a recording which is telling them to stay on the line for the next available operator. They're not put on hold, but I understand why a queue means hold to the community. On top of that, when the screeners that DC Griego was just speaking about will help us screen the 242 calls where we're seeing the lengthy um, wait times to even be initially screened. So those are the personnel that we'll be using to screen 242 calls. They'll then be put into a, an additional queue where they'll wait for um, an operator to get to them to enter their call for service. Thank you for that. Madam President, I don't have any more follow-up questions with this. I just have another one once we're done with this topic. Thank you, Councilor Basson. Councilor Davis, you've been waiting to speak. Are you there? Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Chief, I appreciate that. And you almost touched on my piece a little bit. I just wanted to ask, uh, I think two years ago and then uh, earlier this year, we, review, we revisited uh, the city council was asked to appropriate a half million dollars for hard to hire positions, and that was supposed to include 911 operators. You mentioned that uh, we had had over 500 applicants that resulted in about 30 something um, final dispatchers. And, and I know how hard it is to get folks certified from, um, from the little bit that I used to do in that department. But I'm curious if you've seen any increase in qualified applicants, or and if you can tell us how that uh, hard to hire program has helped to increase or not impact um, hiring of those those positions. Madam President, Councilor Davis, I will defer to Ms. Wilson on the recruiting aspect of it. Madam President, Councilor Davis, we've actually started reviewing and screening applications every two weeks, as opposed to doing um, a month or six weeks of application review. So every single two weeks, my staff are reviewing applications and we're testing. This weekend we reviewed the applications that were received for the last two weeks. We called them today to invite them to testing tomorrow. We're not letting anything dry under our feet because we want to get these people pulled in because it is a competitive job market. I do think there has been some assistance with the referral bonus because a lot of our employees refer in good candidates and there's also the hiring incentive that's in place now so there has been benefit from that and madam president if i might follow 
Ms. Wilson, thank you. That's helpful. My, my question is sort of two parts, but I'll put it into one, make it easy. Um, number one, I think we've seen uh, sort of corporate folks and in, including other municipalities, even the state have responded by uh, doing hiring in a more uh, efficient and ambitious manner. And I appreciate that. But it seems to me that somebody who applies and waits two weeks may have already found another job in this job market. Uh, I wonder if there's a way to shrink that or what we can do in that regard. And number two, how long does it take from the time someone applies to the time we sit them down in a chair to begin their training at the academy? How long do they have to be unemployed waiting on us to do our part? Madam President and Councillor Davis, there, that's two answers. So one, the fact that they have just applied last Thursday and we're screening them on Saturday and inviting them to testing on Monday. I, I think we're very aggressive in that. Um, we've also reached out on social media. There's multiple platforms that I'm on where I've posted our posting um, so we can try and recruit. There's a, a young lady who is moving to Kirtland with her husband who's in the military and posted our recruiting because she was looking for jobs in Albuquerque. Well, I'd rather snag her first before anybody else. I will tell you that the state of New Mexico and Rio Rancho and Bernalillo County are struggling with applicants as well. And this is also a nationwide issue in 911. To answer your second um, question, it, if we, the people that we're interviewing now, um, they will be hired for a December class if we know they're employed. Um, if there's some situation, we can bring them on early. So we're working with candidates and the city has been very aggressive in processing them and um, getting them through not only the typing test, the critical multitask testing, the interview, the background. Um, we hire before we get the city does their background, but before we get the full police background, we've screened it and we bring them on anyway. And it's very rare that we haven't initially done a screening where we're in a situation where we have to release somebody based on background. Um, we lose candidates up front based on background, but not in the hiring process. So we are planning academies. They're seven weeks long every other month. And thank you. And, so we and Ms. Wilson, I'll just end and say, because uh, I know other counselors behind me, but could you address that question about that half million dollars that was put into the hard to hire positions campaign? It took almost a year, if I recall, maybe a little less to get the campaign off the ground. But have you seen results from that? And can you point us to those? We specific, I'm sorry, um, Madam President, Counselor Davis, we have had some candidates who have come through the process who've been referral um, or would have been an employee referral bonus, but they have not successfully completed the process. On the flip side, we have some candidates hired for October who will um, get part of the hiring incentive. Thanks, Madam President. I think that program was something different though. It was about videos and recruiting and, and doing other work that I heard Ms. Wilson talk about her office doing. And so I was just curious and maybe we can follow up with HR about how to do that. And I'm sure it's all together, but uh, it would be a good to take a look at how that, that money was spent. So thank you, Madam President, for the patience. Thank you. Uh, and if you all could just reach out to Councillor Davis's office regarding that issue um, for follow-up. Uh, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and for the department, I just want to say thank you. It's very nice to hear that you are uh, full press on hiring and training and getting our 911 operators in shape. And then I will tell you a little bit about a, an experience that I had personally. Uh, we had an active shooter directly across the street from an elementary school in my district. We called 242 cops to no avail. Didn't even get close to getting an answer. Went to 911 and did not get a response from 911. Now this is a few months ago, so I must say this is why I'm so pleased to hear that you are all out trying to put people in these departments. But it was well beyond 10 minutes when I finally, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but I called the Sheriff's Department and I had a Sheriff's officer on site arresting the gentleman within four minutes. So um, I just have to tell you how bad it has been in our city and I hope that you get a grip on this 
and you can take care of people with the amount of crimes that we're having committed with weapons, uh, with the amount of drugs everywhere in the city. Um, for a citizen not to be able to reach 911 is just uh, inexcusable. So thank you. I hope this works. I have you, hope you have it in process and it really will work. And if I can help in any way, call our office and we'll do everything we can. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Um, and I just wanted to mention also, uh, whenever you all have um, positions that you're hiring for, and I know often I've seen those in our emails from the mayor's office, um, please send them to the counselors because we have our own um, sometimes outlets through Facebook or you know we can repost them um, or Twitter or other outlets that we might have. So absolutely agree with uh, Councillor Jones about contacting us and, and seeing if there's a way that we can help you. So thank you officers for, um, I think that concludes with that question. We are going to move on with Councillor Gibson to animal welfare, Councillor Gibson. Hey, Madam President, I do have one more question that I had given. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor. Um, That's okay. You jumped to the second question, so I just kind of thought Oh, no, I'm sorry. I knew that one would take a lot longer. On my um, script, I thought maybe you weren't going to ask the first question. No, the first question I'm very excited to ask, Madam President. Uh, I think I finally got the verbiage right. After all of these months of asking, how many officers do we have? I want to know how many field services bureau officers do we have? How many boots on the ground working three shifts a day, seven days a week, protecting all of us do we currently have and I guess hopefully if you if you know it how many do we need Madam President and Councilor Bassan this is um, Commander Barker so we have 908 total officers and we currently have 478 in field services field services also includes our problem response team and we currently have a, a staffing study that will give us an idea of how many officers that we need to see in each bureau to be fully staffed. Thank you, Commander. Do you have any idea how many officers we want in the Field Services Bureau to be traditionally fully staffed? I don't mean to put you on the spot because I know I didn't send that over in advance, but I'm just curious. Madam President and Councilor Busan, I do not have that exact number. Um, that is something that we are looking at in our staffing study. Um, obviously, we would love to see those numbers higher. So would I, Commander. Thank you so much. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad to have that number finally. Thank you. Um, before I go to the other counselors that have their hands up, I, uh, since I have Commander uh, Barker there, I would like to know um, how many officers are in the academy right now? are soon to be officers. Madam President, um, I don't have that number in front of me, but I can get that to you by the end of the day and send an email to all counselors. Thank you very much. We will move to a couple of counselors who have questions, Counselor Senna and then Counselor Davis. Thank you, Madam President, um, and thank you, Commander Parker. So for that staffing study, um, I've heard a lot about it uh, since coming onto council. I would love to know when that's going to be released um, and you know, what are the parameters within that study? Um, if we could even add additional questions or just you know, learning of the study and when it will be released would be really helpful to understand, you know, is this adequate for this year or for the next year? Madam President and Councillor Spina, the staffing study is um, a few weeks to a month in right now. Um, we do not have a date um, that it is expected by. However, um, the uh, individual who is conducting the study is working diligently to conduct interviews with all of the bureau leaders um, so that they can provide that to us within a timely manner and that so that we can get an update as soon as possible. Okay, we'd love to follow up. Thank you. If you would follow up with Councillor Senna's office, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. Commander, thanks so much. I, but to follow up on that, 
the city council funded a $90,000 APD staffing study last year that we provided to the administration and APD, and we're still waiting on comments back from APD on that one. Is the department doing a different one, or is this just to answer the council's questions in response to the staffing study that we updated from the first staffing study we did when DOJ reforms began? Madam President and Councilor Davis, um, we are aware of the staffing study that was conducted, and this is to um, answer further questions that we had in reference to that staffing study as some of the information that we reviewed is outdated based on our current staffing. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Commander. Is it the same vendor that's doing it, or are we? Yes, sir. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much. That's, that's good to know, and we do look forward to that. Um, I know there were a number of options for staffing in there that we'd love to see. So thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Commander. I'm glad to see there's progress on it. I know that uh, you know very well. Um, you've been working on that really hard, so we appreciate it. Just a quick follow-up on that question, uh, Commander Barker. What is the timeline uh, for finalizing that study? Any idea? And if you don't have that answer, you can always get back to me. Madam President, I do not have the exact timeline, um, but as I stated, um, we are working to get that done very promptly, and I will follow up with you on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, C Commander. Um, I don't see any other questions for you this evening. I think uh, we've satisfied uh, Councillor Bassan. So with that, we are going to move to Councillor Gibson with animal welfare. Councillor Gibson, sorry. I know you've been waiting a long time, Councillor, on this one, so go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Actually, I thought we were going to hear more about this earlier, so sorry for that interruption. But I do have uh, a few uh, questions uh, for, uh, two questions, actually, for um, our Animal Welfare Department Director, uh, Ortega. And I think I, there she is. <laughs> Uh, hello, Director. How are you? Good. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Good. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. First of all, I I missed the the press conference and the tour of the new clinic, um, and uh, I, I'm really sorry I did that. I know I, I did send you a note about that, but I want to congratulate you and your department for doing this in what must be record time for the city. It's record time to stand up a clinic of this nature. And, uh, you know, very, very important to have this, you know, for, for um, uh, particularly for uh, spay and neutering and getting, you know, uh, th that's just so important for a, a, a very healthy um, pet population uh, in Albuquerque. So. Great job, and I and I sincerely appreciate that. But I do have some difficult, two difficult questions for you. Um, and and uh, so there has been emails, and we there was quite a a, a story on one of the uh, 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 TV channels over the weekend. But I actually had these questions formed um, before that, before that even aired. And this is, uh, the first one is regarding uh, volunteerism there. Do we currently have a volunteer coordinator on staff? Has that position been filled yet? Uh, President Borrego and Councillor Gibson, we currently do not have a volunteer coordinator position. Um, it's now called community engagement coordinator. Um, okay. And, um, we are actually not just recruiting for one community engagement coordinator, we are now recruiting for three and community engagement coordinators because we have the high, one of the higher populations of volunteerism in our department. And we also are focused on uh, increasing our foster program as well. So this community, these community engagement coordinators will actually be overseeing those efforts. Okay, good. And as I understand it, they, or at least what they uh, used to be called, the volunteer coordinators, were also responsible, I believe, for training. And, and if that's true, uh, I'm wondering if the reason that our volunteer population is very small right now is if, that, if that's because of 
training issues. And, and where I'm trying to get to is my final question really is, on this topic anyway, is would it be possible to let some, uh, some of the um, more seasoned, um, uh, longer term volunteers take on those training responsibilities for the volunteers to do, you know, rather, you know, simple tasks. Would that be a possibility, Director? Uh, thank you for that question, Councillor Gibson. Our behavior manager and our behavior specialist, and we are also uh, increasing our behavior team to one more person, uh, typically do the hands-on training. And we are also working on virtual training in the handling both of dogs and cats. We currently um, partnered with the civic engagement team over at the mayor's office, and they provided us with an AmeriCorps VISTA who has a vast array of experience with volunteers. Um, in her previous job, she oversaw about a thousand volunteers. So in the interim, while we are working on identifying those volunteer coordinators, she will be helping us to do some of the recruiting and um, putting together some of the virtual, cra uh, virtual training. Um, she also has a background in IT. Uh, so she's going to be a great resource with both her bachelor's degree and her master's degree. Uh, AmeriCorps VISTAs are, are really um, serve full, serve as full-time employees for about one year, and they build capacity um, for public agencies to help them more effectively generate the commitment of, commitment of private sector resources. So she's going to be a huge asset to us. Uh, as we identify those volunteer coordinators. Uh, but in the meantime, we are looking at doing some, uh, some mentorship programs for, with some of our, our volunteers who have been, uh, been with us for quite a while and have them be shadowed by our new volunteers um, so that they can, they can see what is done on a day-to-day -day basis with those volunteers. So we're excited about, about that effort as well. So I'm glad to hear, I'm really glad to hear that uh, because one of the complaints I got was that people who had expressed an interest to volunteer weren't, uh, people weren't, they weren't um, being contacted to follow up. And I wondered, um, because right now everybody is short staffed, right? I'll bet almost every department is, has, is experiencing that to some degree. I was just wondering if the reason for that was that we did not have an avenue to train them adequately. Is that, would you say that that would be a reason that people are not uh, be, being followed up with when they do express uh, interest to volunteer? One of the things that I think might be a, a, a little bit of a delay is that many of our volunteers are seniors and um, signing up in the system is very difficult for them, as I heard in an earlier part of this meeting. So we are going to do some recruiting efforts at the senior centers where we can walk them through the process of signing up and identifying exactly what they would like to do in the shelters. Um, and we will uh, promote that as a recruiting effort for more people to sign up. And then we'll work on the onboarding process from there, which will include those hands-on trainings with our behaviorists and also um, the, the virtual training and giving them access to that and having a continuous support system for, for the uh, IT portion of the, of the signing on. Well, great idea. So, and I, I, I very much like the idea that you're looking at that population, older people. As, as volunteers, but that reminds me, somebody, people keep asking me this, why don't they use uh, teenagers, like high school kids? And I, I don't know an answer to that, but, but evidently there's quite a bit of interest, or at least that's what appears to me, because this question has come up several times. Would, would it be possible for the, uh, uh, for a, a high school, um, a young person to, to, uh, potentially become a volunteer? That's absolutely um, something that we're going to be working on as an, an, as an initiative with the volunteer, um, with the new community, community engagement coordinators. 
Um, coming from the not-for-profit world, I know how important it is to work with the high schoolers to kind of introduce them to some career paths that maybe they didn't think was an were an opportunity. So we are absolutely going to work on that. Um, we, we will have to work with legal and with our risk management team um, because of the interaction with, with animals. Um, but I think we can come up with some enrichment opportunities for high schoolers. So that'll be in our initiative for next year. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, I do have them written down. Uh, let's see. Uh, this, my second question, <laughs> I'm stretching the truth a little bit here because that was probably four or five. But the, the second topic, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, call it, um, I, I, I understand that... Um, Facilities has been out, uh, DMD Facilities has been out, and really, really grateful to them for doing an assessment and walkthrough with yourself and, and the, 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 the other people who work out there at, at both east side and west side. And they came up with a sort of a, a laundry list of things that they want to accomplish. And again, I'm, I think that's great. And I, we want to support them in that effort any way we can as a council. Um, but uh, part of that, of course, is, uh, is deep cleaning and intensive pest control. Uh, this is something that every shelter, every kennel anywhere is going to have this issue. But in order for that to really be sustainable, to sustain uh, or maintain rather that treatment, the dry dog food storage must um, must be addressed. There's just no other way. Now, I put some time into this and I found that there are products that are on the market that are commonly used in other shelters, other kennels. And I'm wondering if um, you would be interested in a demonstration of how those work and um, how uh, you know, how, how easy they are to work with. Would you be interested in that, Director? Absolutely, Councillor Gibson. We're always open to recommendations and, and identifying best practices in the shelter world to improve our shelters. So absolutely, we're, we're always looking to improve in those Great. areas. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, my office will be in touch with your office and, and we'll work that out, okay? Wonderful, thank you, thank you President Borrego and, and Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Director. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Thank you for being concerned about our, our fur babies. Um, so with that, um, we are going to move on. I'm talking to myself. Sorry about that, counselors. Um, I was saying thank you, Counselor Gibson, for being concerned about our fur babies. Um, it's really important. And uh, with that, you know, we encourage people to definitely reach out to Miss Ortega. Um, there are a lot of animals up for adoption, especially during COVID. People have unfortunately given up their pets a lot of times and instances where they couldn't afford it. So if um, you're so inclined, this is a good time to reach out to the animal shelter. Um, Thank with that, you, Madam President. We're gonna move on to Councilor Gibson under our journal, Councilor Gibson. I move approval of the September 8th journal. Thank you, Councilor Gibson. You have a second from Councilor Senna. Are there any questions, Councilors? If not, Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Gibson? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Mute myself, yes. Thank you. 9 0. Thank you, Councilors. That passes on a 9 to 0 vote. We are going to move on. Um, since we have quite a few things on our agenda this evening. Um, are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Councilor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. Um, 
I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing R202 and placing it on the October 4th council agenda. R202 is approving the petition of the regents of the University of New Mexico by and through Lobo, Lobo Development Corporation and the city of Albuquerque for formation of the South Campus Tax Increment Development District. Thank you, Councillor. You have a second from Councillor Davis. Um, and I just remind the councillors that we need two thirds of the councillors present to vote on this in order for it to pass. Um, councillors, do you have any questions before we move on to the vote? I don't see any questions. Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. 8-0. Thank you, councillors. That passes on an 8-0 vote. Councillor Gibson. I move approval of the letter of introduction. Thank you, councillor. I'll second that. Any questions, councillors? I don't see any questions. Ms. Ortega. Okay. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yeah. Councillor Borrego. Yes. 8 0. Thank you, councillors. That passes on an 8 0 vote. We will move on to number eight, reports of committees. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, September 15th, and reports out the following items. In the matter of R-182, that it do pass as amended. In the matter of R-191, that it do pass and be acted on at the meeting at which it is in, in reported. I make a motion to accept the committee reports. Thank you, second. councilors. Do I have a second? Councilor Gibson, thank you for that second. We need a vote on this, Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. No. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. No. Councilor Senna. Yeah. Councilor Borrego. No. Motion passes 6 3. Thank you, councillors. That motion passes on a 6 3 vote. We will move on to deferrals and withdrawals. Councillors, do you have any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? And I would move to Councillor Davis and Councillor Benton and 050. Um, Councillor Bassan, you have your hand up before we do that. No, Madam President, I would like to add in a deferral at the right time. Okay, thank you, councillor. So, Councillor Davis or Councillor Benton, 050? Madam President, on 050, I would move a deferral until October 18. Okay, we have a motion for a deferral. It looks like you have a second from Councillor Benton. Is that a second, Councillor Benton? Yes. Thank you. So we have, uh, we need a vote on this particular item, Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero on the deferral. Thank you, councillors. We have a nine zero. And I will go back to Councillor Bassan because I think she had another item that she may want to defer. Yes, thank you, Madam President. I would like to make a motion to defer 069 until October 4th. This is the mobile speed enforcement ordinance. Okay, um, hang on, Councillor. I just need a point of order on this. Thank you for bearing with me, Councillor. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second from Councillor Benton, it appears. So we have a motion and a second. And Councillor Pena, did you have a question? Oh, okay, I saw your hand go up. Um, 
So we will move on to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero on the deferral of 069 to October 4th. Thank you, councilors. We will move on to our consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? And just let me just read this really quick, councilors, before we go to that specific item. For individuals on tonight's consent agenda who are being appointed to serve on a board or commission and who may be watching from home, we want to thank you for your willingness to serve. So, um, Councilor Gibson. Uh, thank you. I will move approval of the consent agenda. Thank you, Councilor. I'll second that. And Councilor Bassan looks like she also seconded that. So with that, we will move on to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 9-0 on consent. Thank you, Councilors. That consent agenda passes on a 9-0 vote. We will move on to item number 11, which are announcements. Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. There will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission meeting on Thursday, September 23rd at 3 p.m. via Zoom. And there will be a Finance and Government Operations Committee meeting on Monday, September 27th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you, Councilor Basson, for those announcements. Councilor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. There will be a Public Safety Committee meeting on Tuesday, September 28th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you, Councilors. With that, um, it's about five minutes till five. We are moving on to our public hearings. Our first public hearing this evening is AC 21-9, Nob Hill Neighborhood Association appeals the zoning hearing examiner's decision. I will move to Mr. Melendres to explain. Thank you, Madam President and Councilors. This is the third time that this matter has been before you. Um, the first time was for you to consider sort of narrowly whether to accept or reject the recommendation of your land use hearing officer. In this particular case, the zoning hearing examiner approved a variance that would allow a six foot fence on the front and street side yard of a property at Richmond and Silver Avenue that was appealed by the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association. The city council um, at its first hearing declined to accept the recommendation of the land use hearing officer in favor of holding a full hearing. You had that full hearing at your last meeting at that time, the council voted to continue this matter um, for further discussion today. One of the issues that came up at the last meeting um, related to uh, future IDO um, amendments that might be considered that could address um, wall height issues, perhaps even in transitional zones. Um, discuss that with planning staff and planning staff is prepared to look at that more closely as part of the next annual IDO update. Um, but at this time before you, you are considering again, only whether or not to affirm the zoning hearing examiner or to overturn the zoning hearing examiner and deny the variance. The standard that you're applying is whether or not the zoning hearing examiner and its decision acted fraudulently, arbitrarily or capriciously, or the decision was not supported by the evidence. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Melendres. We have a couple of counselors that have questions, beginning with Councillor Davis, Councillor Harris, and then Councillor Benton. Councillor uh, Davis. Madam President, I will defer to the president, but I think Councillor Harris um, needs to make some notes before we proceed, and then I, I would like to come back and, and maybe make a motion to move this along. Councillor Harris. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Melendres said if I'm going to participate in this uh, hearing, I needed to uh, review the video of the prior uh, hearing before the council and I have and I just I don't know if anyone um, if there's been other movement among other counselors to do anything different than a 4-4 vote I just want to say it's probably because of my training as an attorney and having been involved in several appeals that um, I, I think this is kind of an easy case for me because of the uh, 
abuse of discretion standard. I think there is evidence uh, to support um, what the land use hearing officer did. And I think for me, that's the beginning and the end of my analysis. So um, I, I'm going to vote to affirm the appeal. I don't know if anyone else wants to do anything else. So in particular, Councillor Benton on the video that, that I watched, um, he was talking policy and this is an appeal. Um, and, and, and for me, the only issue is whether or not um, the land use hearing officer acted in a capricious manner or fraudulently or um, was an abuse of discretion. Um, these appeals, they tend to get kind of political in that you have neighborhoods. And uh, I think the only reason why this wasn't a 9-0 vote was because we have city councilors who are uh, protective of their zoning authority and their legislation. People didn't like the fact that these people um, built it without a permit. And I think the remedy for that is issue them a fine. If they haven't been fined already, they probably should be. But uh, that um, is something different than whether or not. And, and by the way, if this were what a lawyer would call a de novo proceeding, where we were, we were just kind of looking at it with fresh eyes and just doing what we want to do, I might not vote for this. I might vote uh, with uh, the four counselors who wanted to uh, reject the appeal because I don't like the fact that they went and they built it without a permit. And I may or may not agree about whether or not it's really a unique property or whether or not circumstances have changed and, and all those factors that, uh, that they um, addressed um, because I'm, I very well may, may come to a different conclusion, but I view our role as solely seeing whether or not there was an abuse of discretion. I don't think there was. There was evidence. I think it was balanced evidence, but there was evidence to support the decision. So I'm going to vote to affirm the appeal if anyone, if that affects anyone else's uh, decision. I just want to let you know. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Um, I will go to Councillor Benton and then Councillor Davis. I, th I think uh, Councillor Davis was in front of me, Madam President. I, I thought he asked to wait Am I okay. correct, Councilor uh, Davis? President, I, I was simply waiting on Councilor Harris to be able to make his declaration that was required in order for him to participate in today's uh, hearing. Okay, so, then, uh, then go ahead. Uh, and thank you, uh, Councilor Ben. Uh, you may have a different one, but Madam President, I'd like to make a motion, um, and I may ask Mr. Melendrez just to be sure that I get the language right here, uh, but I'm going to make a motion that we accept the Lujo's recommendations and findings in part and reject them in part. We discussed this option at our last meeting, and I think there's evidence in the record to do both. I would accept the, the recommendation um, to leave the fence on the Silver Avenue side, the one where it was demonstrated there was some commercial activity, uh, but reject, in other words, to reject the fence on the residential portion of uh, Richmond so that it's consistent uh, with the other residential portions. I think that's a good compromise. It addresses the concern. And I didn't see any evidence in the record that the commercial activity disrupted the, the residential facing portion of the property. And so that will be my motion if there's a second. Mr. Melendres, did you want to comment? Uh, Madam President, no, I think we'd wait and hear if there's a second for that motion. And I'd be happy to answer questions if there are. I second that motion. Right, we have a, a second from Councillor Jones. Um, so I am going to go, Councillor Davis, because Councillor uh, Benton has had his hand up. So I'm going to just go to Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so I want to ask uh, Mr. Melendrez, based on his um, his summary of the Lujo findings. Um, so uh, the special circumstance that is justifying this variance is the uh, is that of heavy truck traffic that uniquely benefits the sub uh, 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 excuse me uni uniquely burdens the subject property um, and um, the the staff write-up goes on to say although appellants claim the site's residential character is not unique it's the unique impacts on this particular residential property that justify the variance. This is what I was talking about before, and, and, and maybe uh, Councilor Harris misunderstood what I was saying, but what I was talking about was that um, there are numerous, or several at least, uh, residential uses 
uh, on similar properties that face uh, Silver Avenue. Uh, and then there are other non-residential uses uh, as is typical of this uh, kind of evolving area of Knob Hill. Um, and that's where I, I got stuck because uh, is this a specific, you know, this truck traffic and so forth, why is it that it affects this one property uniquely as opposed to any other residential use, both, you know, both residential and commercial uses are allowed within the, the zoning. Um, why wouldn't this, why would this, this decision, you know, be just based on this one individual's property? And I guess that, that's my, my immediate question. I, I do have a follow up. Madam President, Councilor Benton, the evidence in this particular case suggests that there is a on-street parking and loading space immediately adjacent to this property. Um, and its impacts are apparently unique to this particular site because as a matter of convenience or perhaps location to businesses that are receiving deliveries, um, that particular site is apparently favored for trucks idling um, and deliveries being made from that particular spot. So that's the evidence that suggests that this particular site is burdened uniquely. Yeah, and I guess that's that's part of my question is like, and when I talk about policy, it being a policy question or potentially uh, 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 some sort of administrative uh, fix or something like that of moving this truck loading zone away from the property, as opposed to the, the appellants are saying, well, look, uh, we're gonna start allowing anyone, I suppose, with, with similar complaints to put up fences along a streetscape that, you know, what, whatever reason, I think the, the vision of, of the appellants is that, that you don't start putting up fences along a, an important street like Silver that's one block off of Central. But um, uh, the other question I had, Mr. Melendres, is could this be revocable to this particular property owner? In other words, when the, is there any way to do that where it would go back to not, you know, removal of offense or, or is there any remedy once this is put in place, it, then I guess the fence would be allowed and others could might or might not uh, apply for similar uh, relief. Madam President, Councilor Benton, unlike hard zoning, a variance request can come with conditions. Um, that's part of what's permitted within the variance test, which essentially suggests that the variance should only be approved to the greatest extent, ne extent necessary to mitigate the alleged adverse and unique impact. However, one of the restrictions as a matter of law on conditions on any zoning approval is that it cannot be conditioned to any particular individual or owner of the property. Right, but, but, but I mean, if, if, uh, if this uh, decision were to stand, there's a unique uh, remedy being applied to the property that would run with the property is what you're telling me, right? Uh, Madam President, correct. And, and so that, that exception, special exception, will run with the property no matter who receives it. Let's say somebody decides to buy that property in the future and use it for commercial purposes and no longer for residential purposes. They're still allowed to keep this because, uh, and this, this was the concern I raised last time, is that a use within a zone is nothing but one of many, in this case, one of, one of many uses that's allowed within the zone or several at least. And so we're, we're singling out that use, which is the residential use in a mixed, uh, mixed use zone uh, and, and saying that, that that's the, the justification. And, and then it will run, run, run with the property, whether or not it's a residential use in the future. And that's what that, that you know, that that's really what has puzzled me about this, not through 
any defense of the IDO or anything like that or territorial interest of my own. Just just that, that we come up with something that that uh, if we're going to do this sort of thing and do this sort of special exception, we should understand the, the uh, long term impacts of it. So, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Benton. We're going to move back to Councillor Harris and then Councillor Basson and then Councillor Gibson. Councillor Harris. I'm here. Uh, sorry about that. Um, in terms of the motion, uh, one of the things that the uh, residents testified about is having uh, homeless people on their front porch and things like that. So, um, yeah, uh, that's not the only thing that they were concerned about. Uh, so, uh, in terms of taking the fence down on one street, I don't think it really solves the problem that the neighborhood has. And secondly, it it doesn't also it, also doesn't solve the problem that the resident had. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Councillor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, as with our, our last meeting, I, I know that it's been stated already, but I really think that it's very important that we clarify again that we are supposed to be deciding if the LUHO acted fraudulently, capriciously, or arbitrarily. And from everything I've read more than once in this appeal, everything we've been briefed on. I do not think that that has happened. And I do not think that we need to be basing our decision off of what could happen in the future or how to find a compromise for, for making it work better one way or the other. It's truly that. And for that reason, I will only be able to support upholding the LUHO's findings and um, denying the appeal. Thank you, Councillor Basson, Councillor Gibson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I tend to agree with Councillor Bassan on this. Um, we, we've had uh, opinions from both uh, the ZHE as well as LUHO on this. Um, very few other properties that are uh, comparable to this particular resident residents uh, that uh, are affected this way. Um, so I, 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 I believe that I would have to vote along the same lines as, as uh, described by Councillor Bassan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. I don't see any other councillors that are waiting to speak. So with that, we will move on to our vote, Ms. Ortega. And remember, councillors, we are um, voting only on the merits of what was in the record. And we will um, either grant the appeal, deny the appeal, or, the, or let's say grant the appeal and adopt findings at our next meeting. Ma Madam President, if I may, um, I think, Councillor, just to clarify, I think Councillor uh, Davis's motion was complete with respect to what he was proposing. And the motion, just to restate, um, is that you would accept the LUHO recommendation and findings, except that you would limit the variance only to the silver frontage. So that's the motion that Councillor Davis made, and that's what you're voting on specifically. Okay, so we will go back to that then. Um, with that, we will move to Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. No. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. No. Councillor Harris. No. Councillor Jones. No. Councillor Pena. No. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. No. That motion, motion fails on a four or five vote. Okay, councillors. So then we are looking for another motion. Uh, Councillor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. I do want to take a moment just to also say that I do agree that perhaps whoever built this fence without a permit, we should look into that with planning and code enforcement, which I know we did discuss at the last meeting as well. But I would like to make a motion to deny the appeal and adopt the LUHO findings and recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. I'll second that motion. With that, we will move to our vote. Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. 
Yes. Councilor Davis. No. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Motion passes on an 8-1 vote. And Madam President. I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Harris, go ahead. Yes, I, I wanna say that um, I actually agree with a lot of uh, Councilor Benton's, what I viewed as policy arguments, but I just don't think that's what this proceeding is. So councilors at our next meeting, we will adopt findings, right? No? Can, Madam President, clarify? absolutely. Sure, Madam President. So again, the motion that was made was to um, adopt the LUHO recommendation and findings. So we'll be issuing a notice of decision from our office that incorporates those findings as your final decision. You'll ne not need to take any further action on this matter. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Melendris. So with that, counselors, we will move on to item number B, which is AC 2111. This is Dolores Morales, agent for Janet Fuentes, appeals the zoning hearing examiner's decision. And I will move to Mr. Melendris to explain. Thank you, Madam President, counselors. AC 2111 also deals with the variance request for fence height. This particular site is located at Gibson in Eden Southeast. It's a vacant parcel of about a third of an acre. The uh, property owner is requesting a six foot high wrought iron fence to be constructed around the perimeter of the property, effectively the back of the sidewalk, be, uh, at both the front and street side yard um, property lines. The maximum fence height at that location is only three feet. The zoning hearing examiner denied the variance request um, the justification that was made for the variance was that there is crime and vandalism in the area, but similar to past requests that have come before you, um, that issue to the extent that it exists within the community is not unique to any particular property um, and is something that is borne by properties, other properties within the vicinity as well, the burdens of that. Um, and of course, with the variance, the claimed hardship needs to be unique to the, the property um, as compared to its um, the other properties within the vicinity. So the zoning hearing examiner found that that justification of crime was not unique to the property, denied the variance. Um, the property owners appealed that decision to the land use hearing officer. Land use hearing officer is recommending that the zoning hearing examiner be affirmed and that the variance request be denied. The land use hearing officer pointed out that even if this variance is denied, the property owner could build the exact fence that they're requesting if it was sit, set back from the property line merely five feet. So again, it's a, about a third of an acre parcel. Uh, it, should, it appears that it probably could accommodate you know, that minimum setback of five feet. And so that would be a permit by right for the property owner to do even without a variance, just set it back five feet. Dr. Melendez, just a clarification. In order for them to do that, would we have to adopt different findings? Madam President, no. Um, it would be a completely separate proceeding than what's before you. So you would dispose of this by deciding whether to affirm or deny the ZAG. And then at any time in the future, they could go into the planning department and pull a permit for that fence five feet back from the property line. Thank you, Mr. Melendres. I will make a motion that we accept the LUHO recommendations and findings. I have a second with Councilor Basson. Is there any other discussion, Councilors? Councilor Benton? Thank you, Madam President. Um, in light of the last <laughs> discussion, this is so similar in some ways, you know. Um, this, however, is a vacant site, as I, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Mr. Melendez, this is a vacant uh, property. We have a lot of issues uh, currently in the city. And again, I, I'm, I may be straying into policy question, but we have a lot of uh, uh, empty lots in the city and, and specifically in District 2 where there's a pretty large uh, homeless um, population of unhoused neighbors who go onto these private sites and, um, and camp. Then subsequently, the property owner is cited for trash and other uh, violations in the property and they're left with no other option but, but 
to a fence office site. Um, and, and so understanding that and also understanding that um, camping on the sidewalk is illegal, for instance. Uh, once you're off the sidewalk in that five foot setback zone, um, again, uh, there could be activity that goes on in that five foot zone that may or may not be beneficial to the community, but it's still on private property. So I do think this raises some pretty uh, difficult questions. Just wanted to point that out, that that's, that's something that's uh, regularly uh, confronting property owners who have undeveloped property. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I see major differences between this one and the last one, uh, not least of which has already been mentioned that it is empty, an empty lot uh, right now. Uh, there are no fences that I can recall that are adjacent to it, unlike the first one. Um, and they're, they're uh, uh, not, on a, the, not in the same type of neighborhood um, as, as the uh, prior uh, case that we looked at. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really comfortable at this point just um, making the motion to accept LUHO recommendations and findings. So that Madam, would be my motion. Yes, Councilor Gibson, uh, I've already made that motion. Oh, sorry. And it's already been seconded. I apologize. Thank you. Carry on. Um, I also see Mr. Aranda uh, from the, no, no? Oh, okay, it's closed. I just thought I'd mention that he's on the line, so. Um, okay, counselors, if there are no other questions, then I guess we can move on to Councilor Basson. Sorry, Madam President. Some, when I pull this up on maps, it looks like there's property there. Is it vacant? It doesn't change my opinion about it, this appeal, but I see a building Mr. on it. Uh, Madam, Madam President, Councilor uh, Basson, first a quick caution. Um, your other counselors don't have in front of you whatever you're looking at that's outside of the record. Um, you should be limiting your decision to what is in the paper record that's in the packet. Um, secondly, that's uh, the information that was presented. Um, and so uh, whether or not I guess the property is vacant, um, the question still remains whether or not um, the justification of crime that exists generally in the area is a unique hardship with, with respect to this particular property. Um, the use of the property is that they want to sell cars from it. And so it would still remain, you know, largely a, a surface area with uh, available for cars to be displayed. And so it doesn't change the test that you're looking to apply to this property. Thank you. Fair enough, Mr. Melendrez. It would not have changed my opinion anyway. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Melendrez, for that word of caution. Um, we will move on to the vote. I don't see any other questions. Ms. Ortega. Councillor Basson. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Sorry, yes. Thank you. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero. Thank you, counselors. And Mr. Melendrez, I guess it'd be okay to say that this gentleman can talk with zoning to talk about maybe possibly moving that fence five feet back. Madam President, counselors, absolutely. That was even the land use hearing officer's recommendation that they have that conversation. Thank you. All right, counselors, uh, we will move on to item number 13, which are approvals. EC 426, Mayor's recommendation to award to Guidehouse Incorporated for ARPA Fund Management Services. I move a due pass. I have a second from Councillor Senna. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions, so Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Gibson? Yes. 
Councillor Harris. Councillor yes. Harris. Thank you. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero. Did say yes. Thank you. Nine zero. I'm I'm for some reason I'm reverber reverberating a little bit over here, so I'm having to mute myself. Um, so we will move on to item number 14, final actions. We will start with item B, Councillor Davis, Councillor Senna, Councillor Pena, Councillor Benton, 067, amending section 7-2-1-2 of the transit system ordinance to provide for a zero fare pilot project and creating a new section 7-2-1-3. Um, Councillor Senna, probably. Thank you, Madam President. I will make that motion uh, to move a due pass on the ordinance that you just recited. Thank you, Councillor Senna. It looks like you have a second from Councillor Benton. Um, and I, I guess we have several amendments in our packets. Um, Madam President, if I may. Go ahead. Thank you. I believe there's a presentation from the transit department regarding the security plan, um, but I do have an amendment as well, which I will propose after the presentation. Thank you, Councillor Senna. Councillor mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Senna, Madam President and members of the council, um, our security department from municipal development has put together a PowerPoint presentation related to the security plan. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, I will have uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, go to the plan with you all. Go ahead, Mr. Royal. Madam President, uh, Mr. Rogers will go to the plan for you. Thank you. Madam President and Councilors, Paul Rogers from DMB representing security. I had a short uh, presentation for you all as a summary of the security role for the uh, transit um, ordinance amendment. Uh, firstly, I'd like to point out that we're here to provide safety for all riders, employees, and all of the public. So certainly our, our focus is not on any one group, it's to have a safe environment in total. Next slide, please. Our current staffing allows for 47 positions. Of those, 41 are security officers, four are security supervisors, they are first line supervisors, and two are security superintendents or managers. Uh, we have 31 officers on shift at this time, five are currently in training, and we have five vacancies. Transit has secured funding for an additional 10 security officers for this fiscal year. And those positions are being created by human resources as we speak. Next slide, please. When we speak about security for the transit system, where we have a threefold approach. Uh, we have officers that are assigned to the Alvarado Transit Center in first and central, and that is a two officer team patrolling the facility on foot. They do so 24 seven, so they are always available and they're always busy. The second prong would be a mobile field unit, and that is an officer in a vehicle. Uh, they can be dispatched to calls for service from APD, from AFR, from transit dispatch, or our own internal dispatch, should we be made aware of something that needs immediate response. The uh, mobile field units also carry first aid equipment with uh, automatic defibrillators and uh, Narcan as well. So they are uh, routinely responding to uh, calls for service and need medical needs along uh, Central Avenue. That is their focus. The third prong is the bus security teams where we have two officers, they work in pairs and they're traveling random routes within the Central Corridor. They do change buses frequently to maximize our deterrence and presence on the buses. 
when I talk about the central corridor, I'm talking about uh, central specifically from UNSER or the central and UNSER transit facility, eastbound on central to tramway, which is the terminus, the east terminus of that route. There are three routes along that, along Central Avenue. And from the heat maps that we've received from APD talking about bus stop calls for service and bus stop activity, uh, that is far and above the focus of our attention. That's where we have the majority of calls. I'd also, uh, oh, next slide, please. So as a sampling of our incidents in the first six months of this year, the statistics on the left may be a little light as we are uh, searching through our records analog, and we are hoping to automate that as much as we can in the future. The, important, uh, the importance of those numbers is we have a total of 135 transit-related incidents that our guys responded to, our guys and gals. The incidents on the buses were 32, so 23.7%, which is good news. Of those transit-related incidents, the majority are happening at stops or facilities, and a, and a small percentage is occurring on the buses. Uh, of those, seven calls or 5% involved weapons. Uh, again, another good statistic, the lower the, the better. Uh, no firearms in these instances. In most instances, they were knives or other projectiles like rocks. In the right column, you'll see the major um, calls that were responded to. And you, of note is the uh, volume of disorderly conduct. That is by far the most frequent call. And frequently, uh, especially lately, the last three months, it's uh, fair to comply with the health order, most specifically not wearing a face mask or a mask while on public transportation. Of all those calls, we requested APD to respond 24 on 24 occasions and arrests were made on in three incidents. I'd like to point out that we, we are planning to meet with uh, transit and have already stepped up our collaboration with transit. We don't uh, live in a static environment. It's very dynamic. So we are comparing notes frequently to determine if our response plan at this time is appropriate or if it needs to be modified as we move forward. Next slide, please. And the last slide shows that uh, it's been, been provided to us from APD off of their CAD dispatching, and it's specific to bus stop calls for service. So you can see the yellow turning to red. Uh, that's where the calls are very high. So I'd like to point out a couple of those areas. So the uh, more southerly red dot is first and central. That's to be expected between uh, the uh, ATC traffic in that area and the bus stops. That's a very high volume area. To the north of that is a bus stop at 4th and I-40 that's adjacent to Coronado. Uh, again, expected. I don't know that it's directly related to the bus stop. I believe it's uh, it, it, for the sake of these statistics, it's related to the bus stop. However, I think a lot of that is flow over from Coronado. Uh, along that central corridor, we have a couple of yellow dots that are starting to emerge slightly in orange, and that's the area of Pennsylvania and Central and Washington and Central, and then some of the more larger yellow spots, which is low activity, but it's on our radar, is Wyoming and Central and San Pedro and Central. So certainly, there's no surprises here. Uh, those hot spots are those areas where the officers are changing buses, again, to increase that deterrence and maximize our presence. Uh, you can see other dots sporadically spread throughout the city. And uh, some of those locations are being handled by security facility mobiles, most, uh, most notably a university We've had some, uh, some problems at, in that area on university, 
So we've got mobiles checking that area periodically throughout the day. And uh, that completes my presentation. I stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Any questions? Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, my question is, to, you know, I, I understand and, and thank you for the presentation and overview uh, in terms of security, but I want to note that of the 135 incidents from that six month period, how many riders would you say that you've encountered within that six month period? Madam that's, that's questions for, for Director Holcomb. Uh, Madam President, Councillor Senna, I can get you the totals. I don't have the ridership totals in front of me, but I can certainly get those to you by tomorrow morning. Okay, I just want to relate to say that, you know, of 135 incidents that did occur, um, the 23.7% of the incidents occurring on buses out of probably fair enough to say thousands upon thousands of riders that did utilize the bus between that period, um, there was 135 incidents of those thousands that did ride the bus is I guess what I'm relating to. That's correct, now, Madam President, Councillor Senna. Uh, we average hundreds of thousands of passengers a month, and and that's you're absolutely right. The percentage is relatively low. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Senna. Councillor Benton. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Paul Rogers, and and uh, appreciated the the briefing uh, for that was given uh, personally to the councillors, uh, and. I think you're really looking at this thoroughly and looking forward to having some more officers available. I, I have one question, which is that with regard to the exact statistics that uh, the counselor uh, Santa was just asking about. So those incidents, um, are they, how are those incidents reported? Is this by the general public or is this by security documentation of the incidents, um, uh, who's doing that reporting? Madam President and Councillor Bent Benton, it, it's kind of a, a combination of all of those. We get the calls in from uh, APD, AFR, Transit, and some proactively uh, on view, and they are documented in either incident reports or daily uh, activity reports, depending on their severity and the action that we take. And then thirdly, as a manner to check what we have, we're collaborating with transit and their dispatch records. Okay, so it's mostly, it's mostly internal uh, reporting as opposed to public reporting. Madam President, Councilor Benson, that's correct. Benton, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I would just, you know, I mean, from my experience, uh, sometimes when when things uh, might get, uh, you know, some upheaval occurs on the bus, a lot of the writers just, you know, they're they're going to mind their own business. They're they're not reporting uh, necessarily. So I take these these statistics with a grain of salt. But I, I do appreciate your thinking about where we need to go and. Uh, and understanding that we've got more uh, officers in the pipeline. And uh, and just, you know, uh, to be absolutely clear, because I guess some there's some narrative out there that I'm holding up, that I personally am holding up this legislation, where I, which I'm actually a co-sponsor of, uh, because of security. It wasn't so much that, just wanting to get exactly the kind of presentation that, that you were able to give us and to understand. Uh, how it works, especially since uh, uh, in the recent past, since uh, transit security specifically was moved into uh, into metro security and DMD. So thank you. Madam President, Councillor Benton, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Um, I don't see any other questions in the queue, so I will go back to the sponsors to close. Thank you, Madam President. I'm, I'm actually going to move my amendment um, and I believe, Councillor, uh, we will call that floor amendment number one. 
Thank you. Um, this one's a fairly easy one. So I move council uh, floor amendment number one, which is on page one, line 12, delete October 1st, 2021, and insert in lieu thereof January 1st of 2022. Um, an explanation for this is to it allows some time, and again, this is only a pilot program uh, for the year, to allow transit to train drivers. Uh, of the new bus boarding procedures, uh, helping reimburse those that have purchased um, passes in the past as well as providing some media outreach to allow um, our constituents know that we are providing zero fares for the calendar year. Um, I think that this is something that we've discussed uh, and I'm grateful to the other counselors. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get to talk to all of you in regarding this uh, to avoid quorum issues, but I know that this is something that we've been all striving for and hopefully that through the calendar year starting in January 1st that we can really make this happen. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Davis. I was just offering a second for the amendment, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Any questions on the amendment? If not, Ms. Ortega. Councillor Basson. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Eight zero on amendment number one. Thank you, Councillor. Do you have any other amendments? Councillor Senna. I, I think we only have that one, right? That's what I have. That's right. Okay. So we will go back to the original bill, Councillor Senna. Thank you so much. And I know I'll give time certainly to my co-sponsors, especially um, the counselors that have been working towards this for, for a very long time. Um, I know that we've had this discussion previously uh, at the other council meeting where this bill was brought up, uh, but we all know and have heard from constituents, especially through public comments of just how much this has impacted their lives. Um, for me, seeing that we as taxpayers have paid for the infrastructure and for the buses, um, that this makes sense in providing this. I know that this is a pilot program, so we will see um, the fluctuation uh, of how successful this program will be, but it's good as a first start. Um, and we'll, we'll take it with the 12 months to see how our ridership um, increases um, and how it supports our working families, especially uh, since we do know that most of our riders are 70% uh, or below 150% the, the federal poverty level. Um, and most of them are utilizing it to go to work, school, grocery shopping and medical appointments. So um, with that, I'll turn it to my co-sponsors um, for some comments, but I urge your support. Thank you, Councillor Senna, Councillor Pena, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. I just want to say that, you know, I was happy at the encouragement of Councillor Senna, and I know other councillors have been really pushing for this um, for some time now, and I am putting it in the budget this year. I think it's just time it gets done, and, and I uh, thank Councillor Senna for her advocacy on this. Thank you, Councillor Pena, Councillor Davis, Councillor Benton. Councillor Benton. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Yeah, I just want to thank my co-sponsors, but also wanted to thank the advocates, you know, people who have served on the Transit Advisory Board, which has always been pretty solidly in favor of, of this initiative. Uh, uh, groups like uh, Together for Brothers, who, you know, three years ago, four years ago, we, we heard from them and, and, and started a lot of this discussion at that time. And uh, so it's really really nice to see it coming to fruition. I think it is wise that we're starting on, on January 1st because I think uh, uh, a lot of good reasons for that. You know, data collection uh, and the various reasons uh, Councilor Senate described, but, but uh, thanks to the co-sponsors. Thanks for all the advocates. Councilor Davis. 
Thank you, Madam President. And, and echo again, not just to the, the counselors and our co-sponsors, but our staff who've worked on this for two years now, uh, and including the folks in transit in the mayor's office. Um, we had to convince a lot of people and we had to do our homework and get the data right, get the information right, and figure out how to do this. Uh, this was a project that started from our advisory board, as Councilor Benton said, from the community. Uh, I know Sean Ferran in my office worked with two transit directors um, and their staffs to, to work through the data. Um, and uh, just that was just on our side, not to mention all the advocate work from Councilor Senna and Pena and, and uh, Benton. And uh, it really did go a long way to getting this done. Um, but I will say at the end of the day, uh, folks will have confidence now that this is happening and the administration supports it and feels comfortable with it. Let me say, um, we saw Ms. Althea May earlier uh, speaking very uh, passionately about this from, from home. Uh, and let me tell you counselors, um, this is something people uh, support. As some of you saw on Twitter, um, Ms. May uh, awakened my home last week uh, at after our city council meeting, she took the bus at 7.30 in the morning with a big sign to say thank you for us trying this. Um, I've never had a constituent uh, spend time to come to my house to send a thank you protest or a thank you something. I don't know what it was. Um, this is something people really do care about and it will make a difference. And so I appreciate and say thank you to everybody who worked on this, starting with the folks in the community that carried this forward. Thank you, counselors, all of you. And thanks everyone for the work that you've done. I have to say in the beginning, I was not sure how I was going to vote on this, but with all of the advocacy and input from the public um, and the staff, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure about my decision this evening. Um, and also hearing from my constituents, I, I do appreciate those e emails and we do read them just so you all know. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to um, Ms. Ortega on the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Absolutely, yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Councilor Harris. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 8-0 on 067 as amended. Thank you, counselors. We will move on to item number C which is sponsored by Councillor Davis, Councillor Senna, Councillor Pena, Councillor Benton, R173, amending resolution 21-148, establishing one-year objectives for the city of Albuquerque in fiscal year 2022 to include zero fare transit pilot objective to meet five-year goals. So with that, um, I'm not sure who's presenting this. I will take that on. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I will move a due pass. Thank you, Councillor. You have a second from Councillor Davis. I believe that's a second. Um, are there any questions from Councillors? Um, Madam President, I will also have to move an amendment so that this correlates with the ordinance that we just passed uh, to also amend the language here Thank you, Councillor. I'll second your amendment and we will call that floor amendment number one. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. As you can see on your screen, it's just changing those dates um, to correlate with our calendar years. Any questions, Councillors? I don't see any questions, Councillors. So with that, we will move to a vote on floor amendment number one. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Councilor Harris. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Thank you. Eight zero on Amendment One. Thank you, Councilors. That passes that amendment. Uh, Councilor Senna, do you want to go back to the original bill? Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I will close on the resolution as amended. Um, I urge your support. Thank you, Councillor. With that, we will move on to the vote. Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. 
Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 80 on R173 as amended. Thank you, councilors. That's item C and that passes on an 8-0 vote. We will now move on to item D. Councilor Senna, Councilor Pena, Councilor Davis, R178. And um, other than my reading it, I'll go to the sponsor. Okay, thank you, Madam President. R178 is amending the city operating budget language to clarify the intent of the city council to implement a comprehensive zero fare pilot and move it to pass. Thank you, Councillor. You have a second from Councillor Davis. Are there any questions? Thank you, Madam President. I will also move the amendments to also change the implementation date um, as similar to the ordinance and the resolution that we previously passed. So this is floor amendment number one, um, yes. and you can see it on your page. Yes, thank you, Councillor. That is floor amendment number one. So we have a motion and I have a second from Councillor Davis. Thank you for that second, Councillor Davis. Um, any questions, councillors, on the amendment? I do not see any. Councillor um, Councilor Ortega. <laughs> Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councilor, thank you. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Eight zero on Amendment One. Thank you, Councillors. The uh, floor amend or the um, amendment passes on an eight zero vote. So we will go back to the original bill R one seventy eight. Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. So I. I believe that is the only amendment left. Um, so I, very similar to the other ordinance and the resolution has passed, this is just clarifying some budget language that I heard you support. Councilors, any questions? Okay, if not, we'll move to Ms. Ortega. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Councillor Harris. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Pena. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. R178 passes on a 7 0 vote as amended. Thank you, councillors. That passes on a 7 0 vote. Um, with that, we have deferred item 069. And counselors, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to item G, which I would like to move to withdraw at this time. Um, do I have a second? Thank you, Councillor Senna. Um, and counselors, I'm just gonna explain to you why I'm withdrawing this bill. Uh, we are combining item M10 and M11, and I will have a floor substitute for M11 but we have to advertise that. So we will bring that back to you both. We will bring the amended bill to you back uh, in October. So um, that is why I'm moving to withdraw M10. So we have a motion and a second. Any questions? Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Councilor Harris. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Eight zero on the withdrawal. Thank you, Councilors. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to item H, which is M11. And Councilors, after this, I think we'll take a break and then we'll come back um, and we will here item 071 which is the NARO. Um, so with that um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move a floor, su floor substitute for M11 and we will have to advertise that so um, do I have a second? Oh I need to move the original bill. M11. I'll move M11. I thought we moved it in our last meeting. Chris. 
again and move it again. Finish. Okay. So thank you, Councillor Basson, for that second. Any questions? I don't see any questions. Ms. Ortega on the original bill. No. Oh, now I move the floor sub. Thank you. So I will move the floor sub. Do I have a second? Second. Councillor Basson. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Point, point of order, Madam President. Yes. Uh, just for clarification, you mentioned that this floor substitute will require reposting. So once we do the floor sub, we'll be deferring this to a first future meeting. Is that correct? Yes, that's exactly correct. Thank you, Councillor Davis. So we will move to a vote on the floor yes. sub. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes to substitute. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Pena. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Seven zero on the floor sub. Thank you, councillors. So we, I will move a deferral on this floor sub. Thank you, Councillor Passan, for the second. Any questions? Ms. Ortega on the vote. Madam President, to clarify, this deferral is to October 4th? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Yes. Councillor Harris? Councillor Harris? Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? Councillor Pena? Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. Seven zero on the deferral of M11 as substituted to October 4th. Thank you, counselors. Uh, with that, we are going to come back to item F071. After a break, we will come back at 630.
Um, welcome back. This is a continuation of the 41st meeting of the 24th Council. And we are on item F. And actually, I had a request during our um, break, counselors. Uh, and this is item number 13 under approvals. I had a request to move item I up on the agenda and I had a discussion with Councillor Benton and he agreed. Um, we have some volunteer board members of the civilian oversight that would kind of like to jump off the call. So I am going to allow item R195 before item 071 counselors. Um, so I will move R195, directing that the Civilian Police Oversight Agency provide a training compliance report for members of the Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board with respect to the training requirements under the court approved settlement agreement with the United States Department of Justice and the CPOA ordinance. I move a due pass and I have a second from Councillor Senna. Thank you, Councillor Senna. So with that, I am going to move to the administration for that report. And that's in your iPads, counselors. Pardon me? I'm sorry, it's just the civilian oversight board members that are on the call. Chair uh, Erica Rivas. Um, would you like to announce who those are? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, on the call, we have uh, CPOA Board Chair Eric Olivas and the Vice Chair Chantal Galloway. Um, Mr. Olivas, if you wanted to just say a few words, and, and Ms. Galloway, if you wanted to follow him, that'll, that'll be great. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, President Borrego and members of the, the Council. Uh, I wanted to be here with you tonight to um, comment on this resolution and offer any potential um, help that I can as board chair. In the last several weeks after we became aware of some of the issues that, uh, that I think this resolution is asking about, we acted as quickly as we possibly could to uh, identify training deficiencies and outline where uh, issues were or where issues were in reporting. I believe it was on uh, Thursday or Friday afternoon of last week, we uh, were able to send a updated spreadsheet and a letter detailing uh, I think most, if not all, of the concerns that are raised in this resolution to Council President Borrego, uh, as well as the city administration, city attorney, DOJ, um, and the monitor. Um, I also asked uh, Mr. Sylvan and Mr. Moya to please forward that to all members of the council over the weekend, and I believe that has been done. So uh, I hope that you've all had an opportunity to review that, but I realize that was uh, very short notice for everyone. And um, I would encourage you to review that perhaps before you consider this resolution, given that I think um, in, in large part, it, it uh, probably makes this null and void given that uh, we've, through our, through our director, our legal, legal counsel, and through our, our board members, we've compiled all of this training information and, and updated everything to show where there are deficiencies in, in the few areas that there are. Um, and we've also identified in the letter why certain board members were um, identified as not having completed training when in fact they had. And as soon as we became aware of, of those issues, there have been some, some pretty serious reporting issues that have occurred where uh, members have completed their training, but they have not reported it. Or in some cases, for example, in my own case, the training was reported to uh, the executive director and it was not recorded in my training log that was submitted to the monitor and uh, potentially shared with, with you all at some point as well. So uh, we've corrected those issues as of now in the training records and uh, through working with our legal counsel and our agency director, we're working to um, streamline that process. We'll be using some of the city HR systems now. Uh, previously, it was a matter of sending an email, a board member sending an email to the director uh, and the director recording that uh, we're going to be using a city HR system now that should help streamline some of that. But I think also outlined in that letter, 
I think we have to work collaboratively with the council. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that actually, to work collaboratively on addressing some of this training. Uh, as, as council president Borrego alluded to, we are an all volunteer board. Uh, I believe we wanna be the most professional and most um, inclusive board in the city, but we need some help with that. And, and part of that comes down to training. We need good training, but I think there's also some areas in this training where we need to work together on identifying pieces of training that maybe aren't necessary and maybe other pieces of training that are necessary that aren't included. And I think that having those discussions with counselors uh, needs to happen sooner rather than later. And uh, I certainly pledge to, to uh, be reaching out to, to counselors in the next several weeks. And I'm sure that other board members will as well to, to begin those discussions. I know that we've had preliminary discussions with Mr. Aguilar and some of the parties uh, about potential changes, and we'll be having another meeting on that later this week. So, um, uh, you know, I really want to keep the, the discussion going with, with you all and um, make sure that, that we have a, a dialogue going so that we can identify these issues and, and move forward collaboratively to address them. So uh, again, I, I, you all should have that, that letter and those um, training requirements and the training deficiencies in your possession. And um, I'm you, happy Mr. to stand for any questions. Um, I will just tell you that um, I did read that report and, I, and all counselors did receive that report in advance of today's meeting. So, um, you know, and I just wanna thank you and Ms. Galloway and all of the other CPC members for the work that you all are doing because I know it's difficult and you are volunteers. Um, that report was very helpful to me. Um, I will just mention to you because it outlined um, some of the issues that you have, you know, with training and, you know, keeping members and that sort of thing. And I think that at the end of the report, when we talked about compliance, um, and, and that was part kind of in your last statement to your last paragraph of that report, it's, you know, it, it gave a, a really good conclusion, I thought, of, um, you know, whether or not we are in compliance, uh, which, I mean, I think there's some things that need to be done, but I think we're definitely moving in that direction. So um, I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to say, Mr. Olivas. If not, I will go to Ms. Galloway and then, and then we'll go to counselors for any questions they may have. Okay, Ms. Galloway. Eric, did you have something you wanted to add? No, no, thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you, Madam President and counselors for the time. Uh, the only thing that I would say in addition to uh, Chair Olivas' comments and the letter that we've already provided to council is that probably the uh, avenues by which training is received could we could have some discussions around those as well and making those trainings even more accessible. Again, bearing in mind that the members that are on this are serving this board our volunteers and lest we move away from kind of a diverse and, and representative board and end up with a board of a bunch of retirees, I think we need to bear in mind that many of our members have full-time jobs that every time we are required to attend um, trainings, we have to not only take the time away from our families, but we have to take time off work and lose compensation. Um, Barring, you know, certain members of the amici, we are the only participants in this oversight process that are not receiving any sort of compensation for the work that we do. Um, the monitoring team, yourselves, the city attorney, the DOJ, our attorneys, our staff, <laughs> everybody receives some sort of compensation for the work that they do and we don't. And so I think that um, it would be kind and wise and prudent and all of the things to make um, at the very beginning a very laborious training schedule uh, more accessible to a variety of individuals in the community to um, make this board as diverse as possible and as representative of the community as it can be. And then the other thing is I think that there is, and you will see in that um, spreadsheet, that there is a little bit of ambiguity as to when certain trainings are required to be completed. Um, I will say that for my part, I have 
taken a, a great deal of time over the last couple of weeks incorporating some of the feedback from our newer members and kind of redesigning our um, onboarding process to present to our board and and see if we can't get this new member um, that will be coming to us in a more practical um, training schedule and regimen. And so we are taking steps on our own um, to be able to kind of make those things work well for volunteers and, and be manageable. Um, take them off in bite-sized chunks. So other than that, I think that we are happy to stand for any questions that you may have um, about that report that was submitted and the the accompanying letter. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Galloway. Um, do we have any questions from counselors about the report? Uh, Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. It's more a question for you as a sponsor. Being that the bill says that you would like a report before September 28th, is it necessary to pass this resolution? I believe that it is. And uh, yes, it is. We are under a sort of a commitment here. So yeah, it's important. Council well, gives. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Can I follow up to that? Just another question. So does this report satisfy that requirement? I mean, it seems like it does, considering what I read in the resolution and then what we were received from the email or, and I, I'm asking because I think that the board needs to be able to be aware if they need to add something more additional um, if, if you are expecting something further. Madam President, if I may. Um, so I think that the, well, first of all, um, extreme kudos to the volunteers who put this together on such a short timeline. I think we all know how much uh, this particular group has on its plate and how important this job is. Um, but with respect to passing the resolution, um, it, what it basically calls for is for the discussion to continue through October 4th. And by passing the resolution, it'll allow you to continue that discussion and have meetings uh, potentially with stakeholders or persons that are interested in this issue so that you might be able to gain a little bit more information and develop some thoughts as the council proceeds forward to deal with this training issue overall. So Madam President, Mr. Melendrez, so yes, I understand that. So thank you for the clarification, but does the, are we expecting the CPOA board to actually do more or does this satisfy that requirement as far as them providing this report and then we can have the further discussions? Madam President, um, Councillor Bassan, I think that's one of the things that we would wanna evaluate. It's my first blush read that it does meet exactly what the council was looking for. However, as you know, the city has a whole team of folks that represent the city and engage the Department of Justice and the monitoring team. And so we wanna make sure we have time to consult with that group um, before, before making that determination conclusively, which by passing it tonight, that'll give you the opportunity to continue that discussion until October 4th. Okay, thank you for the clarification, Mr. Melendrez. So Councillor Gibson and then Councillor Senna. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm okay with this resolution with one rather um, large exception, and that is um, the, uh, the part about inviting or uh, asking the uh, members to come back and tell us why they haven't uh, uh, met with the requirements of training. Uh, I find that very... Um, Hmm, heavy handed at least. And, uh, uh, you know, again, these are volunteers who spend a lot of time on this, a lot of, 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 of not only time, but, but work. And the training is immense. I understand we are going to be opening up that ordinance and making some, some changes, some updates. And I certainly hope that the training requirements are reviewed um, with the help of the current members on this. Um, 
on this particular yes, board. Yes, um, so that's that's the one uh, issue that I have with this. I I don't feel comfortable <laughs> in in voting to support it um, with that language uh, requiring or asking. I don't remember what the what the terminology is for them to return. I think that you know they have they have done what they needed to do. You know they wrote a letter. They answered the questions. They even put it into an Excel spreadsheet. So um, I, I suppose we could pass this resolution, but with knowledge that uh, what we've asked for is is sitting in front of us. Um, so I, I I'm not really sure, you know, why we're, you know, what the purpose of this resolution is, unless it is to satisfy. Um, perhaps the, uh, uh, the, the CASA team, um, the, um, uh, Chancellor, Dr. I think I, maybe and, I could take a stab at that. Okay, I was talking let me to finish. Ms. I'm almost done. Okay. Okay. And I won't interrupt you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So may it could be a re that could be the reason that, that, that we're satisfying, uh, something that the uh, monitoring team has asked for. But absent that, I think just for somebody in City Hall to say, hey, we need this, uh, I don't think that's a good enough, good enough reason. Thank you very much. I'm finished now. Thank you. Adam Thank President. you, Council. I can't always tell when you're finished. Um, so I think that talking in talking I'm to Mr. Melendres, uh, we were really uh, looking for more of a dialogue and really extending an invitation if we need to soften that language, we could probably make an amendment. I see um, Mr. Aguilar on on the screen, so I'm gathering that he might want to say something regarding that. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam President and members of the council. If I can explain just briefly what the uh, overarching issue is, and then we can uh, and and I can am happy to answer any questions from there. Um, earlier in the month, the members of the monitoring team and the Department of Justice uh, met with us and, and let us know that uh, there were serious deficiencies with the training of the board members. Um, we met after that point with the members of the board. As this council knows, the resolution uh, is a mechanism by which the council uh, as a body can hold and exercise oversight over uh, the Civilian Police Oversight Board, uh, which is one of the responsibilities of the council under the uh, CASA and is provided for specifically in ordinance. Um, we have received the information provided. Uh, we have also made numerous other uh, informational requests that we are still waiting on. Um, so the overarching issue of whether the board remains in compliance or not um, is up in the air, but uh, as far as the council is concerned, I think this resolution does permit this council to be able to engage in this dialogue and answer these questions about um, these deficiencies. Some of these deficiencies have uh, predated even the pandemic and, um, and are not just simply, um, in our view, um, uh, errors uh, with uh, having too much to do in the first six months. Um, but rather, um, these are uh, some of the training that is missing in some of these uh, with some of these members are the core uh, tools that will help them do their jobs, which are is reviewing um, complaints of citizens, uh, I'm sorry, citizen complaints of police misconduct, as well as uh, looking at and uh, identifying areas of policy that can be um, that can be fixed and making those recommendations to the department. So, uh, with that, if the council has any um, sorry specific questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, Mr. Aguilar, as long as you're there, um, do you feel that we should change this language and make it more inviting? I guess, so, or rather than directive. Uh, Madam, Madam President, that would uh, be the discretion of the council. Okay. Councilor Gibson, go back to you since you raised the issue. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I think it's one thing to ask for the records. 
the out of compliances, as we see now, are largely um, uh, from uh, lack of reporting, right? Or not lack of reporting, they were reported, but they didn't get organized into a, a, a report. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there wasn't any, uh, it doesn't look to me like there was any, any uh, malintent here or anything like that. It's pretty, that, that's pretty clear. Uh, and also, I, I don't know if I made this very clear when I spoke before, but I'm going to try it again. I think what, what this does is it, um, what this resolu resolution does is uh, it, it's slightly insulting, I think, to people who are trying to do a good job. So um, I would I would hope that we could, Madam President, I would hope that you would see the wisdom in maybe deferring this. Let's work on the language since we already do have a report. Uh, maybe maybe that can be uh, cleared up within this resolution, and then I'd be fine with it. Thank you very much. I'm finished. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. I think, you know, for me in thinking about the CPOA, and of course, we always appreciate all of our boards that serve um, out of their own time and are not compensated, especially uh, as an important board as the CPOA. I, I know that we've already had discussions among other counselors um, on the sustainability of the CPOA and how we can do better. Uh, but at the same time, as I think about this resolution, it really gets to the heart at, um, and which is why I appreciate um, Council Borrego bringing this forward is because that we wouldn't have gotten an update otherwise, that it would have shown non-compliance and we wouldn't have had that communication um, of some of these updates. Um, and for me, again, I'm thinking back to the sustainability, whether it's now or four months from now, if the miscommunication continues, then that needs to be fixed. Um, I think that that's what is important here and especially what you know our, our city attorney as it relates to the CASA, that it is important that these trainings are done as directed by uh, the court approved settlement agreement. So, you know, it's not just us that's bound by it, but also our board. Um, and that's why I appreciate it because we need to know um, in terms of their compliance as you know, Mr. Aguilado was saying. Um, and that's why, of course, we don't you know, wish to do this and we want to maintain that independence. However, uh, when it comes to, um, if it comes through our IMR, in this next review, of course, we want to get everyone into compliance. So, and that also relates to our CPOA. Um, I think that the main issue here is whether it's um, getting the trainings on board, and I understand circumstances, especially as it relates to COVID and not being able to, to fall into that compliance, but it is important that we know. And of course, again, we're reviewing all of the trainings to see just the sustainability of the trainings and how much hours that our board members are having to go through when it comes to that specific training that's not just asked by an ordinance, but also by CASA, because I know they're two separate and different types of trainings that's asked by both. Um, so I just want to convey that to, to both um, our chair Olivas and our vice chair Galloway uh, as to this legislation, you know, I wouldn't want us to have to bring up this legislation again, it come two years from now, or less, if there are new uh, board members that are on board that are still a little bit behind and having to maintain that. Because, you know, it's, it's our duty um, as counselors to, to put that legislation forward and, and make sure that we're all in compliance, but also offer support where we can. So that's just my my wish to, to say to our CPOA is that we know and understand the difficulties of our training. And of course, we're trying to address that as well. But, you know, had this legislation not been brought forward, the issues of noncompliance and the changing 
uh, an updating of some of the training hours and if you're in compliance or not wouldn't have occurred and that's why you know i do appreciate this legislation so i do hope you know this this really engages us as council to to meet with some of our cpoa board members to have that specific discussion so thank you thank you councillor senna councillor basson thank you madam president i i agree with with partially with what councillor gibson is saying i mean i agree that we don't want to already put more burden on the board members and i certainly don't want to back them into a corner for some kind of maybe um, perceived defense, which is not, I think, the intention of any of this. But when I read section two, it says they're invited to appear. It doesn't say they shall. So um, I feel like that kind of leaves it open to say, well, if they feel like they need to defend themselves, then they're invited to come and talk to us. Um, I don't see it being too aggressive, even though I also can understand the perspective of, again, not wanting us to force them into some kind of defense. Thank you, Councillor Basson. And as I mentioned earlier, um, this is intended to continue a dialogue with the board and extend the invitation of the board, you know, opening the door to come and talk with councillors as necessary. I don't think that it's intended to be heavy handed, but we are trying to meet compliance also, and I think that the board members, as they're trained, understand, um, you know, that we are trying to be in compliance with the CASA. So um, I don't see any other hands up. Uh, Mr. Olivas, did you have a comment? Yes, thank you, uh, Council President Borrego. I'll, I'll try and be quick here, but I just wanted to reiterate that, that we absolutely want to be in compliance with what is required of the board, both by ordinance and by CASA. And uh, becoming aware of these issues was, was certainly uh, an important part of this. And we're committed to fixing this, working with council. And I, I think I have two requests tonight. One is that we keep this dialogue going um, and that these changes, these contemplated proposed changes be made in the context of um, speaking to those folks that know this system best. Um, and, and by that, I mean board members. Um, it doesn't mean that we're the only stakeholders or we're the only folks with input, but I think that, um, you know, we probably have the best eyes on what the problems are and, and what the solutions may be. And uh, I, I hope that we can have that dialogue uh, ongoing and, and I'll certainly commit to, to reaching out to, to as many of you as I possibly can as a, as a volunteer. I do work. Um, it, you know, this is a, a demanding job uh, among another demanding job that I have. So. Uh, I will do the best that I can to, to be present and, and be available. But secondly, I also wanted to reach out with, uh, with a more urgent request. One of the training requirements uh, is the C Civilian Police Academy, which is currently ongoing. Uh, it's a requirement that it be completed within six months for board members. It's an ordinance requirement, I believe. Um, and several, of, at least one of my members uh, has expressed extreme discomfort with attending that in person. It is an in-person class. Uh, as you know, there's no vaccine mandate for city employees and there's no vaccine mandate for um, anyone attending that type of thing. And I'm not getting into that, but it, it, it just makes this individual uncomfortable. It's not my position to, to judge that. And given that uh, she has been unable to attend that training, we've requested that the department provide that training via Zoom uh, that request was denied, and, and we also requested that Mr. Aguilar uh, potentially help us with, with finding a resolution to that, and um, <clears throat> that request was also uh, rejected as, as being the board's responsibility to, to find a, a solution to that. So um, it, it is frustrating. That is a, a uh, three-month, two nights a week, three hours a night commitment for board members. Uh, we're not required to attend every session, but it is a significant commitment of time. Um, and now in the, in the current pandemic environment, I think that um, we need immediate relief with that, either getting access to that training or, or being um, relieved from that for, for a temporary period of time. So uh, again, I wanna continue the dialogue and I, I really thank you for, for recognizing me and allowing me to participate here. Thank you, Mr. Olivas. These are the kinds of issues that we would like to continue the dialogue on. I know that when I was able to meet with a monitor and the CP, uh, uh, Mr. Harness, 
and some of the folks from legal, I mentioned that it might be, especially during the pandemic, and this was earlier, um, I mentioned that it might be good to do some video training, uh, have that available. And I have yet to see that. So I think it's a dialogue that definitely needs to continue. Um, Ms. Galloway, you had your hand up as well. I did. Um, thank you, President Borrego. Um, I just want to confirm that the outreach subcommittee of which I chair has directed our agency over several months to be reaching out to city councilors for these very purposes to open up dialogue, um, particularly at the beginning of Councilor Bassan and Councilor Senna's time to introduce ourselves, the work we do, bring them on board. I don't know if those requests have been made of council staff and working with the schedule. I know that Councillor Bassan did make herself available to meet with certain members of our board as well. Um, but it is something that we have tasked the agency with setting up. They're the ones with the contacts. Um, that has not happened. I did reach out to Councillor Senna's office today um, to try and arrange a meeting with her uh, individually, but I would say that the offer is out, the desire is out. If that's not making it to you all, we need to know that um, so that we can kind of be the masters of our own destiny as far as the board goes. Um, if, if the requests that we're making are not occurring, um, we do want to meet with you all. And then to one other point that Councillor Senna um, made, I would just remind you that the, the issue that we came across as we were kind of trying to figure out why all of a sudden there was a concern about deficiencies in training that we knew didn't exist is because of record keeping. Um, the records were not kept well, and that is a problem that we have also addressed internally. And so what may be seen or have, have been thought to have been deficiencies in training and meeting those requirements, by and large, is just not accurate. Um, members are receiving the training that they are required to on the schedule that they're required to. Um, the only exceptions to that, as you will see, are trainings that have not been offered by the department that are required. And that's not a decision that we have made. <laughs> it's a decision that they have made um, given the circumstances around the pandemic, um, or in one member's case, just a, a lack of comfort in meeting in person right now. Um, so just just to make sure that everybody is is comfortable with that, or at least aware of the fact that our our board members are actually completing the training that they are required to. So, thank you, Ms. Galloway, for those comments. Um, Councilor Davis, you've been waiting with your hand up. Thank you, Madam President. I, I don't want to extend this conversation any longer than necessary, and then I'm about to, but <clears throat> let me just say, um, I, I really appreciate Mr. Olivas and Ms. Galloway for joining us tonight. Um, kudos to both of you. Uh, we don't always agree on exactly where we ought to go, but I, kudos to both of you because what little bit city councilors get paid to be in these meetings, you get paid absolutely nothing. And you can, the two of you and a few of your other members consistently uh, join us to talk about these issues in committee and, and in city council, and I do appreciate it. Um, Madam President, I, I agree wholeheartedly that we ought to do uh, to be on top of this issue, uh, but some of us have, have been arguing for a while um, that we need a reset on uh, accountability, and so let me, let me plant that seed again here today and say this. Um, I'm not I don't disagree that we need to know the training uh, status for our members of CPOA, but I don't think this resolution is the way. I think we ought to be able to call and ask and get that data. And if we can't, we ought to work on that. I don't know that we need legislation to do it because I think it feels confrontational to our volunteers who are trying to do the right job. Um, and so I agree with the sentiment. I don't agree with the process. And so I, I don't know that I'll support this, but my bigger concern is this. Ms. Galloway brought up the question of record keeping and it, reiterated to me sort of the feeling that I have about this entire process. Um, Councillor uh, Winter, uh, before he, uh, he retired, uh, worked with me to reform the CPOA process um, to deal with the CPOA ordinance, to deal with how we uh, investigate um, 
uh, internal affairs to give uh, CPOA access to internal affairs information, for example, in a secret way. Like we worked out that prob- that process to deal with that uh, issue that DOJ addressed. I feel like we're in this place right now where everybody, and that includes the city council, it includes the CPOA, it includes the administration and the mayor's office, APD, the city attorney's office, everybody's pointing fingers at somebody else because DOJ is finally tired of waiting on us to do something. And quite frankly, I'm kind of tired too. We've read these reports that say we passed these policies and we're not implementing them efficiently enough. Um, We have made a tremendous progress, in my opinion, in the last six months uh, under new leadership. But Ms. Galloway's notion about record keeping just reiterates to me the problem. The city has an obligation to be sure that we're meeting our standards. So who in the city is responsible for keeping record keeping? It's not the volunteer members of the CPOA. It's somebody that's keeping up with when did they go? Who would APD train them? APD has a training database. Like those questions should not, we should not have to pass a piece of legislation to ask someone at the city how we're complying with these com- uh, pieces of the CPOA or of the, the consent agree. And I just, I have that issue. We all seem to be pointing fingers at each other saying, oh, I want to be sure they're trained or I want to be sure the union is giving us more time for investigations. The mayor is is negotiating with the police union behind our backs. I'm tired of us doing that. And I want us to take a real look at the city council, because ultimately the only people responsible and able to change the rules are the nine people that do this Zoom meeting. And one day we'll sit at our dais again. Um, I think we have a CPOA that works for where we needed it to be five years ago. I think it's time for us to revisit what the CPOA should be today. And I think we ought to wipe it away and get started again. And I think we should start that process. So thank you, Madam President. I appreciate your patience and letting me have my soapbox. I'll be quiet. Thank you, Counselor. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a mo. Can I make another motion to defer? Um, I would like to make a motion to defer. I, I hear what everyone's saying. Um, I don't think we're intending to be heavy handed. I think what we're trying to do is get to the root of, you know, our staff does monitor, you know, and, and that's what we're supposed to do with the CPOA. And um, we're, you know, we have the administration dealing with the, the uh, CASA and, and the judge. So I think that, you know, maybe we need to take a look at this um, again and determine how we can um, move it forward, but maybe move it forward in a, maybe with more language about dialogue. And I mean, you know, that should go without saying is that we should continue that dialogue and extend that invitation. But how do we do that in a way that the city council has also met its um, responsibility and uh, the CPOA understands that we have certain responsibilities that we do have to meet. I think they understand that already, but you know, we want to maybe work on this a little bit more and, and try to move it forward. Councilor Senna, is that a second on my deferral? Thank you, uh, Ms. Galloway. I'm so sorry to um, interject here, but perhaps it's as simple as uh, the chair of the board, whoever that may be at the time, uh, joining the executive director when he's providing his reports to city council to provide a report back to city council on the training. It may be as simple as that, Um, but something, I mean, it, it just doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be heavily legislated. If you tell us what you'd like, we are happy to comply. And, and we know that, I think we know that, um, yeah, but we want to work with you and we wanna ensure that we're all working together to reach this objective that we've been given as, you know, as a city. So um, with that, uh, we have a motion to defer um, for two weeks is what I'm being told by my attorney is that would be enough time maybe that we could work this through this. So we have a motion and a second. I'm going to go to Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Councilor Benton. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero on the deferral to October 4th.
Thank you, counselors. And thank you to the CPC members that were here with us this evening. Mm -hmm. um, we will please all of us reach out to each other and let's, let's continue this dialogue because it's really, really important to our city. Thank you. So with that, we are going to move back counselors to item F, which is Councilor Benton, 071, uh, Councilor Benton. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Um, 071 is repealing the Neighborhood Association Recognition Ordinance, Section 1418.2, <clears throat> and replacing it with a revised uh, narrow prescribing responsibilities and services off offered by the Office of Neighborhood Coordination and making revisions to the Integrated Development Ordinance related to Neighborhood Association notice, I move a due pass. Councillor Benton, there is a second okay. by Councillor Davis. And I heard Councillor, I Thank think you. I heard Councillor Gibson. Thank you. But I didn't see her hand up. So we'll accept Councillor Davis's second. Councillor Benton. Yes. Um, Madam President, uh, I think this this is the uh, first hearing of the full council of this bill. And so I'd like to ask Ms. Baca and perhaps uh, other staff members who've worked on it uh, to give us an introduction uh, for ourselves and the general public who may not have uh, heard about how the process has gone. Madam President, Councillor, and members of the City Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak. In October 2017, the City Council announced its intent to address the shortcomings in the current Neighborhood Association Recognition Ordinance, or the NARO as it's called, which was originally passed in 1987 and had been minimally updated in the ensuing years. Interim guidelines that temporarily restricted the formation of new neighborhood associations whose proposed boundaries would conflict with existing associations were put into place and are still in place as the NARO process continues. Between early spring 2018 and fall 2019, independent consultants were contracted to conduct an extensive outreach initiative with city councilors, city departments, neighborhood associations, community groups, and individuals not affiliated with a neighborhood association in order to determine what changes should be incorporated into the updated NARO. This outreach effort was called the Neighborhood Engagement Process, or NEP, or NEP, the NEP involved contacting 222 neighborhood and homeowner associations via phone and email with 93 neighborhood association face-to-face -face choice dialogues, 159 flash interviews in both English and Spanish at four community centers in the city's four quadrants, and a variety of surveys, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and group discussions hosted by the NEP consultants themselves. Overall, the NEP engaged with city councilors, other city departments and staff, neighborhood association board members and general members, homeowner associations, neighborhood coalitions, and individuals not affiliated with a neighborhood association. This outreach was conducted over 22 months total, culminating in the consultants giving an overview to the city council in November 2019, to which all neighborhood associations and coalitions were invited. Regular updates on the NEP were shared with the public through the ONC's neighborhood newsletter and weekly e-news, as well as on the ONC's website and social media venues. And this information is still available on the ONC's website, as well as the NARO update website on the City Council homepage. An initial draft of the updated NARO was sent to all neighborhood associations on file with the Office of Neighborhood Coordination, or the ONC, in January 2021. Extensive feedback from neighborhood associations and coalitions was received, and the legislation was subsequently revised to incorporate much of this community feedback. This revised draft of the NARO was sent to all neighborhood associations and coalitions in July 2021 and was introduced at the city council meeting on Monday, August 2nd, 2021, before being referred to the Land Use, Planning and Zoning Committee, or LUPT. Councilors and the ONC have continued to receive extensive neighborhood feedback on the updated draft NARO and have worked diligently to incorporate as many of those suggestions as possible to this revised draft NARO. This revised legislation contains updated language that more clearly defines the roles and expectations of recognized neighborhood associations and coalitions, the ONC, and other city departments. 
One of the ideas behind the revised NARO is that if the city is going to recognize an outside group in some way, that group should conduct its activities in a fair and democratic manner. In the case of neighborhood associations, fairness can be promoted by outlining minimum democratic processes that can be followed to help promote inclusion and reliable community representation. So the updated draft NARO clarifies the standards that neighborhood associations and coalitions will be asked to follow when conducting certain business, including elections and voting. In addition, the revised NARO addresses the following. To become recognized, a new neighborhood association or neighborhood coalition must allow any resident or business to become a member, have clearly defined boundaries that do not overlap with any other neighborhood association or coalition, have bylaws that clearly define the processes by which board members are elected and or replaced and how annual meetings are noticed, have two designated points of contact on file with the ONC and complete the ONC's compliance form and make sure that gets submitted to our office. And then to stay recognized, a neighborhood association or a neighborhood co coalition must have an annual report and submit an annual report form to our office maintain two designated points of contact with the ONC, including names, addresses, telephone numbers, and email addresses, have a clearly defined democratic process for holding elections that is spelled out in their bylaws, and clarify to members that, do, excuse me, that dues are voluntary and can be charged, but cannot be a prerequisite for either membership or voting. So recognition in this case means that a neighborhood association or neighborhood coalition has the responsibility of receiving and disseminating developer notifications and permit application information to their members, as well as other information of interest or that might benefit or otherwise affect their neighborhood. Other groups and individuals will also have access to all of the ONC's resources and communications. They are not considered recognized, however, and will not receive developer notices and permit application notifications. City departments other than the ONC have the responsibility of notifying recognized neighborhood associations and recognized neighborhood coalitions of changes in city services, major infrastructure projects, city street constructions or closure, filming on city streets, and major city development per the IDO requirements within a specific radius. The Office of Neighborhood Coordination has the responsibility to maintain recognized neighborhood association and coalition contact information, disseminate this information to permit applicants, developers, and city departments for notification about projects and development, offer information, assistance, and resources for creation and maintenance of recognition status, and provide resources and training to neighborhood associations, coalitions, individuals, business groups, and businesses. And I will now stand for questions. Do we have questions of Ms. Baca? Mr. Davis. Thanks, Madam President. I'll make this quick. Ms. Baca, that was an awful lot of information, but considering it's been more than two years of work on this back and forth, I, I can understand. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things I thought were important here. Um, we've heard some criticism tonight from neighborhood members and, and for what it's worth, I'm, I'm sort of in support of extending this a little bit to give final input. Um, but we've heard input from people who say, oh, the city council is redoing this without any public input at all. Uh, just in bullet points, could you just remind me how many public input sessions and how much public comment we've gotten on this from neighborhood associations? Yes, Madam President, Councillor Davis, I'll be happy to do that. So again, the uh, overall NEP process started back in 2017. Total neighborhood associations contacted were 222 that also included um, HOAs and coalitions. Uh, 93 neighborhood association face-to-face -face, uh, choice dialogues, it's what the contractors called them, were conducted. There were 159 interviews in English and Spanish at four community centers in four in the city's four quadrants. And there are numerous surveys, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and group discussions hosted by the consultants. So overall, the process was basically took a total of 22 months and uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but the uh, overall outreach took a significant amount of time and there was a significant effort made in reaching as many neighborhood associations, coalitions, HOAs, and individuals as possible. Um, I know the co I was not personally involved in that process till the very end, but the contractors made a significant effort to reach as many people as they possibly could in all of the council districts. 
And I know that there was a significant amount of feedback that was received as well. And that was incorporated into several reports. Uh, the summary report that a lot of people have referred to is available on the uh, NEP website, also on the NARO uh, update, excuse me, uh, <laughs> I got confused there. You know what I meant, but <laughs> the project update website, which is available off the city council homepage as well. That was perfect. Thank you. No, and, and I don't mean to belittle anyone who came late to the game. I, I just want to point out that this is a conversation we've been having since, I don't know, since what, four years now, I, since I was almost a city councilor and I'm in my second term. Um, some councilors have been here longer than that. Um, but I, Madam President, what my point tonight is, I, I'm not opposed to the fact to maybe extending this or deferring this if someone wants to do that, um, just to take last minute comments. But what we heard tonight was an overwhelming um, uh, show that our neighborhood associations have participated in this process. Uh, they, I, I have yet to see as many neighborhoods in the city. And maybe I should say this, that at no other time in my career, on this council has the city council managed to get so many neighborhoods to agree on one thing, which is that they're scared of change or not concerned. Now we, we address this because, uh, or we brought this forward because they brought up issues that they wanted to be more involved. They wanted to have other processes. Um, and this puts everybody on a level playing field. I do think we should take more comment. I do think we can do that. Uh, but we should recognize that the, the old structure where you could have two neighborhood associations, for example, representing one community, um, really was two, two votes for some people and no votes for others. Um, we've heard some comments from neighborhood associations that they want to have people have to pay membership dues to participate. Um, but let me just be clear, that should not be the, the, the standing that the IDO provides to neighborhood associations. Um, is special. It means that a neighborhood association is the only association in some cases that can provide standing to challenge a zoning decision or a development decision. Um, that should not be limited to the people who can afford to pay to be a part of that conversation. Um, this new narrow allows for neighborhood associations who choose to participate as a formal member of the city's development process to do so in a formal way, and they, they must include everybody in their neighborhoods, not just everybody who comes to the regular meetings, but everybody who cares about an issue when it comes in front of them. Because if you have three, three jobs, two kids, and six other things to do, um, very rarely is the neighborhood meeting the top of your list, but sometimes it's really, really important. And this was designed to make our process more equitable and accessible. Um, I do think we ought to have more time. I won't make that motion, but I do think it's possible that we can do that but I want us to recognize what we're talking about. And, uh, and that is making the process more open to more people because we have too many neighborhood associations that literally are three or four officers who rarely have meetings, who rarely participate, um, but who wield enormous influence and legal authority and standing in the city uh, regarding huge decisions. Not that they shouldn't, but I think there should be more people involved in those conversations and we should break those barriers down. So I applaud where we're going. I support a deferral to allow more comment, but I hope we can conclude this by the end of the year so that we can start with a new class of counselors uh, in the beginning of the year with a new expectation. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Davis, Councilor Benson. Yes, I appreciate those comments from uh, Councilor Davis. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely, you know, we have not, rushed this we you know we had uh, multiple LEPS meetings um, <clears throat> as was stated we we've incorporated a lot of the comments and uh, uh, this hasn't been been uh, conducted in the dark uh, to the contrary we made every effort to reach out to individual neighborhood associations now some of them for whatever reason did not participate but um, but we we've continued to have dialogues with them. I've met with the inner coalition panel about this. We made promises that we would share the first draft of the legislation with them, which we did. Uh, made some pretty drastic amendments as a result of, of those conversations when we released it uh, in January of this year, the uh, the new version of it, and. Um, uh, we've continued to to make amendments. We've made a number of amendments in committee, and we've got a number of really good amendments tonight. Uh, you know, I think uh, I do want to 
hear those amendments and, and have, have us take action on those amendments. And then I am willing to, uh, certainly since this is just the first full council meeting, uh, to, uh, to propose a deferral. But, um, but in the mean, meantime, unless there are other comments, uh, Madam uh, President, or any other uh, comments from our staff who've worked on this, Mr. Melendres has done a lot of work on it, and Ms. Morris as well. I don't think she's here tonight. But, um, but uh, really, having looked over the amendments that are being proposed tonight, they're all very relevant and, and uh, come in response to some of the questions that, that have been raised most recently. So. Okay, um, counselors, we have a motion and a second to move this bill. Um, I would also support a deferral. Um, I would like to probably go through the amendments and although I, I'm, I'm kind of hesitant because the neighborhoods have not seen the amendments before tonight. Um, but I think that they are being done in good faith to respond to comments that we've all heard. So, um, and I think we have, we'll have kind of a second bite at the apple um, at our next meeting. I think that there's likely there may be more amendments coming forward at that point in time um, to make this a better bill than, than you know, what it is tonight. So uh, with that, I'm going to, um, unless there are any, other comments regarding 071, uh, we will move to our amendments, try to get through them. There's a number of them. There's 13, uh, 14 if I decide to move the one that I have. Um, I'm not sure that, about that or not. So I think uh, with that, we're gonna go to our, our packet. And you all have it. If you don't have it, it's in your iPad. And we will just go through them one by one. There's 13 of them. We will start with those amendments with Councillor Davis. And he has the first two, and then we will move forward. Uh, Madam President, is it our intent to defer tonight or to move these amendments? I, I thought we were going to just have discussion on amendments and... and that's defer. what I said, Councillor. Is that we're going to go to the amendments and then and then look to a deferral? Uh, my my preference on my amendments, Madam President, would be just to move them forward um, to the, our next meeting, unless the president has a preference. I, you know, I my preference is that we defer this entire bill, and I can make that motion now. But if I make that motion then we are not going to be hearing our amendments tonight. We will hear them at our next meeting uh, because we have to act on that deferral. Well, so um, That's if, fine. Ma Madam President, mine are technical, so it's fine if we move mine, but I, I think some are more substantive and I'm not sure we want to do all those tonight, but I can move floor amendment number one. Mr. Moya can, uh, can raise it on the screen. It's a technical amendment for a cleanup. Mr. Moore, I'm... there it is. I would move floor amendment number one to 02171. Uh, this amendment uh, simply adds the word directors to this section. It allows for, for associations that choose to have directors instead of members uh, who make their decisions. And uh, I would urge your support. Councillor Davis has moved floor amendment number one as a technical amendment. Do I have a second? Councillor Benton, Councillor Gibson. Are there questions? If not, we will take a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Councilor Harris. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Eight zero on amendment one. Thank you, Councillors. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, amendment B in your packet, I'll move this floor. Amendment number two, it clarifies voting mechanisms uh, for members of neighborhood associations. Simply put, this just means that for regular items, uh, neighborhood associations can opt to do mail ballots, electronic ballots, or in-person uh, voting for routine items. 
uh, and requires in-person voting for members uh, for uh, officer elections. I move amendment number two. Do I have a second? Councilor Gibson, thank you. Any questions, Councilor Basson? Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Davis, it the way I read it, and I, I get your intention and I'm all for it, but the way I read this, when I read it, when it says at least one of the ways, it led me to believe that you could almost have multiple votes because you could at least vote in on paper or in person or on paper and in person. Um, and so I was concerned that maybe that actually made it your unintention. unintention. <laughs> Madam President, uh, no, Councillor, and, and thank you for clarifying if I misspoke. Um, it is It simply says these are the methods that are required. You can choose more than one, but you must do at least one of these um, just to make it clear to neighborhood associations how those formal votes were cast. And as you know, Madam uh, President uh, and Councillor Bassan, there have been questions in the past about whether an association took a position or not based on how people participated. Uh, this simply would require those associations to choose a method of voting and stick to it. Councillor, would would you can okay maybe Councillor Gibson has a better idea. Uh, so I, I guess I need a little help here because I read that to be uh, eliminating a voice vote. Is is that your intent, Councillor? Madam President and uh, Councillor Gibson, it is not. Uh, this okay. directive, and I'll, I'll freely say it might need to say. Uh, by request of staff. I, I believe routine matters, kind of like approving the journal, et cetera, but I think this relates, as I understand it, to formal matters that relate to formal actions by the board, such as electing an officer, taking a position on a, a mem uh, on a formal city action, et cetera. I think routine actions are sort of Robert's rules of orders, if that clarifies. Okay, so then again, uh, you're not intending to eliminate the voice, voice vote. Okay. Uh, no, no, ma'am, not not for those, but I think for formal actions that might invoke the city's sort of requirements for the IDO, I believe there needs to be a vote on the record is what I understand. I would ask staff if they, they intend this otherwise to let us know now or forever hold their peace, but that's what I understand this to do. So Madam paper President, votes there, but vo voice votes, I, I, I'm just trying to understand. Is that Madam right? President, maybe I could, Councilor Gibson, yeah. um, I will, I'll try. So the draft narrow that's in front of you without this amendment says that votes may be cast in the following ways, in person, mailed paper ballots, or electronic means. And so those are the options. Um, this amendment is simply saying that you do not have to offer all of these for every vote. At least that's the intent. And so by saying at least one of these, that gives an association discretion to say, you can do a voice vote for in-person or you, you can do a paper vote for in-person. I think either of those work for in-person uh, and or you could do a mailed paper ballot, but you don't have to do both. So it's opening options for folks to choose which way they want to vote on any particular issue. Madam um, President, if I may. Um, excuse me, Councillor Basson. Councillor Gibson, did, did you have a follow-up? Because it looked like you did. Oh, no, that was a thumbs up. Thank you. Councilor Bisson. Thanks, Madam President. I don't feel like my question ever got answered. I mean, I, I was saying the way I read it is that you could have at least a vote in person by mail or by electronic means. So you could by, I mean, just saying, and maybe legal can help us, maybe Mr. Melendres, the way, if I'm construing it this way, perhaps other people could construe it this way to read that each member is afforded the ability to vote using at least one of the following methods in person. So you can vote at least, sure, but can we clarify that it's one vote for one person maybe? Because to me, I read this to say that you can vote in person and mail something in and you can have potentially two votes. Madam President, um, thank you, Councilor Brasad. Yeah, I, I, I don't read it that way. I, I read it that these are the requirements for the city uh, to have a neighborhood association in good standing and that they should pass their own bylaws to clarify which of these are is appropriate. But maybe Mr. Melendres can clarify for us. I don't see voter fraud in this, but I want to be, you're right. We should clarify if there's a question. Madam President and counselors, um, 
I think that if, if there's a concern about that, it'd be really easy to fix. Um, on the paragraph number one of the amendment, it says each member is afforded the ability to vote using at least one of the following methods. I think that could be easily changed to say each member is afforded the ability to cast no more than one vote using at least one of the following uh, methods, in which case it would signify that there's no intent to allow people to cast two votes for one member. Madam President, if Councilor Bassan would, would see that as solving her problem, I would consider that a technical cleanup and ask the clerk to do that in, in, uh, in our bill. Thank you, Councilor. Yes, I, I appreciate that and agree with it. Good point, thanks. Thank you, Councilor Davis. That change was made. So just for the public, can we read that back, please? Madam President, Councilors, on page five, line 21, subsection 8B is being amended as follows. Existing text is, each member is afforded the ability to add, cast no more than one, go back to existing text, vote, no more than one vote, using, and then add at least one of the following methods. Thank you, counselors. Um, with that change, uh, Councilor Davis, your, your original bill has been has received a friendly amendment, I guess. <laughs> um, you support that? Uh, yes, ma'am. And uh, if there's not any other questions, I would just support. Thank you. So with that, we will move to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Councilor Harris. Councilor Jones. Yes. I'm sorry. Councilor Harris. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero on Amendment Two. Councilor Jones, I could barely hear you. I don't know if it was my end or your end. So if you could just check your audio, please. Um, okay. So. We consider the first two as friendly amendments. Um, at this point in time, I would ask the council just to get a sentiment of whether we should proceed with these amendments or defer at this point in time. Um, Councilor Benton, did you have a comment? Yes, if I could, uh, Madam President. You know, whether, whether the... Um, the sponsors of these amendments, uh, you know, if they, they prefer to wait, I would, I think it would be informative for the public. I mean, if we don't even talk about them and then we just defer, it'd be informative for the public to, to hear what's intended. And then, uh, and, and then it would be up, of course, up to, to the uh, sponsors of any amendment to decide whether they want to vote it upon tonight or, or later. But uh, as I said, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, defer this, uh, you know, counselors always have the right to bring forth amendments and, um, you know, maybe this goes on uh, ad infinitum, I don't know, but but at least for tonight, I thought there were a lot of really good amendments that seem to be in response to public comments. So um, when, when we as counselors make amendments, we're often criticized to, to say, well, we haven't, we didn't okay. get advance notice. And so that can be a problem sometimes. Uh, because they we do kind of get in a in an endless wheel, but I think these are all uh, valid amendments and good ones. And maybe at least, if uh, the sponsors don't want them voted upon, they could at least explain their amendments, and then that'll be out there. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Uh, Councillor Harris also has a comment. Councillor Harris. Had your hand up, Councillor Harris. Okay, yeah, 
Um, yeah, I just want to kind of make a little speech here about this. Uh, I have some unique um, experience with neighborhood associations and I was actually sponsored the ordinance that allowed overlapping neighborhood associations. And let me tell you why. There was an issue in Four Hills and now that neighborhood association is doing what they're supposed to do, but they didn't at one point. Um, I, uh, um, I went through a recall election in 2007 and virtually 100% of the board members were in favor of the recall, but the neighborhood was not. And then after that election, the uh, people um, in a neighborhood who supported me and didn't like what the uh, board was doing, they tried to get on the board. And then what the board did is they formed a nominating committee and they used it as a filter to only let like-minded people on the board. So what uh, we did is we passed a legislation that allowed overlapping neighborhood associations so that different voices could be heard. Um, and then uh, that resulted in other problems which uh, Council Benton is trying to uh, address here. Um, then more recently, uh, we had a singing arrow neighborhood um, in my district. And what the singing arrow neighborhood did is they, uh, they, they didn't like a community center. So they took over the board and thought they could kill the community center by doing that. And what they did is they got proxies and they went around the neighborhood and they told them that we're going to open a homeless shelter and they actually went to a retirement community and got all these proxies and paid the, the fees for them. And then they voted in their friendly board. And then what they did is they immediately passed bylaws that you could not any longer have proxy elections. Um, and uh, most recently, uh, what's been happening uh, in my district is we have the East Gateway Coalition, which is terrible, by the way. Um, it's, it's a disgrace. And what I mean by that is that uh, the East Gateway Coalition um, wrote a letter to the EPC saying that um, the East Gateway Coalition opposed the Neighborhood Association, uh, not the Neighborhood Association, the, the Community Center. And uh, then what I did to the EPC is I sent several letters from Neighborhood Association to the East Gateway Coalition purported to represent, saying that they, they were never contacted about their support. Hang on a second. Never um, contacted about this uh, community center. So what the Youth Gateway Coalition does is they just have a, a bunch of people, and this can happen in any neighborhood association, have a bunch of people with a cause or an agenda, and they take over. Now, almost all neighborhood associations in my district do what they're supposed to do, which they're honest brokers for the neighborhood, but this can be corrupted. Um, and I don't care what rules we put in, um, honest brokers are going to do what they're supposed to do. People who just have an agenda and want to take over and push an agenda are going to do that. And I've just become convinced that no matter what legislation we pass, we're not going to change that. So I've, I've just decided that we should just leave it alone and recognize that there's going to be neighborhood associations, a, a, a small minority and coalitions, a small minority, who are not doing what they're supposed to do. who are doing what the East Gateway Coalition is doing. We just have 20 people in a room with an agenda. And, and then they, they say, we're a coalition, therefore, this is not us. Or we're a neighborhood association, therefore, this is not us. But they're not really honest brokers for the um, So in any event, that's my speech. And that's it. So I think what I'll do, counselors, if you agree to this, and I think um, I think this is the fairest way to do it, is to go through each one, and have a uh, have an explanation, and then decide. Let the sponsor decide if they want to move it forward tonight, or if they want to wait until our next meeting, and then we can pass what we passed tonight, and it'll be amended, and then we can have the neighborhoods look at them and maybe recommend other amendments. Um, but I think there's still a, a process here and it's fluid. So um, with that, I'm going to go to floor amendment number three, Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. I'll move floor amendment number three on page 12 after line three. I think I'll let you read the rest, but essentially um, it would bring back the responsibility of the ONC to uh, reply to our neighborhood associations within seven days as was previously in the original narrow. And so I think it's important that uh, as neighborhood associations um, request any 
answers, definition, or status that we are also beholden to them and would reply with a certain number of days. And so this is what this amendment does. Okay, Councilor, I'll second that. Do I have any questions? Councilor Davis and then Councilor Benton. I always beat Councilor Benton to the punch and it's not on purpose. Uh, I suspect we have sort of the same question here, but, um, but Madam President and Councilor Senna, I think this is a great idea. I, I think it kind of should go without saying um, that we should all be working together, but um, how do we enforce this? So what happens if a neighborhood association has a question and we don't get a response? Like, I'm not opposed to this. I think we should stick it in there, but I hate writing stuff that doesn't have a mechanism and I'm not even sure what the mechanism would be. I wonder if there's been any conversation about what that would look like. Because there are, to be clear, this is important for a technical reason because there are timelines incumbent on neighborhood associations to weigh in on development questions. Um, and we have often seen that there are incomplete applications or applications submitted in an in, um, in different ways. They look different. It's hard to decipher what somebody intends sometimes. Um, and so I do think that's important for us to do that, but I'm not sure how we enforce this or is there automatically an extension, for example? Um, if a neighborhood association files a question that's not responded to, I'm just curious if we've had that conversation or how we might address those questions. Thank you, Councillor Davis, and, and I'll, I can reply. You know, it it is relating back to ONC, so that's the office that would reply to that. I believe that just similar to like 311, for example, when 311 submits, um, of course, you have a certain number of days to reply, and we also have timelines on that as well and specifically for the reasons that you had stated as well you know whether it's a development you should be able to give a timely notice back to our neighborhood associations that make that request so um by the mechanism it would be through onc that would receive that and then it would be relayed to the proper department i think that any reception of any question similar to 311 relaying it back to the department and emailing that this is actually being addressed um, would be sufficient enough. Thank you, Madam President. I think this is great, but I hope maybe we should add a provision in here that says that uh, maybe counselors can ask ONC to get us answers as well. Maybe we'd get them a little sooner sometimes. So uh, that may be a new trick. So, Madam maybe. President, if, Go ahead, Mr. Melendez. if I can just offer some context, the current narrow as it sits today, I think really has the issue that Councilor Davis is pointing out. And it, it says that <clears throat> something like the city shall respond within seven days or the ONC shall make sure that the city responds in seven days. And that really puts ONC in a really tough position. And so recognizing that, you know, that was sort of disingenuous to the public to say that that was gonna happen. We, we don't have the enforcement mechanism as Council Davis, you know, identified. And so what this language does is that it um, essentially puts the standard as being a seven day response. And then it puts ONC in the position of needing to bug people about that seven days. So it doesn't promise it's gonna be in seven days, but it puts ONC sort of in the neighborhood's corner to be you know, helping bug whichever department it is. Um, and so that's attempting to strike that balance, recognizing the limitation that, that you suggested, but no one should be under the assumption that it's a mandate that is you know, punishable by, by law or, or anything like that. Sorry, I, I thought I took myself off of mute. Councillor Benton. Yeah, I guess, uh, so it, I think helping ensure, I mean, I, 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 I'm a little, little worried about that language because I'm often trying, we're often trying <laughs> to within seven days, I wish I could get an answer from some departments sometimes about some things. And that's with a city councilor bugging them. And so I, I do worry about that. We're, I really appreciate the intent. And I think I'm just worried about that language um, helping ensure. Um, Councillor Benton, would that be a friendly amendment to just say ensure? Um, or helping. <laughs> and not ensure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure which of those words needs to uh, to be massaged. But but um, 
I mean, you know, maybe it, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's okay. I, I, uh, I do worry about, you know, saying, well, uh, ONC is supposed to do this. And if they don't get an answer, then, uh, then they haven't done their job if they haven't gotten an answer from some other department. That's all I worry about. Okay, thank you for that. Any other comments? I don't see any other comments, so we will move to a vote. Councilor Borrego. Excuse me. Oh, Councilor Seno, sorry. Go ahead and yeah. close. Sorry, yes. I mean, I think that we know the, the intent of this amendment, and if we have to massage it so that it says assisting or wordsmithing this a little bit um, to make put some more clarity, I'm certainly... Oh um open to that but again you know this is similar to 311 where we receive the notice and we convey it to the proper department and so that they know that their initial questions would go towards um those that would have the answers not necessarily on the shoulders of ONC to directly provide that answer but rather that um those questions are given to the proper departments um, so again, similar to 311, I think it's sufficient enough notice, whether it's email um, or by mail, if we are, do receive that correspondence by mail um, or email, um, that at least we gave and did whatever we could to ensure that those answers were given to those that, you know, can actually provide those answers. So if it's wordsmithing this, uh, to say assisting, um, inquiries get an initial response, I'm certainly okay, okay to that. And I think it would be just a technical amendment. Councilor Benton? That sounds good to me, like help assist. I, th I like the word Post assist to help also. ensure, is that, a, would that be acceptable? I think uh, I, it would be acceptable to me, Councilor Senna. You're the sponsor, co-sponsor. Yep, I'm good with that if, if that's just a technical or friendly amendment. Okay, did staff get that? So assist. Okay, um, so with that, then we will move to the vote. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor yes. Harris. Thank you. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero one amendment three with the one change from the word insure to assist. Thank you, Ms. Ortega. So with that, we will move on to what we consider Amendment number four, um, Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. I'll move floor amendment number four, which you will see on the screen shortly. Um, this would require associations and coalitions to amend their bylaws that have specific wording. Um, even if their current practices are not consistent with the underlying concepts for democratic processes, this amendment would allow some flexibility so that associations and coalitions who are operating consistently with such practices can operate under their existing bylaws without having to make any changes. Thank you, Councillor. I'll second that. Any questions, Councillor Benton? Um. I have a question for, for Mr. Melendres. I mean, um, I think that, I think this is well worded. I, I think it is, uh, is probably okay, but um, we were essentially the way that, that the current draft is written. Um, it sort of, uh, it seems to me that, that it uh, would would, would proactively require ONC to check the bylaws and make sure those basic provisions are in there. Whereas with, with this, it would, uh, um, 
the determination of whether somebody's conducting themselves democratically or not would probably be complaint driven perhaps from within the neighborhood or something if, if folks didn't think that it, it was occurring. It, am I getting that right? It, this kind of a, it's a pretty important change, but, but maybe it's okay. Madam President, Councillor Benton, um, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, today, the narrow does already state that neighborhood associations need to conduct themselves democratically. Perhaps one of the shortcomings of that current narrow is that it has it gives absolutely no description as to what that means. Um, the proposed narrow that's before you has an itemized list of sort of boxes that could be checked within the bylaws that indicate that democratic processes are being followed. And so as you suggest, that's a real proactive way for the ONC um, to look at those and ensure, you know, whether or not those provisions exist in the bylaws or not as a, as a sort of test for that. This um, essentially says that you do not have to have the magic word, so to speak, in your bylaws, so long as you're conducting yourself consistent with what those requirements are. And I think you're right that the way that that would come about is probably similar to the way that complaints come about now, which the ONC regularly entertains calls from various community members, you know, not all, because there's a lot of really good neighborhood associations out there, but every once in a while, there's some concerns. And so ONC will get those calls and they'll say X, Y, and Z happened. And we do not think that's a democratic process. I mean, the difference I think between now and what's proposed is at least the ONC will have the bylaw provisions to evaluate the conduct against. And so that's a little bit better than what you have now. Um, but I do agree that it would likely be complaint driven um, as far as operations, as opposed to the proactive insurance that the language language is within the bylaws. Thank you, Mr. Melendez. And yeah, just my point being, you know, there's a lot of the, the language in this, in this revision of, of the narrow that, um, is more specific than what we had in the past. It by no means implies that that most neighborhood associations are doing anything wrong, but there have been, you know, we fairly regularly do get complaints that that uh, you know fair pra practices haven't occurred. And then, how do you prove that? And and how does I suppose the ONC um, what can they hang their hat on? Uh, so one person says, well, we've, we've got a good democratic process and somebody else disagrees. And um, I, with regard to amending bylaws, too, I just want to get clarification on that, perhaps from Mr. Melendres or, or uh, Ms. Baca, that um, we do give, uh, I guess, until the next year, right, it, sometime between uh, now and, and the next annual meetings that the neighborhoods would need to make such a bylaw amendment if we left it the way it is, right? Madam President, Councilor Benton, I believe that's correct, and I'll invite Ms. Baca to correct me if I'm wrong, because she knows that, uh, I think, more clearly than I do. Madam President, Councilor Benton, uh, Director Melendrez, uh, Director Melendrez is correct. Okay, thanks. Councilor Davis. Thanks, Madam President. Let me say, I, I appreciate that. I think there is some, I appreciate this, and I do think this technical piece is important, but I think it gets to a bigger piece of a bigger conversation. Um, and so I'm inclined to ask the sponsors if they would just defer this amendment until the bigger conversation or the next conversation where we get more input. And here's here's my thought, and I'll probably lose this vote, but um, I think this technical piece is important, but I think the bigger piece is how we evaluate um, the role of coalitions, for example. There are places in the city where very strong neighborhood associations control the majority of seats on a neighborhood coalition, for example, and end up essentially with two votes. Um, and those sort of democratic processes allow for, in some neighborhood coalitions, allow for individual residents. And so um, I'm, I'm gonna pick on a different neighborhood that's not mine. So Councilor Harris mentioned, and I have no idea how his East Gateway Coalition works um, for good reason, because I don't deal with them very often. Um, but that coalition would involve, if it's like mine, 20 something neighborhoods, but if, if the neighborhood coalition was taken over by a majority of officers from Four Hills, for example, they could essentially have two votes or two places. I, I, my concern with this whole process is how we determine what's appropriate and fair 
um, so that a, a limited number of individuals don't mo uh, monopolize the process um, and, and claim more authority uh, and lock people out. And so I, I'm just not satisfied with the under, it's not a problem with this amendment and I would vote for it technically for the technical reason, but the underlying issue about who gets to be a member of a coalition and how those are governed and how they're different and how they represent all their disparate associations, um, I think is not yet addressed appropriately in the in this proposed bill. So um, I'm not sure if that needs, would require a deferral of this or whether that's a, a revisit or a, a longer conversation about coalitions. Um, but that that that's gonna be my ongoing concern this uh, evening. Councillor, we cannot defer an amendment. Um, so Councillor Senna, I guess you would have, we would have to determine if we want to defer this. My next uh, amendment, Councillor Davis deals with coalitions um, and I'm actually planning to defer it, not to defer it, but not to hear it tonight. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's get the language right, right? <laughs> It, Madam, um, in, in that case, and that was sort of where I was going, and thank you for clarifying what we're doing. Yeah. I support this technical piece. I think it's important. It's an easy clarifying piece. I'd support this amendment and, and want to address bigger coalition issues in a larger conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we do recognize that. Councillor Senna. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I would like to just vote up or down on this amendment, um, and then we'll proceed forward. Thanks. Any other comments? Let's go to a vote, Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. No. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. No. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. No. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Motion passes 6-3 on Amendment 4. Thank you, counselors. Um, I am going to um, delay this until our next meeting um, because this does have a, a broader issue regarding uh, coalitions. And um, I think it would give not only ourselves, but uh, neighborhoods and the coalitions an opportunity to look at it and offer any input or suggestions that they may have regarding this so what we would consider it's amendment e in your pack in your packet on your ipads um so i will not move this tonight but i will consider moving this at our next or some version of it at our next meeting so we will move to item f Madam President, may I ask a question Mr. for you, you as the sponsor? Um, so as the staff write-up or the, the uh, explanation implies that um, this still would sort of deal with the issue of overlapping boundaries, right? Uh, yes. Because it Because it says that coalitions cannot have memberships in common. So if you're a member of one coalition, you can't be a member of two other ones, I suppose, right? If you're a neighborhood association, is that correct? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to be clear on that because it's a, a lot of struck through language, but in a way it, it may, it may, you know, still solve some of the problems. I know that in the past, you know, that, that there were uh, conflicts between Southwest uh, Swan and, and uh, West Kona that, well, we're both West Side coalitions, and um, that was, you know, one of the things I think that was in front of mind when, when, uh, when some of this language, when we brought in coalitions, by the way, which never were uh, until this new narrow, were never uh, recognized uh, groups with standing, and and that was one important change in response to the outcry from from coalitions saying, no, we want standing too. And and then along with that, as with neighborhood associations comes, you know, more rules to show you that you're at least operating on the up and up. But anyway, I, I appreciate the amendment and the explanation. Thanks. And um, depending on how things, well, thank you, Councilor. I appreciate that. So we're gonna move on to amendment F, which is now going to be considered as amendment number five. 
And this is Councillor Pena. Councillor Pena. Thank you, Madam President. So I think the amendment number five, the one I have in front of me is, yes, that's correct. So this is, without reading all the language, I'll just read the explanation. And this is um, the prior narrow section addressing developer concerns was eliminated because the existing sections are better addressed within the IDO. This short statement of what developers' obligations is intended to express the city's expectation for developers who engage um, rec with recognized um, associations and coalitions. So I'd move to pass on that. Thank you, Councillor. I'll second that. I'll come in, buddy. Uh, Councilor Basson, you have a question or was that a second also? Thank you, Councilor Basson. Are there questions? Do not see any questions. We will move to Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councilor Basson. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. 9-0 on amendment number five, which is letter F in your packet. Thank you, Councillor Pena, for that. Uh, we will move to floor amendment number six. Councillor Pena. Thank you, Madam President. Um, floor amendment number six, there's lots of language in there, just some whereas is. Um, the explanation for this is these changes clarify that the ONC has several affirmative duties that it should carry out even with, without waiting for the request to come in. Some obligations of the ONC are appropriate as requested basis, but the ordinance should help direct the ONC to be proactive as well. This amendment also places timeframes for the ONC um, services such as newsletter and trainings directly um, directing directly that newsletters should happen at least quarterly and that it should hold trainings at least once per, per year if more requested. Finally, this amendment directs the ONC um, guidance and assistance to associations and coalitions and meetings notices for certain um, certain meetings and votes. So this is just a way of, you know, neighborhood associations were formed so that it's a way how government engages community. So I just thought um, ONC does a great job, but just so that we have it in the legislation, if there's, you know, it really puts kind of emphasis on what we should be doing to support the community. Thank you, Councillor Pena, for that explanation. It appears Councillor Gibson is offering a second, I believe. Councillor Gibson, is that a second? No, I have a question, though. Okay, hang on, Councillor Gibson. So is that a second, Councillor Senna? Councillor Senna, thank you for that second. Councillor Gibson, we'll go back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I'm a little bit confused, but I'll bet you can straighten me out. So that was the one that we were just talking about. That was the ONC uh, responsibilities. Is that correct, Councillor Pena? Yes, that's correct. And I did receive your suggestions earlier and maybe Mr. Melendez can help us with that because I think your suggestions and what we're trying to do, if you wanna just go ahead and explain um, what your concern is, um, I think- yeah, it's my Madam President. Let me, let me jump in really quick, and I apologize that I look like a black box right now. There's something wrong with my camera. But um, Councillor Pena, you moved Amendment G, which is uh, adding recitals to the beginning of the bill for context. And then I believe you read the explanation for Amendment H. And so um, I, I think the explanation you gave doesn't correlate to the amendment that you moved. And I'm sorry. I, understandable so, with all these amendments on the floor, but just to kind of make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Yeah, apologize for that. It's just that I had the amendments in my packet in the order that they were given to me. So I just went like that. So I just noticed that that, that was the case. So I will um, pull what I just said back and then just read um, the, um, the recitals, the whereas is, and that would be, I guess, floor amendment number six. Is that correct, Mr. Melendez? Yes. Madam President, uh, Councillor Pena, yes, that's correct. Okay. 
So just looking to see if it's the same one. Yeah. So this is the, um, these additional recitals are intended to provide um, greater community based context to administration of the NARO. Uh, the last recital also offers a basis for recognizing coalitions as being proposed. So um, what I was trying to do here is, you know, I was just really reading as to why even um, uh, governments uh, recognize um, neighborhood associations. And I, I stumbled upon doing some of my research, uh, a little document called the role of neighborhood associations and urban planning processes. And, um, you know, and I just thought it was important that we um, put some of this information in, in our NARO. And it just talks about in the, in the 1960s, civic part participation in the United States underwent significant changes. Um, and the trans transition from voluntary membership to professional membership organizations, resulting in the seemingly dis diminished grassroots uni universe. So um, under under this, you know, in um, neighborhood associations under um, uh, President Johnson, they devised a mandate that would require government entities to engage with community members during urban planning processes. Um, this undertaking is aimed to increase um, citizen participation in local politics and low income communities and to attempt as an attempt to fight the war on poverty. As a result, a number of uh, community organizations formerly called community action pro programs um, throughout the United States. So actually what it does is it just legitimizes neighborhood associations, gives them a place at the table um, when they're um, during the urban planning process. And, and um, I thought some of this language, these recitals would be important as part of the NARO. I'd, I'd move it to pass. There are several questions, um, Councilor Pena. So you may be on standby here. Councilor Benton and then Councilor Senna. I was just offering a second. Uh, oh, that was your second, thank you. Councilor, Councilor Pena, I mean, Councilor Senna and then Councilor Gibson. No, I'm sorry. I was just offering a second as well. Oh, okay. So, Councilor Gibson? I'm good. No questions. All righty. Then with that, we will move to a vote. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Davis? Councilor Davis? All right, this cheap city computer, yes. Thank you. Councilor Gibson? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Senna? Yes. Councilor Borrego? Yes. 904 four, Amendment 6, which is G in your packets. Thank you, Councilors. Um, we will move on to, in your on your iPad is labeled Amendment H, and this is now number seven, Councilor Pena. Thank you, Madam President. And without um, rehashing re, uh, what I just said, it kind of just stands, it was just kind of responsibilities for the ONC and just really clarifying some of the role of ONC and, and what we're gonna do to engage community kind of based on what I just read. I, I move to pass. Thank you, Councillor Pena. You have several seconds, Councillor Gibson, Councillor Senna. I think those are seconds. Are they both seconds? Second that, but I do have a question, Madam President. Councillor Gibson. Okay, so um, I know I sent you stuff with all kinds of writing on it. I, I apologize for that. But really, uh, what I would like to get clarification on is uh, the removal of the language for uh, paragraphs A, 9, and there's another one here. Oh, looks like 10 removing the upon request. And that just seemed curious to me because it seems like that would be a natural prompt for, um, for, for specific information to go out. Um, and so I'm just wondering what, what the reasoning was behind, uh, behind removing the uh, by request. Um, Madam President, um, Councilor Gibson, I think that it would just maybe a little bit of wordsmithing with Mr. 
Melendez because it was just, I mean, it can be upon request as well, but I just really wanted to make sure that, you know, we as a, a city government had an obligation to engage a community too. So uh, Mr. Melendez, do you, um, do you have any suggestions for that or? Madam President, Councilors, um, so I think that there's a couple of ways to read that upon request, and, and I think the amendments were intended to address the idea that if ONC is getting an inquiry from somebody who needs something, that they would not have a duty on behalf of the city unless that person specifically asked them for help whereas ONC may very well know that the resources exist and that they can connect those resources. We have a great ONC staff, and I'm confident that none of them would ever administer this ordinance that narrowly. However, my understanding of the changes was to ensure that ONC didn't feel like it was limited to be able to help only when it was specifically asked, but could instead extend its resources um, because it knows those resources are available and helpful. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam President. I just have a questions and it's not pertinent to the specifics of this, but I guess one of the, the major questions I'm going to ask is how much staff does ONC have? Uh, it seems that we are putting more and more on them. And if we need to add more staff, have we factored in a budget to cover that? Because if, as I'm listening to all of these amendments, they are majority of them asking for more and more to come out of ONC. And I think it's a, my understanding, it's a very small department. So uh, Mr. Melendres, could you answer that question? How many, how much, where's the money coming from? Madam President, counselors, um, when ONC is in, folks that are watching know the history of ONC, but it's it's been in council now for several years. When it came to council, it had four um, full-time positions within that office. Presently, there are three people working for ONC. Um, uh, I have to qualify that one of those folks also does general counsel services work for us, us as well. And so we would constantly be monitoring kind of the resource impact of this and what passes and what goes forward and trying to figure out what resources we need to continue to give ONC. I think that um, it's always been the idea that ONC would be fully staffed up to what's needed. We have had, you know, the, the benefit of having one of their staff do general counsel services work as well. But we may um, in the future, depending on, you know, what happens with this ordinance and what the workload looks like, um, make sure that that person is, is fully dedicated to ONC in the future. So if I may, Madam President. Um, Mr. Melenders, or, thank you. Mr. Melenders, does that mean that you think we are adequately staffed now and this should not affect, uh, at least in the near future? The Madam, Madam President and Councilor Jones, so we've been in this holding process uh, with respect to the interim resolution and getting this ordinance up to speed. And I, so I think the uh, idea has been historically that we would monitor what resource demand this uh, ordinance created. At present, my, the reporting to me is that ONC has the resources it needs currently to meet its current obligations. Um, as I mentioned, we have the additional staff person in ONC that also does city council work. And so I think the next step would be to, as necessary, dedicate that person fully to ONC. And I would anticipate that we can likely cover the obligations um, with that shift. Um, and if we can't, we would certainly be talking about that as we look at the city council's budget for the coming fiscal years. Thank you, Mr. Melendez. Thank you, Madam President. And Madam President, if I could add to that, I just wanted to comment that, you know, um, as Mr. Melinda stated, and I think others stated that ONC is doing a great job right now, and they're actually doing more than what's being requested. And that I just wanted to ensure that we had something when, you know, staff moves on that they, um, you know, that we have our ordinances solid and it really has what the expectations um, are. So thank you, Madam President. 
Thank you, Councilor Pena. Is that your close? Yes. With that, we will move to Ms. Ortega for a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. 9-0 on amendment number seven, which is H in your packet. Thank you. We will move on to amendment number I. I think this is I, or is this L? H I. Councilor Bassan. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to move amendment number eight. On page three, line nine, strike the word persons and insert property owners and or residents. There was some concern being expressed that uh, people could just pop into a house and say that they're there. So they would need to have a vote at that meeting. So this just to me was a technical cleanup with what I believe is the intention when we typically have neighborhood associations and those that are going to be voting. We'll second that, Councillor. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions. Ms. Ortega? Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Harris? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. Nine zero on Amendment 8, which is letter I. Thank you, councillors. We will move on to letter um, 9, which is Amendment J. Councillor Bassan. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to move Amendment 9. Um, there it is. This would be on page 3, line 12. Strike who are residents of the city and insert within a specified geographic boundary within the city. Uh, this goes back to what we were sort of starting to allude at and what's already in, in the current version. And I think, again, this one that you know, coalitions have a, a geographic boundary. So we don't want to have any kind of overlapping residents that say they're part of more than one coalition. Thank you, Councillor. I'll second that. Um, Councillor Senna, second also, I believe. Any questions? I don't see any questions. Ms. Ortega? Ortega. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. 9-0 on amendment number nine, letter J. Of course, I'm muted. Um, we will move on to amendment 10, which is Amendment K in your packet. Councilor Basson. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to move amendment number 10 on page four, line eight, add the word adult between the words all and persons. And on page seven, line 13, add the word adult between the words individual and residence. There's some concern that if we're, we're making sure to say that there's no um, discrimination on age, it could be construed that minors can vote and that should be up to the discretion of the neighborhood association if they want minors to vote. And Councillor, just quick, well, there is a second, Councillor Benton, I believe that's a second. Just a quick question. Um, what do we consider a minor, Councillor? I would imagine it's anybody under the age of 18 that's not an adult. Do we need to define that? Okay, he's saying- Madam, Madam President, um, for things like this, you know, that aren't defined within the ordinance, we would use the common definition and commonly in our society for general purposes, adulthood is the age of 18. So I think that's sufficient. Okay. Any questions, counselors? I don't see any questions, Ms. Ortega. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Yes. Councillor Harris? 
Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Yeah. Councillor Borrego? Yes. I threw on amendment 10, letter K. Thank you, councillors. That passes on a 9 0. We will move on to um, floor amendment number 11, which is amendment L in your packet. Councillor Brisson. Thank you, Madam President. On page five, line 16, and on page eight, lines 19 through 20, amend as follows. If decisions are made via a majority of the total votes cast by the association's officers or members. The reason for this was because there's some uh, people that understand it to where it could be just whether it's the entire, the majority vote of all of the membership or whether it's the majority of those who are casting votes. So it was to clarify that to relieve some of the doubt. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have a second? Councillor Senna, Councillor Gibson, Councillor Davis. Questions? Don't see any questions. Ms. Ortega. Actually, I'm sorry, Madam President. I, I meant mine as a question. My apologies. Oh. Okay, Councillor Davis. Uh, and Councillor Bassan, this is one of those technical questions and uh, you're well versed in this more than I. So uh, I, I just wanted to ask, I think we, in the past, I think in practice, we've made a distinction between say coalitions and associations taking a vote um, on these major uh, development decisions based on the four people who show up or requiring that a majority of members weigh in by one of those means that we discussed earlier, like electronic voting, et cetera. Um, my, my concern a little bit is um, that clarifying it just by the number of votes cast, which is important, might mean that a minority of members who care about a particular issue could require an entire coalition, say the West Side Coalition, to weigh in on an issue that only affects Central and Coors, for example, um, because no one in Taylor Ranch cared. Um, I wonder if how we how this will fit into that concern and, and whether that's something that um, maybe we should think about in the future. I, I'm certain this, you may have a better answer than I do. Thank you, Madam President. Councillor Davis, I think that, um, I mean, you make a valid point. I, it was more the intention of, you know, if you have a hundred members and only 16 show up to a meeting, and it says a majority vote by the membership or a majority vote without clarifying, it was the, some people are understanding it to mean that they need to make sure to reach out to all 100 people to get a vote before they can decide that that's a majority. So if there's a, a suggestion you have to remedy that while still um, you know, achieving this, that, that's the intention is to make sure that we don't say to these neighborhood associations and or coalitions, you have to reach out to every member to get a majority vote. It's really those that are in attendance at the meetings. And then on the flip side of that, there should be quorum guidelines in all the bylaws. So for the minimum, we should be covered. But um, this is just more to not put an undue burden on the neighborhood associations or the coalitions to make sure that they reach out electronically and all these other ways in case everyone doesn't show up. Thank you, Madam President and Councilor Bassan. You hit on exactly what I was trying to find the word for. I think it's that quorum question. Um, and I, I don't know that it's addressed otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, I, again, I, my, my concern here is not that this is bad. I think this is the right answer for the, the question when in addressing it. Maybe Mr. Melendrez or someone could tell me really quickly. I'm trying to, on the side over here, do a quick search for the word quorum in the, the proposed legislation. Um, Again, my, my concern is simply not that we shouldn't have a majority of votes cast. That just makes sense to me. Um, but there are some really minute issues that get folks really riled up for good reason. Um, but if nobody else cares and only three people show up at the meeting um, or only three people cast a vote because they care, it could unnecessarily imply that a whole neighborhood and a whole district coalition um, could care about a very minute issue that might be addressed in a smaller way. So. Um, I, I wonder, Mr., if it's okay with a sponsor, really quickly, not to belate this, but Mr. Melendrez or, or Ms. Baca, are you aware of minimum requirements for, for quorums in our current sort of democracy language um, that we're proposing for coalitions and associations? Madam President, Councillor Davis, um, a quorum is generally a majority. So if you have a, 
a group of folks that is 20 strong or let's use an odd number if it's 19 strong then you know 10 would be a quorum of that body and so obviously in uh, local government and other places we really are always concerned about whether or not we have a quorum because that's what we need to do business a private association um, or any association can uh, define a quorum differently if it so chooses um, and define a quorum at, at essentially any number that it wants and that its members approve or its officers approve as part of its bylaws. So um, that, that can be remedied on a case-by-case -case basis, what they think a quorum should be for those purposes, and the ordinance doesn't prescribe anything there. Um, with respect to the point you're making about how you kind of ensure that it's representative, I think there's a little bit of a balance that's sort of built in to the ordinance um, in that I think folks will recognize generally, even those that, even those that, that think maybe the, the ordinance overreaches in some ways um, would recognize that uh, you can't legislate down to the minutia, but what the ordinance does say is that these groups have to be prepared to explain um, how their decision was arrived at. And that's intent, that's the component of the ordinance that's intended to sort of deal with that issue because as a decision maker, you have the opportunity and the, and the group has the obligation to tell you, yes, it was a vote of the membership. And if you're concerned about, you know, who showed up for that vote, then that's sort of the opportunity there as well. Um, that's, that's the strike the balance. That's the balance the ordinance proposes to strike in its current form, whether that's the right place, you know, is up, up to you to decide. Uh, thank you, Mr. Melendez. Madam President, thank you for the time. I, I wonder if the sponsor, and I, I defer to the sponsor if she wants to move forward and a vote for this. I wonder if the sponsor would be willing to withdraw this for the night or just to, to not take action on this and to look at that quorum question in, in context with this um, with me in the future. And if she wants to do a vote tonight, that's fine. But um, I would be totally in support for this as long as those meetings met a quorum standard that we think represented all the members and, and didn't allow um, for sort of, I'm going to use crass terms, but sort of hijacking of a meeting um, for a specific purpose, um, which we've seen in the past. Uh, Councillor, if you don't mind, I'd, I let me ponder just because I would like to hear what Councillor Benton has to say as well. Uh, and then if I may reserve my response for after that, just in case. And if you, and if you think crass is hijacking, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> you I was the guy that said that other word on TV in that other campaign, so no. Councillor Benton? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the uh, in, in drafting this, we received criticism from uh, for some of the requirements we had about notification and, you know, some of the specific requirements that, that are still in there about uh, how you minimum requirements for, for adequate notifications to a neighborhood. So, you know, a, a neighborhood sign or you did leafleting or you did social media, whatever. We kind of relied on that of, of uh, in a way in lieu, we never had a discussion, I'll be honest with you about uh, meeting quorums, but, but, um, but it was kind of with that intention of, okay, give adequate notice, give everybody a chance. If it's an important issue, really get the word out there that you're going to be talking about some development that, that's coming forward. Um, and then, as Mr. Melendres said, we also received complaints when we said, well, you've got to, you've got to be able to represent how your decision was made. And that's language that's already in the idea, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where uh, there's some language to that effect, where, for instance, if you're taking a position as a neighborhood association before the planning commission, that you you know, it, it, the the uh, members of the planning commission are certainly certainly within their rights to say how is this how is this decision made? How many people showed up and, and voted, and what was the vote? So, um, you know that as with much of this uh, this uh, ordinance, we're kind of trying to walk that fine line between overly managing uh, people how they associations and, and coalitions of how they do their business and but still trying to ensure a a modicum of, of attempt to get people out and and maximize participation thank you but I, I i think this is really an important debate and i i guess i would also think that this might be one where we could continue to to fine-tune it 
but uh, it's up to the sponsor. Councillor Bassan, what's your pleasure? Well, I know inside my head what my pleasure is, but at the same time, I'll go ahead and just withdraw it for now. So that you're withdrawing this amendment then? For now, yes. Okay. We need a second. I'll offer a second. No, you don't have to do that. I'm sorry. Excuse me for a second. Okay. So whoever's... Who is the second to your Senna. motion? Councillor Pena, would you agree to that? Senna. 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 It's getting late. <laughs> Councillor Senna. Okay, so we will withdraw this amendment. Okay, so our next um, amendment is Amendment M. And we will consider this 11 since we withdrew 11, no? no Madam Still President, twelve. yes, this would be number 12, Madam President, given that the prior one did have a motion and a second, Thank even though it was subsequently for withdrawn. that clarification. Councilor Bassan. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to move Amendment 12. Um, so it would be to strike member associations and groups and to individual and on page seven in line 31, and then on page eight, line one, strike business members residing within its boundaries. And on page seven, line 31, insert members after the word all. And this makes revisions to the section on notice for coalition meetings. Uh, since the residency within the boundary is a condition of membership, it's left without this amendment. If left without this amendment, it would be redundant and would only serve to cause confusion. And with this amendment, it would read as follows. The coalition shall hold an annual meeting. It shall notify the ONC of this meeting at at least two weeks in advance and make a reasonable attempt to give notice to all members at least two weeks in advance. Well, now it's redundant that way too. Should have read it out loud earlier. At least two weeks advance notice through two or more of the following. So make a reasonable attempt to give notice to all members through two or more of the following. Staff, may we please do that? We're working on that, Councilor. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Would you like to read it back? In the reading of the explanation, Madam President and Councilor Bassan, you have it reading, uh, the coalition shall hold an annual meeting it shall notify the ONC of this meeting at least two weeks in advance, comma, and make a reasonable attempt to give notice to all through two or more of the following. Uh, to, all, to all members through two, of, two or more of the following. Correct. Yes, please leave the word members in. Madam President, Councilor Pisson, I just wanna make sure that the intent is clear and it is getting late, so I could be mistaken here, but as you've, as that description was reread, it would suggest that the two week notification must be given to the ONC, but not to the members because you struck the two week requirement for members. Was that your intent? No, my intent, uh, thank you, Mr. Melendrez. So my intent is that it shall notify the ONC of this meeting at least two weeks in advance and make a reasonable attempt to give notice to all members at least two weeks in advance through two or more of the following. So add an in before the word advance and delete the word notice. That sounds great. My apologies, everyone, for not reading it out loud to myself earlier. Sounds so much different when you do that. Councilor Bassani, you have a second from Councilor Senna, I believe. Is that, counts? Is that a second? Okay, um, are there questions? And I, I think we clarified that sufficiently. So with that, we will move to Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. 
Councilor Borrego. Yes. 901 Amendment 12, letter M. Thank you, Councilors. That takes us back to, well, before we do that, um, Councilors, I think I am gonna go ahead and move my amendment, uh, which is would be amendment E in your packet. And I will consider that um, number 13. So Mr. Moya, can you go back to that? So this amendment, uh, basically what it does on page seven, line one through 20, amend subparagraphs one and two as follows. Membership must be open to all recognized associations. And I'm not gonna read every, every line, but um, it deals with boundaries and individual households and property owners within the boundaries of the coalition, but who are located outside the boundaries of recognized neighborhood association. And it also clarifies no recognized coalition shall have any members in common with other recognized coalitions. And then there's a, a number two on page seven, line 24, section four, revise as follows. Only those associations, groups, and persons who may have affirmatively joined the coalition may be counted as members. The bylaws clearly defined for membership dues may be collected. On number three, on page, page seven, line 27, insert a new section and renumber accordingly. For the purpose of notice, recognized neighborhood as coalitions shall receive notice per the boundaries of member associations or groups only and not for any individual members. So I will move that amendment as number 13. And I have a second from Councilor Brisson. Thank you, Councilor. Any questions? Madam President, if I could just clarify, um, Julian, if you could bring the amendment back up because there was a change at LUPS that happened that I wanna make sure the sponsor of that change knows is incorporated. So on that paragraph two, only those associations, groups, and households was the change made at LUPS. So on this amendment, that person's would actually be households and not persons. It didn't transfer because this was taken from the bill and not the amendment, but I wanted to make sure the council was clear that that is the official language. It would be households in that spot. Thank you, Mr. Melendrez, for clarifying that. I don't see any questions. So with that, we will move to Ms. Ortega for a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero on Amendment 13, letter E. Thank you, Councilors. With yes. that, we will move back to the bill and to our sponsor. Thank you, Madam President. And um, thanks, Councilors, for, for these amendments. You know, all really good stuff. We, 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 we kind of did some big blockbuster amendments trying to to uh, corral all the ideas that, that we received from uh, from the public and and um, this this is how I mean I guess you know we're kind of criticized for for having these 13 amendments up here but this is good stuff this is how legislation is crafted and amended before we pass it I certainly am not uh, uh, averse to a deferral and I will move a deferral, although I see uh, uh, Councilor Bassan's got her hand up, so see what she has in mind as well. But um, uh, I think these are all helpful and uh, in some cases, you know, kind of elegantly, uh, as with the last amendment by President Borrego, deal with the, uh, the whole boundary issue of coalitions in a good way. So, um, but I'll, I'll I'll wait uh, to hear from uh, Councilor Bassan and then I'll, I'll move a deferral. Thank you, Councilor Benton. Councilor Bassan. 
Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and thanks, Councillor Benton. I I want to make sure to say my piece as well, I guess, and be transparent in that in all of the correspondence and all of the people reaching out, I personally have yet to see one constituent in favor of this proposed ordinance. And if any of you have, I would really like to hear about it because truly not one has said that there's anything that they're willing to do um, unless it's just more time. But even then, uh, I'm hearing from my constituency that they don't they don't want it. So um, for that reason, even if a deferral were to pass or not, I, I, I do not support a deferral. I do not support the narrow and I will vote for the constituents that have reached out to me and really been very vocal that they do not want this to pass. Um, and so I do, I am grateful that we passed amendments so that if this should move forward, at least I think we got a little bit closer. Um, but I know it's been a lot of work. I just can't ignore the people that have reached out to me very often and very regularly and very loudly. Thank you, Councillor Basson. Um, Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm getting the same mail, I think, that most everybody else is getting. And it is mostly very critical of this. Although I have noticed that there's very little specificity in their complaints. A few places there have been, and I think that those, uh, those uh, complaints have been addressed uh, to the best that we can. But you know, what I, uh, what I keep in mind with this ordinance is that we are trying to protect the minority, right? We're trying to protect everybody who lives within a neighborhood association, whose, um, who's, you know, may or may not hold a, uh, an office for the neighborhood association, or may or may not um, speak as loudly or as clearly or as eloquently, it may not be as heard as well, or maybe they don't even go to the meetings, you know? Um, we're Try, that, that's, I think, our, one of the most important things that this uh, ordinance does is it does provide some protection um, for, for minorities. So there's that. And yeah, I'm going to be supporting this, no doubt, no doubt. And there are, I do have neighborhood this, uh, neighborhoods who are in favor of this. They, they do see that aspect of it and appreciate it uh, so that, uh, you know, nobody gets trampled on. You know, and the city should have an expectation of this also. That's that's another thing I think that uh, we should consider that, that uh, we're uh, treating associations as partners, right? And uh, communicating with them and trusting their communication to us as being representative of their neighborhood association. So that requires a pretty high level of trust, not only the trust that the city as a government has in them and what they're saying and doing, but also uh, a, a trust that uh, the people living within their boundaries um, need to have, that they won't, you know, won't make decisions uh, not using a democratic um, uh, process. I don't think I said that right, but I think you know what I mean. So that they do do things fairly and, and uh, democratically. So I think there's a lot, uh, a lot here. And you know, um, and, and that's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we try to do is, in all levels of government really is, is to protect the, small, the smallest voices voices. So thank you. That's all I have. Let's thank vote. you, Councillor. I will move to Councillor Davis. Uh, thanks, Madam President. Uh, let me just say I 100% I, I echo and ditto Councillor Gibson. I think she made my point. So that makes my point shorter. Um, I, I do think, you know, we've got to come up with a way. Um, this in no way um, changes the way a neighborhood association or a coalition 
engages itself. We heard people saying, oh, I can't charge membership dues anymore. Um, well, that's not true. You, you can charge membership dues for other services, but when it comes to your official status as the representatives of the people of your neighborhood and your, na your area and your coalition, no one should be excluded because they're not allowed, they can't afford to pay or they didn't pay last year in anticipation of something that no one could have seen coming. And I think it's really important that when you accept that responsibility to take on a voice for a community in a neighborhood, um, that you do so willing to listen to every voice and to have a democratic process. Um, this should not be taken as, a, um, as an offense or as a criticism against every neighborhood and coalition in the city. It should be taken as an opportunity from the city that we're reaching out trying to find uh, the strongest partners and the strongest folks to create that partnership with us to be sure people are more engaged. I think this is a first step. I do see there are some places that I would like to still make some changes. And I've heard some criticism from folks who expect that we aren't gonna do this well. Um, I 100% agree that we're probably not gonna get 100% of this right. Um, but I think this process gives us a better foundation for making those changes in a more equitable way. Um, and so I think we ought to take that first step and do this now, see how that works and come back and visit it next year just like we do the IDO and our annual updates, this should be a part of that process. And I hope that it, uh, by practice, not by, maybe not by law, but by practice will be such a way. Um, so I would be in support of moving this forward tonight to get it started, but I will defer to the sponsors and how they choose to count their votes and then make that decision. Councilor Benton. Yes, Madam uh, President. Yeah. I. As with anything that's uh, remotely controversial, we're gonna hear uh, a lot more from those who are opposed and who support. And we have had people that, that support it. And we have had, we have many neighborhood associations who haven't been involved in all the criticism that we've all received over email and, and various uh, other methods. But, you know, this is critical to uh, to our land use process because this is mostly centered. You know, all of these requirements aren't aren't a requirement for a private group who doesn't want to receive uh, special standing with regard to land use matters. Uh, anybody else can organize themselves any way they want. Somebody said something about constitutional issues in the public comment today, and there are absolutely no constitutional issues here. They are their freedom of assembly and, and association, and those are constitutionally guaranteed. This is something that's that's uh, intended to assure uh, the best possible outreach before uh, an association takes a stance as a uh, in in a uh, matter that um, would. Uh, would give them special standing, legal standing before the city. So, um, you know, I, I'm comfortable with where we're heading. I may or may not have support, uh, but I will move a deferral until our second meeting in October, whatever date that is. And I did want to ask staff real quickly, what's the expiration on this? What's the expiration date on this legislation? I think it's probably January, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Madam so. President, the, uh, I'm sorry, Madam President, Councillor Benton, to answer your first question, it would be October 18th would be the date of the deferral. And I believe our clerk is about to identify the expiration date, but I don't think we'd be bumping up against that until at least the spring, because I think this was introduced uh, in around March or, or so. Okay. So you've got plenty of time. All right. That's my motion, Madam President. Your, your motion is to defer until October 18th? Yes, ma'am. Do I have a second, Councillor Davis? Is that a second? Yes. Okay, or any discussion? If not, we will move to vote. Councillor Bassan? No. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Davis? Is that a yes, Councillor Davis? Sorry. Hang on. That's correct. That's a yes on the deferral. Thank you. 
Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. No. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. No. Councillor Senna. No. Councillor Borrego. No. Motion fails on a 4 5 vote for the deferral. Councillor Benton, we're back on the original um, bill. So, any other questions, councillors? If not, we will move to a vote. Not going to pass. Councillor Bassan? No. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? Councillor Pena? No. Councillor Senna? No. Councillor Borrego? No. Motion passes on a 5 4 vote. Thank you, councillors. We will move to item on your agenda. Jay? Councillor Benton, R191. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to move for reconsideration. Councillor Harris, go ahead. Yes, I'd like to move for reconsideration of the last vote. We can move that if you have a second. There is a second from Councillor Bassan. So we will reconsider that vote. And that is item 071. Ms. Ortega. Madam President, point of order. This is for the reconsideration, correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. A vote for reconsideration requires a majority vote. If it does get the majority, then we would take up a motion on the bill. So this is for reconsideration, councilors. And we are, if, if it passes, then we will reconsider the bill itself. Ms. Ortega. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. No. Councilor Davis. No. Councilor Gibson. No. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. No. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Motion to reconsider passes on a 5 4 vote. We'll now okay, take up the bill. So we are going to go back and take up Bill 071 for a vote as a reconsideration. Councillor Davis, you have your hand up. Yeah, Madam President, point of order. Do we, now that we're back on what I believe, can Mr. Melendres clarify for me? We're just back on discussion of the bill. There's no uh, motion on the floor. Is that correct? Madam President, Councillor Davis, yes, that's correct. Thanks. And Madam President, um, in light of that, like, I, I can count votes too, but in recognition of all the work that's gone into this and some concerns and questions of other things that need to come forward, I think we ought to take a motion to defer this to give uh, everybody a chance to weigh in um, so that we don't um, take all of this and throw it out. Um, and so I, I'd make a motion to defer until, uh, what is there, two meetings from now, whatever that is? Uh, Be the 18th, Councillor. Thank you, Madam President. You're always on the ball. Um, I'd make a motion to defer until the 18th so that we have a chance to take more input from our community members um, and continue to work on this process and not, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's if a motion I, to defer. Is there a second? Um, if, if I may, uh, Benson, is that a second? Madam President, um, yeah, I was going to suggest. Is that a second? No. Uh, it, it, the 18th, I, wasn't that my original motion? It so, was. Yeah, I was going to suggest that we go to, you know, let, let's make it um, November 15th. Is that right? Is that a council meeting date? Madam President, I would consider that a friendly amendment. I think moving this past the election to give our, our counselors time to focus on those issues and to engage their neighborhoods would be useful. Okay, okay. Councillor Davis, so that is an amendment to your original proposal to defer until November 15th with a second from 
Councilor Benson. Councilor Ben, since he changed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second to defer to November the 15th. Uh, Councilor Bassan, you have a question? More of a comment, Madam President. I just, I, at the beginning of this meeting, we talked about how much time has gone by and how much public input has happened and how much we've heard from everybody. And now we're saying the people we've heard from are not good enough and we wanna hear from other ones. So I still stand by my no deferral and I cannot support the bill. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. Okay, no more discussion on the deferral. So we will move to a vote on the deferral. Councilor Bassan. No. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. I mean, no, sorry. No one of the borough <laughs> did it again. Uh, Councilor Jones. You. Yes. Councilor Pena. No on the deferral. Councilor Senna. No. Councilor Borrego. No. Motion to defer fails again on a four or five vote. Councilor Benton, this is your bill. Would you like to make another motion? Oh, I'm sorry. We will go back to the original bill. And um, Mr. Melendres, just vote on the bill itself. Madam President, I think, Councilor, I think Councilor Benton has his hand up and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. Councilor Benton. Yeah, I mean, the votes aren't there, they're not there, but, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of work that was put into this. And um, so if it, if it doesn't go uh, tonight, then my apologies to everyone who's worked so hard on it. Thank you, Councillor Benton. So we are back on the original bill, 071, which Councillor Benton... Uh, that was your as a sponsor you moved that bill and there was a second miss ortega there was a second on the bill as amended at the beginning and who is that made by davis Councillor davis all right so with that we are going to go to a vote oh. councilor Bassan. no councilor benton yes councilor davis yes councilor gibson yes councilor harris councilor harris no. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Pena? No. Councillor Senna? No. Councillor Borrego? No. Bail's on a four to five vote. Thank you, councillors. We will move on to our last order of business this evening. And that is item J, Councillor Benton, R191. Thank you, Madam President. I move a due pass on R191. This is requiring the city of Albuquerque to enter into a community benefits agreement with representatives and or residents of the neighborhood directly impacted by any new soccer stadium and the United Soccer franchise or relevant named tenant before a zone change application is submitted. I have a second. It looks like I have several seconds, I think. Are these all seconds, Councillor Davis, Can Councillor Senna? One's enough. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Madam President, um, I would also like to move the amendment. Uh, well, actually we have, we have two uh, amendments um, in the iPad, but, but I'll ask Ms. Morris to uh, explain the difference between those and uh, and then I will move one of them. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Councillors. Um, so there are two amendments. Um, this bill is pretty self-explanatory. I think the title describes quite aptly what the bill is seeking to do. Um, the bill as 
as drafted has a timeline where the threshold for the community benefits agreement to be entered is the zone map amendment application. The two amendments before you have a similar intent in that they both seek to provide a little bit more time in the timeline for the community benefits agreement to be entered, um, recognizing that the process to get the site developed is going to be long and that there may be changes needed along the way to the community benefits agreement. Um, one amendment, this, the amendment that is uh, sponsored by request that came from the administration, this one sets the, the end goal of the, the timeline as the lease agreement and um, doesn't have any other detail in between um, now and, and when that lease agreement would be signed and the community benefits agreement would be signed. Um, Councillor Benson's amendment, uh, which is the, the alternate one, um, has a little bit more detail in that similar timeline. It also ends with the lease agreement or operations agreement. However, um, Councillor Benson's agreement requires that the community benefits agreement be initiated at the zone map amendment stage. And so uh, when the city is putting in the application for the zone map amendment for a stadium, um, the community benefits agreement would need to be at least started at that, at that stage, and then, uh, then it would be completed at the operations agreement stage. I'm available for any questions on those two amendments. And, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, since I did agree to put in the administration's uh, amendment, we might want to hear from them if they would like to uh, weigh in. I uh, see Mr. Rael Lonely there in the conference room. Mr. Rael, are you prepared to, are you asleep or are you prepared to answer? <laughs> Good evening, uh, Madam President and uh, members of the council. Councilor Benton, uh, thank you. Um, look, I think we all, we all have the same, um, I, uh, in my perspective, the same goal, and that is to get a CBA, a community benefits agreement in place uh, so that we can ensure that the impacted neighborhoods um, in the city have the benefit of, of um, mitigating the impacts of a, of a major facility. Uh, so if, if the voters choose to approve that in November, um, our request was simply to tie the CBA to a lease agreement because we want to make sure that the principal leasee, um, in this case, um, New Mexico United, would be part of that and would contribute um, to the agreement um, in a contractual manner so that we could hold them accountable for their, their contributions to supporting the neighborhoods. Um, I appreciate the, the idea of connecting that or having the, the zone change be the trigger and that works as well. Um, I explained to Councillor Benton uh, early on that my only concern would be if, if this uh, if, for example, we go through a process of identifying a site and it happens to be in the county or it happens to be on UNM land or uh, where we don't have jurisdiction, then um, this, this, um, our goal here might be, um, might be not as strong as it would have otherwise been. But in either case, if, if the council feels um, compelled to use the zoning um, structure as a method for getting a CBA initiated and done, um, I'm hopeful that we'll, uh, that we can make that work as well. So whatever the council's pleasure is, we're more supportive of the CBA. The mayor is very interested in making sure that that gets done. On that point, um, if, so, um, that was one of the concerns that I had, Mr. Rael and Councillor Benton, um, is if this stadium First of all, we don't even know if it's going to be approved. And secondly, um, you know, we don't know where it's going to be. So I just had, you know, some reservations about approving something that hasn't even gone to the voters. And um, we, don't, we don't even know, I mean, we don't know if it's gonna get approved, first of all. And secondly, we don't know where it's gonna go. So it seems a little bit like the cart before the horse. So I don't know. I mean, you might want to address that, Mr. Rayo. 
Madam President, um, just to um, further point out the issue, look, I think that there is a genuine interest uh, on all of our parts, I would assume, to ensure that the neighborhoods or the neighborhood that is impacted by this facility has a voice in helping structure what kind of contributions uh, they would like uh, to mitigate the if, uh, if this is approved by the voters. So from the perspective of on this particular issue, I think it's in good faith showing the community that we're conscientious about um, what could happen to a neighborhood with a facility of this size. And that we're, we're will, <clears throat> excuse me, and that we're willing to, uh, to step out and, and commit to doing something to help the neighborhood. So in many ways, I don't see this as an issue that would otherwise put the cart before the horse as we speak, uh, as it relates to the, to the vote. I actually think that it actually adds value to the neighborhoods and to the community that if they decide to support this, that the city is very, very conscious, conscientious about what's happening in the community and that we're willing to, to uh, require some mitigating uh, support and impacts uh, support for the neighborhoods as, as we move forward, if that is the will of the, of the voters. I'm sorry, since I I was talking, um, Councillor Benson, I have to ask the question regarding the amendment. Um, it specifically discusses uh, the NRSU zone district. And so I, I guess that's what, you know, threw me off a little bit is, you know, why are we even discussing what zoning? Because it almost seems like we're making a decision as to where this is going to be located. And that, that alone bothers me. Madam Chair, I, I may be able to answer that question. Um, the a stadium use is somewhat unique uh, in that it's one of a handful of about eight uses in the city that require uh, the non-residential sensitive use zone district. So as long as the um, stadium is located within the city boundaries, um, and is city owned, uh, it would require an NRSU zone map amendment. Um, if uh, the stadium ends up being at an existing stadium site, obviously that wouldn't, wouldn't apply. Um, and uh, if the stadium, as uh, Mr. Rayal mentioned, were located in the county or on city, uh, sorry, state UNM land, um, then again, also that NRSU zone district wouldn't, wouldn't apply. Um, however, all four of the sites in the study and the two preferred sites um, and a number of the sites in previous studies are, are all located in the city and would all require that NRSU zone district zone map amendment. Thank you, Ms. Morris, for that. Um, Councillor Benton and then Councillor Besson. Yes, uh, Madam President. Yeah, without question, uh, this is... Um, speculative or not really speculative it it's laying a path uh, forward were the voters to approve um the uh the bond so were they to approve a bond first of all i think it's important that they know that the city has a commitment to a cba um, i think that's really important information uh you know i personally would would question uh the the ballot initiative were it, were it uh, in the absence of, of CBA. So this is laying the groundwork for that. And what this, uh, my amendment does is instead of saying it, we must enter into uh, a CBA before, uh, uh, before a zone map amendment is, uh, is initiated. It says that the, the um, the CBA must be initiated prior to uh, submitting a zone map amendment. So, so it, it's laying it, it's, set, it's setting a timeline, and uh, if the voters approve it, then there's some trigger points at which uh, we would be working towards the CBA, and uh, uh, and that that would have to occur um, before the zone map is, uh, amendment is, is uh, submitted. So we know that zone map is a requirement uh, as was described by, by uh, Ms. Morris that, that uh, a public existing stadium or something outside of the city is not being considered. So, uh, but yeah, really, I, I'm gonna move uh, the- uh, 
I'm moving the amendment that's uh, that's not by request. Thank you, Councillor. So we have a motion. Do I have a second? Oh, before I go to that, Councillor Councillor Basson, you still you had your hand up previously. Did you still want to say something? Thank you, Madam President. It was just that my I understood it to be that this would happen after and if the the stadium bond question got approved and Councillor Benton had already addressed that. Thank you. Councillor Senna, is that a second? That's a second, thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Ms. Ortega for the vote. Councillor Basson. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Gibson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Senna. Yes. Councillor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero on Amendment One. So, Councillor Benton, back to the original bill. Um, unless there are any other questions from councillors, I'll uh, urge your support. I. I uh, um, you know, I appreciate the administrations and the the uh, soccer clubs' willingness to to uh, to support the the idea of a, a CBA, and also the community members who who have uh, worked for it. And uh, this again is just it's laying the groundwork. It's not saying what's exactly going to be in there, but uh, but it does lay the groundwork and the timetable where the voters to approve the uh, stadium bond. So I urge your support. Um, so Councillor, I had a, another quick question. <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah. um, I just realized it just a minute ago in the, in the bill, it talks about this happening before a zone change application is submitted. So regardless of where this, if the voters approve it and regardless of where it goes, then you're saying that just, I'm just asking for a clarification on that. Yes, Madam President, that's correct. And, and that first uh, item in the amendment is changing the title of the, of the bill um, right. to make it clear that, that um, it, it does still reference the zone change, but it says that it should, that um, the city will initiate the CBA. And then the second language so it'll, it'll initiate the CBA before the uh, zone map is submitted, but then as the zone map uh, amendment process moves forward, the CBA will be informative to that process. So regardless event. of where it goes, the CBA right. will be initiated. That's what I wanted the clarification on. Thank you. Um, so is that your close, Councillor? Yes. Thank you so much. All right, uh, we have a motion and we have a second, Ms. Ortega. Councilor Basson. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Gibson. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. Councilor Borrego. Yes. Nine zero on R191 is amended. Thank you, councilors. That passes on a nine zero vote. There being no further business before the city council this evening, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, counselors. Sweet.